beautiful weather and phenomenal scenes with a capacity crowd and more. There is literally no infield general admission car parking left. That was all sold out early in the weekend. The over four car parks to the south and west of Sebring International Raceway have been brought into use for the first time, certainly, that I can remember. And I've been coming here since 90, uh, 1999. The 71st running of the Mobile 112 hours of Sebring about to get underway on pole position. Pete Portorani and his Cadillac teammates in the 31 wheel and engineering red and grey machine with a stunning lap yesterday. Indeed, it's an all Cadillac front row. Hello, everybody. John Hindoff and the IMSA Radio TV and... Uh, IMSA Radio and TV team ready to take you through this 12-hour contest. The weather will play a part today. Our Porsche keys to the race. Make sure you have a strategy that can react to the yellows. Be perfect in the pits, no penalties. Get the car to the darkness and have some new Michelin tyres for the end. That's where this race could be won and lost. Do we have to say respect the bumps? Turn one and turn 17 have really given the drivers and the teams some trouble this week already. We're in the Central Highlands region of Florida at this classic race circuit just over three and three quarter miles around with 17 corners. The Fangio chicane, Collier Curve, Bishop Bend, Jean de Biam, the last man to win Le Mans in a front engined car. Olivier Jean de Biam, of course. And then sunset at turn 17. Where are the action areas? Spread around the track, actually. Turn one, always good for a bit of hold your breath and turn in action. Heavy braking at turn seven in front of the seven hotel. Bit of follow my leader through 10, 11 and 12, but up the inside at 13 tower corner is an opportunity. And then who's bravest on the brakes into the bumps of sunset at turn 17. A brilliant week has brought us to this. Last Sunday, we were racing with the VP Racing Challenge. Two races as part of the WEC prologue. We've had cars on track from Wednesday onwards. A very entertaining World Endurance Championship. 890 miles of it yesterday in their eight hour run from noon till eight. And now it's time to unleash the biggest field of the weekend with the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. We've set half a day on the clock. 12 hours exactly. And we're rolling on the formation lap now. Jeremy Shaw alongside me, John Hindhoff in the booth. I think what we've come down to here, Jeremy, and, and this possibly part of the entertainment that we're going to see today is we honestly don't know what's going to happen at the sharp end of the field. We can pick out a few battles in some of the other classes and there'll be plenty of fighting there. But the GTP cars have not raced at Sebring. And after the relative reliability of Daytona, it's a big question mark here. It is a big question mark. You know, some of the teams uh, have information to it from which to draw from yesterday. Uh, Cadillac Racing, of course, they ran a car in yesterday's race. Porsche uh, ran a couple of cars. BMW did not. Acura did not. So uh, there are a lot of question marks going into the, into this race. But th there's so much excitement. It, it's just sensational to see so many people here. What a fabulous crowd we have on hand here. Uh, there's all sorts of people having a good time. Uh, I bumped into the uh, the turn four. Respect the arms group yesterday uh, thanks after the, the qualified. Thanks for the stickers, guys. I hope you're having a lot of fun. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get over there. I had to do some work to prepare for today yesterday, so I couldn't get, make it over. But look, uh, I know you'll be having a good time. Uh, this is going to be a tremendous motor race. The Cadillac V Series in a very pleasant blue colour. You know that I have a penchant for blue performance cars. Is our IMSA safety car. At the moment, it is the pace car and it's, the light is out. If we see it again, it will be the safety car. And let's hope we get some long green flag runs because I really want to see the relative performance of the GTP cars and see if what we learned at Daytona is translating to other tracks. An inordinate amount of data that has been gathered 
from IMSA and indeed their colleagues at the FIA and the ACO. Over half a million simulations of independently verified and gathered data on the GTP and the hypercars have brought us to the balance of performance that we have in this race. A split grid here with two Cadillac V-Series pace cars. So it's all of the prototypes first, then a gap back to all of the GT cars. And the GTs are not split between GTD and GTD Pro. So there are actually two GTD, the Pro-Am categories, on the front row there, whereas in the prototype classes, all the GTPs are at the front. In fairness, that is where they're qualified. Take a deep breath. It might be the last one you get for a little while. The 71st annual Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring is green, 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 and people to run. He rockets off the line and down into turn one. Manages to convert his pole position, but side by side, coming round from the second row of the grid. That's a, a, one of the uh, the other one of the Cadillacs coming through. Uh, one of the uh, Acuras, excuse me, the wind tailor racing. That was from row two coming through. I thought people had got that done there because he got a good jump. But in the second phase of acceleration down towards turn one, it all started to close up. And there's been a spin right at the back of the prototype field. And that has that caused lost? absolute carnage in the GT categories. Looked like the Sean Creech motorsport car might have gone around. Yeah, it it was indeed the 33 car. <sighs> right at the beginning and that's big damage to the left front of that car that's all car. of the under trays gone of the, from the front of that car that car finished second at daytona which is not a round of the season long championship for lmp3 but it is a round of the michelin endurance cup uh, and so they were they were leading the uh, endurance cup coming into today that's not the way you want to start it off with the instant on the first lap he's got some damage to the front of that car might call for a safety car early because there is there are the defending champions here as well of course in p3 there is some debris on turn one and that's a very very fast corner thought we'd got everybody through thank goodness there was that split start because yeah. it did give the gt cars some time to react durani now has managed to pull what five or six car lengths away so it's cadillac from acura as they come through the porsche is moving through the field as well full course yellow it had to happen it's just off the racing line but anybody going wide there would have picked that up. So just one lap of green. And there's more debris further around the circuit as well because the front end of the 33, Sean Creech Motorsport Stars and Stripes livery car has been extremely badly damaged. And he's shed some more bodywork. Well, he was close to the AWA car, the yellow and black machine as the Corvettes from pole position had to go to the inside and then it was a choice of which way you went and poor Lance Wilsey sitting watching the GT D field come towards him the WeatherTech Mercedes AMG just about getting round and the problem is that you're, you're so limited in your vision going forward it's only ever happened to me once huge amount of of bodywork and oh, wow. carbon fiber has been shared much further round that's coming uh, out of turn five into six under the corvette bridge Shea Adam down in the pit lane has been doing some research on full course yellows and safety cars at this race. Over the last seven years, we averaged 39.8 laps of full course yellow. The most that we've ever had was 2018. That was 48 laps. The least was in 2019 when we only had 30. Last year, right on course for the average, 38. 
So the number 33, the Sean Creech car that caused that yellow flag period has made it back to pit road. Looks like extensive damage, hopefully just to the nose section of the car. The suspension looked fine. The car looked like it was tracking in a straight line for one. That's the most important bit. And right now the team are going to work with uh, detaching the broken front end and they've got a brand new front end, stars and stripes livery on this car. Uh, about to be presented to the front of the car. They'll take a quick inspection before they do that, and they're happy with it. It's going straight on, so it's not going to be, it's not going to lose too much time. I think they've been very lucky here. They have lost a lap, but only a lap uh, as the front end goes on. Not yet they haven't, actually. Uh, have they not? Not uh, yet. Okay. They've only no, no, you're right. They have it. You're right. They have it. The, the, it's going to need to be a lot of clean-up, and there'll be a lot of drivers saying, yeah. keep an eye on my tyre pressures for me, because carbon fibre shards are extremely sharp. So was there a little nudge from the AWA car on Lance Wilsey? Uh, the uh, well, he, was be he, was, he had been behind the uh, number 13 car at the start. Um, the, the only other MP, MP3 car behind Lance was, I mean, they were the, at the back of that pack ahead of the, with the gap, with the class split then to the GTD and GTD Pro cars, but he, he was at the back of that little pack, so I'm not quite sure what happened. But what's odd to me, John, is all that debris having fallen off all sorts of different bits of debris on the, on the back straight there. That's kind of weird. Well, it, it's, it's, it, it, the, the nose was damaged and then the rest of it fell off. The, the bit that was yeah. loose fell off as he came out to turn five and yeah. six on the way down to, so to turn seven. I think he probably ran over that himself. Jules just told me they put a new set of Michelins on that car and it is rolling. Joe Bradley. Yeah, very controlled. Took the decision to take the scrub rubber off, which the car would have started the race on, and they've gone for brand new Michelins. So the car now out. It was a very, very, very calm. Let's approach this. We've got plenty of time. We're under yellow. Let's not make this too bad. And just as the car peels out of the pit road, right behind it on the road, it'll be able to make ground on it, comes the safety car with the rest of the field behind it. But it's going to be able to come all the way around and get on the back of the train. Yeah, made it out before the red light him on. Great to see the FAF driveway Porsche, the plaid Porsche. March Pladness, as they are talking about. March Madness here in the US is the big basketball tournament, the skills basketball tournament that uh, has huge following here. And yesterday, uh, a huge incident for that uh, FAF car that saw it in the wall hard at turn one. Uh, was there some more damage further back in the GT field? I think not. But my goodness, whoever was behind the wheel of the plaid Porsche, Klaus Backler starting that in his uh, first start here at Sebring. This is his first full season of ELMS. He's had seven previous races in IMSA competition. They've all been at the Rolex 24. And he missed that by the barest of margins. He put the car off yesterday, but they were out of here by midnight last night. So a fantastic run for those guys behind the scenes, the unsung heroes. And uh, Backler doing his very best. The whole GTD failed, having to split. He was unsighted by one of the Aston Martins. I uh, know it was the uh, Vault Energy. Uh, Porsche in front of him and he did a good job not to just run straight into the nose of Lance Wilsey. It's happened to me once, I got turned around at the start of actually my very first car race at Croft and managed to see the whole field coming towards me. That wasn't, or the whole of the rest of the field. There's about, I think, 15 cars behind me. And uh, that wasn't pleasant, I can see it, because there's nothing you can do. You can't move. You've just got to hope everybody misses you. And uh, all you can do is take your hands off the wheel and your feet off the pedals and hope that you do not get hit. Fortunately, I didn't. Well, so... Rather be lucky than good, John. <laughs> well, 
Uh, by the way, the number 33 car has come past again. It is, is still on the lead lap, so great work there by Sean Creech Motorsports. Huge experienced team, of course. Uh, Sean has been around the sport a long, long time, back in the Doran racing days. So he knows what the old GTP cars were all about. Um, and uh, so that car is uh, is back on the lead lap. No major changes there. Really, no, very few changes of position on that opening lap. Nice, clean start for the rest of the field. Uh, we've still got the same respective leaders. Uh, overall, Pippa Durrani was able to fend off that number 10 car at the first corner. That was pretty exciting, wasn't I, it? I thought he'd got it done and done because yeah. he got a really good jump. But it uh, was Ricky Taylor followed him through. He was behind the pole sitter, yeah. must have got a bit of a draft, and then swept out to the right-hand side. Yeah. And they were absolutely side by side yeah. going through turn one. Yeah, and at the exit as well. And Pippa had the inside and then left his braking really late at turn three to make sure he held on to that lead. So great driving by both of those two. On cool tyres yeah. as well. Yeah, it's good, good stuff. Yeah, very good stuff. LP2, it's still Ben Keating who leads the way. In LP3, it's Glenn Van Berla who leads the way. In GTD Pro, it's Antonio Garcia for the Corvette team. And then a couple of positions behind him is Kyle Marcelli. Coming back to green flag racing. We've lost 10 minutes with that first appearance of the Cadillac V-Series safety car will now start single file and no class splits here. And Durrani again gets a good restart, but we know how quick the Acura is in a straight line. We saw it at Daytona. Taylor does not get alongside this time through, but the side-by-side -side racing further back as BMWs and Porsches are battling through the bumps of turn one as the number seven Porsche, who's got Conor de Filippi on his right-hand side going into turn three. I think he just managed to hold on. No, Farfus has gone through. Matt Campbell drops a position to one of the BMWs. That's where they started. The, 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 uh, the Porsche was in the BMW sandwich at the start. I think they've... Farfus has gone through uh, on him, I think. Or did Connor... Or was it Connor trying to get around the outside? Oh, and off! This is the Inception McLaren, the number 70 car, right under the Corvette walkover bridge. Drive over bridge, excuse me. And that was, again, that was inches away from a ca catastrophe. And we've got another car off at turn seven as well. Uh, that's one of the prototypes down there and he's got all the way around that is the uh, number 18 motul sponsored machine of dwight merriman for aero motorsport the mclaren's rolling again somebody's just come out of the pit lane that was lance wilsey um uh, was that lance coming Which back into the pit lane for a top off uh, might have been a drive-through. We'll get that in a moment uh, now. There, there are going to be a couple of drive-through penalties, however. Ah, oh. th there's a penalty on number 33 car for more than emergency service during a closed pit. Right, Stop so he serves that Ouch. straight away. Ouch, that's a big one. Stop plus 60 for that number 33 T. With their experience, they shouldn't be falling foul of that one. Because, uh, of course, the pits were closed because that was a short yellow being within 15 minutes or 15 seconds of the start. Also, penalties for changing lanes before the start finish line at the start for number 92. That's uh, David Bruley in the Kelly Moss Porsche and also number 17. That's one of the two AWA Duquesnes in LMP3, Anthony Mantella. Just wondering if the Inception car got a little bit of help from the Iron Dames. Lamborghini there as they were battling for position. It was the right motorsport Porsche that was closest to it as it started to come back onto the track. Brendan Erib did a fantastic job of getting on the brake pedal so that he didn't roll back onto the track. So the number seven zero has rejoined uh, and we've got those two that Jeremy's just mentioned serving their drive through so the 92 Porsche coming through and the number 17 also already serving that uh, penalty get it done quickly Anthony Mantella for the AWA team in that Duquesne number 17 so more than our fair share of drama already and the top three are absolutely together going on to the back straight Cadillac, Acura Cadillac, then Porsche number 
six of Mathieu Jaminet in fourth position. The six car retains its livery in both the WEC and here in IMSA. So that's the one with the white pinstripes on the front of the car and over the cockpit, and also the white swooshes on the side. The other car, be it the seven here, or the five in WEC, has the black stripes. That's the way to remember the Porsche Penske Motorsport liveries. Pipo Tirani, no need to defend at turn one this time. Through the kink at two, breaking for turn three. Coming down to the first 15 minutes, huge crowd on hand here. Hello, if you are listening uh, around the circuit. Highlands ESPN, 106.3 FM. Good to have their radio waves once again. They'll be with us right through to the finish tonight. IMSA Radio RS2, part of the Radio Show Limited network of audio and visual channels, imsaradio.com, which is also where you'll find the live, free and uninterrupted World Feed TV. For those of you outside the US, of course, you've got Lee Diffie and the team for NBC Sports. But if you're outside the US and there's no national network TV, then go to imsaradio.com Click on the top left drop-down menu. The first item there is live video. And you can tune into us with the IMSA radio commentary from Trackside. Well, I did say take a deep breath, because you might not get one. Well, my goodness me, have we not delivered already? And still this cracking now four-car battle at the front of the field. Then there's about a second back to Tom Blomqvist in the 60 Acura. Then Augusta Farfus, Matt Campbell did hold off Conor de Filippi, as Jeremy suggested, so 24, 7 and 25 in 6, 7 and 8. Ben Keating holds the lead from the number 52 LMP2, in the 52 LMP2 for PR1 Mathesons, that's the wins car. Glenn Van Berlo, Andretti Autosport in LMP3, the 36. And the GTD Pros pick their way through the carnage at Turn 1, the best. Tony Garcia for Corvette Racing, and Vassa Sullivan's Lexus RCF GT3, so that's numbers 3 and 14, lead Kyle Marcelli for Racers Edge Acura in third. Then it's Heart of Racing Team, Aston Martin, next up, and Aaron Tielitz for the GTD, the Pro-Am driver combo for the Lexus number 12. The cars were identical in GTD Pro and GTD, it is the driver lineups that determine which of those two categories to go in. And we've already had a couple of victories from the Pro Am categories. Petit Le Mans last year for Gradient, and of course at uh, Daytona a few weeks ago, just up the coast here for the Rolex 24. Again, that was a GTD rather than a GTD Pro car that, that won uh, that particular that particular GT fight. They are scored for different championships, but as I say, the cars are the same. Absolutely jam-packed at the moment. <laughs> if fun. you're coming in, you're listening to us on Highlands ESPN 106.3 FM. Uh, first of all, you're late. Hope you've got a hall pass. Secondly, uh, bring a shoehorn and some liquid soap, I think, <laughs> if, you, if you want to get in here. We don't... Uh, get numbers but i can tell you it's a lot a very lot yeah it's brilliant uh, by the way you talk about the colin de Filippi and manny campbell the number seven and number 25 other way around uh, they did they actually swap positions a couple of times in those first few laps number seven uh, number 25 did get past number seven porsche but then manny campbell has redressed that balance on the last lap around so they're still running a little bit of a train there your best lap of the race of 50.9 for our race leader Pippa Durrani last time around in LMP3 Dan Goldberg has got off to a flying start in the number 85 car for uh, JDC Mellon Motorsports he's got past Paul Siddig Glenn Van Berlo and pulled out about six seconds on the first few laps so really inspired getaway for Duquesne driver Dan yeah. Goldberg VP Challenge, of course, yep. he was here yep. that last weekend and I think that may have done him the world of good Yep. quite a lot of people using that series as an opportunity to get their non-pro drivers extra time in the cars that they 
race either in the Michelin Pilot Challenge, which we had on Thursday this week for the Alan J. Automotive Network 120, or indeed in the LMP3s here in the Big Show, the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. 71st annual Morbin 1, 12 hours of Sebring, live from trackside on RS2 IMSA Radio. 20 minutes into the race and Ben Keating has company at the head of LMP2, Francois Ergo for TDS Racing is just half a second yeah. behind. And the 18 car into the pit lane, that's Aero Motorsport, Dwight Merriman, uh, incident responsibility uh, with the contact with Rick Ware Racing, number 51 car. So that picked up by race control, and that's car in and through the pit lane, just to drive through for that car. Yeah, and this is an LMP2 battle. I don't think Ben Keating was probably expecting that <laughs> because Francois Ario is right there and looking for a way past. Ben Keating is, uh, well, he's, he's, he's right, widely regarded, is he not, as the uh, perhaps the, the best bronze driver in the world. Uh, he showed it yesterday uh, as usual in the uh, WC race driving for Corvette racing. Now is he back in his, in his LMP2 car, but he's under a lot of pressure heading into turn one from the Team TDS car number uh, 35 of the French Rem, Francois Herriot. Jeremy Shaw with me, John Heindorf in the IMSA Global Broadcast Centre overlooking the start-finish line, the Mobile 1 12 hours of Sebring logo, which was cleaned up and repainted in pretty much pitch darkness last night after the eight hours of the FIA WEC. And they've done a cracking job. If that had been left to me, it would have been serving 21 hours in the dark. And they've done a cracking job on that. So out on the far side of the circuit, it is Ben Keating in the wind, coloured 52. Then the two TDS racing cars, it's an LMP2, Stephen Thomas, just closing in on that battle as well. Francois Aro in that rhubarb and custard coloured TDS machine in second place. And see Stephen Thomas just dropped a little bit of time last time around as uh, he was battling to get to the scrap for first and second and if he'd had just a little moment on that previous lap as he was within sight of those two so that's the uh, 52, 35 and 11. Stephen Thomas across the line now in front of me can see the cars. Now that's the opposite way around. So that's the mostly yellow car with the red front end, whereas the other TDS car is the mostly uh, red car with the yellow stripe and the fenders in that same bright highlighter yellow color. But Ben Keating holding them both off at the moment. Dan Goldberg by five seconds over Glenn Van Berlo. And then another six seconds back to Carl Robinson in LMP3. 85, 36. And then the Ranch 74, the, the orange and blue number 74. Tonio Garcia for Corvette. Is it four out of the last five he's won here or three out of the last four? It's certainly, he's got a great run. Formerly in GTE and now running in... GTD, of course, one and a half seconds back to the Lexus of Jack Hawksworth and Max Reberus in the number 23, Heart of Racing, Aston Martin, Carl Marcelli for Acura. And that car is not, at the moment, a season-long race machine, the number 93, just the Michelin Endurance Cup. Two and a half seconds to the good on the GTD, i.e. the Pro-Am, driver lineup for Lexus with another couple of seconds back to Madison Snow for Paul Miller Racing who's come up through the field 
to challenge for a top three position. First two pulled away just a little bit on that last lap, but a new fastest lap of the race for Ricky Taylor, 149.7. That's the first car into the uh, 49s. The previous lap, the best lap had been set by Maddie Campbell down in seventh position in car number seven, the Porsche hits at the fastest lap at a 50.17. Of course, these are new benchmark fastest race laps for GTP. All of a sudden, those first two pulled away a couple of seconds. With the advantage of uh, traffic and that fast lap for Ricky Taylor from Sebastian Bourdais in third place. And again, the early stages and yeah, yes. no, nobody's, nobody's pushing too hard at this stage. You just want to make sure you don't make any mistakes. Easier said than done, Jeremy, as they close up again, coming through traffic. And that's the opportunity for Sebastian Bourdais to get right there in that yellow nose. Oh, and there's the contact, the accurate side swiping at turn 16. That was the, so who's in behind the Iron Dames there? That was the GT car that was right in behind the Lamborghini. Um, so that would have been uh, the Porsche of Alan Metney, who was right there. And just a little contact left hand side of the black and blue Konica Minolta Acura as Pipo Durrani flashes his headlights to let the Ferrari know he's coming through at turn one. Yeah. The, uh, number 47 is the next one, that's the blue Chetelar machine that will go a lap down to these leaders, but not in class, of course. We do have five different categories of cars which are effectively four different car classes. The GTs are all the same, as we've mentioned. Leaders now passing the Chetelar Racing. And number 47, Giorgio Sergiotto behind the wheel of that one. Yeah, and that, that last lap by the leaders at uh, 1 minute 55.7. Yeah. So the previous lap, uh, That's the, the traffic, fastest lap it? was a 49.7. This one's a 55.7, so six seconds all of a sudden there in traffic. And most of that would have been through that uh, Jean Dubain complex up at 14, 15, 16. That's pretty because, much one line there, isn't it? Exactly. You have to just follow the GTD cars through there, then pass them on the Alec Ullman straight. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to get in touch with us, hello to Wicker Bill. Said you mentioned manufacturers possibly able to learn from yesterday's WEC race. Can Porsche learn from the tyre degradation they had, or are they different tyres? WEC did have two compounds of uh, Michelin Slick, as the, the IMSA cars did at Daytona. Just the higher temperature tyres, higher use temperature tyres being used here. So they will have used the same compound at various stages in the race. So your question is a good one, Wicker Bill. Thank you for that. Also, hello to Andy Blackmore. Graphic wizard. There's more side by side through turn one. And that was for the lead of the race. And Pete Durrani holds off Again, Ricky Taylor likes that outside line there. Hello, Andy. Nice to see you, albeit briefly. Speak to you next week. Now, has there been a problem for the right motorsport team? Joe Bradley telling me my ear that they've burst into life. So they'll probably have an onboard from their own car. So let's see if that's been an issue. Wow, it's like a police chase through traffic at the front of the field here. And the Porsche Penske Motorsport 963, number six of Mathieu Jamin here, is right with Sebastian Borte with another clump of GT cars right ahead. In fact, they've caught Ricky Taylor as well. My, that Acura is quick down the tubes, down the straight. Anything that's straight, that Acura pulls out three or four cars lengths. We saw that at Daytona as well. Very slippery. Remember Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti Autosport? They wanted to run a slightly less draggy 
rear wing setup in the final parts of the race at the Rolex 24 Daytona. And when they went to change the rear end for a setup that they already had, they realized that one of the fixing dowels that locates and holds that whole rear end and should slot into a machined hole in the gearbox. It, it snapped off and it was left in the gearbox. And so they couldn't, they had to run the slightly draggier set up towards the end. Maybe they've learned from that today. Waiting for some GT pit stops here with a couple of Porsche teams looking to come in. Jan Halen in the Porsche into the pit lane will get Joe Bradley to keep a note on that. He's come out of a top six position there, Joe Bradley. Yeah, that's just what I was thinking, John. I just happened to be at the right motorsport box where they burst into life. There's nothing apparent that's brought this car in. And right now we're seeing refueling and a tyre stop going on. Brand new uh, Michelin tyres going on. But we'll get to the bottom of this when the car leaves. I've got another Porsche in here. It's Klaus Backler staying aboard the FAF Motorsport Machine. New sticker Michelin's going on to this car. Yes, they have the stickers on them. That's how I can tell that they are indeed brand new. But Klaus staying aboard, remember, they did have tyres to go on this car after the crash in yesterday's qualifying session. The pit stop is done. Klaus very tamely going back out onto the track. Shit, did he beat out the he did oh, beat by out a country the right mile? Uh, now, stand by just a second. They did do a driver change. It's Ryan Hardwick behind the wheel of the 16th. There's your answer. They are trying to get their bronze drive time out of the way. Three hour minimum for each of the drivers in the GTD class. And if you've got Jan Halen, you want to save Jan Halen for when it gets dark. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's all part of the strategy. Porsche keys to the race. Get your performance ready for the night time that is when this race is generally speaking won now i wonder if those two have come together then at some stage or whether that was purely tactical let's uh, find out with joe bradley who's with jan halen just out of that car the bright yellow helmet exiting as they were doing the pit stop joe Jan, you brought that car in from sixth place. There's obviously some sort of strategy going on here. Can you tell us? Yeah, we just had a, a right rear puncture. A lot of, um, it was a lot of crazy driving out there for the first uh, 20 minutes of a 12 hour race. So we were just hanging back and being safe. But uh, yeah, all was good with the car, just a puncture. All right, okay, man. Exactly what we said, Jeremy, about yeah. reacting to situations and being flexible. There was a lot of debris, a lot of carbon fiber shards out there from the Sean Creech machine. Now, normally you'd have left Jan in there, but you've come into the pit lane. Right, let's let's do something different. We're now off strategy. And so those two Porsches both now on a slightly mixed up pit call strategy. Yeah, and, and this year, unlike previous years, in qualifying for GTD, you, any, any of the drivers can, uh, can qualify the car, uh, unlike in the past where it's always been the, the bronze driver who start, bronze or silver driver who, start, who, who has to qualify and start the race. It's diff that's changed nowadays, so there are different strategies there uh, in, uh, in terms of who qualifies the car, what track position you have at the beginning of the race, um, and then the right motorsports team are electing to get their bronze driver at the wheel of the car pretty much at the first opportunity that came with that puncture. You're listening to live coverage from trackside of the 71st annual Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring on IMSA Radio. Great to have your company wherever you are around the world. 11 and a half hours or thereabouts remaining and Pete Modorani has been scored uh, at the lead of every one of the 15 laps that have been completed. He's had to fight for it. Great starts from Ricky Taylor in the Konica Minolta Acura from P3. Swapped to the outside and challenged early on. Early safety car, Sean Creech Motorsports. Brought to time number 33 and off has gone the number 20. That's high class, the red, white and black car. Dennis Anderson, I think, started that machine. Yes, he did. Fifth position in LMP2. And he's gone across the dirt and kicked up a lot of dust over at turn... Is that turn 10? He rejoins oh, and almost causes a problem. 
check that turn 13, tower turn, my apologies. Now he was in a bit of a battle. In that fifth position, Chris Allen, Performance Tech Motorsport, was right there as well. So did he just miss his braking point? Ah, he was coming to put a lap on the inception car and ran off the road, coming through turn 12. The little right-handed kick put his Michelins into the dirt. And there's quite big, there's quite big trenches off the edge of the circuit. Gets all four Michelins airborne. He was steering back onto the track, but at that point, the Michelins were about six inches off the ground. Yeah. And actually, he's got away with that, Jeremy, without too much damage. I suspect it's shaking him up a little bit, and the team will be looking as they go by and watching all the onboard telemetry to see if that car has sustained any major damage. Yeah, slight lapse of concentration there, I think, for Dennis. He uh, came up behind that uh, GTD car, and. Must have got a little bit distracted, ran wide there, and as you say, there's there's some uh, fairly major ruts out there, and uh, once the car gets airborne, <laughs> steer, it doesn't matter how much steering you put, you, you put it there, it's really not going to make any difference at all. Uh, so he runs right, he does see, he gets away with no damage, I don't think, to that car, but that was a pretty scary moment indeed. Yeah, I, I maybe could have had a little bit of air or wash behind that car and run out the six inches too wide. Let's uh, go back to the front of the field. Turn seven, now turn eight. And once again, Ricky Taylor puts the pressure on the wheel and engineering Cadillac ahead of him. People Durrani, Ricky Taylor, Seb Bourdais, Matthew Jaminet, Tom Blomqvist, Augusto Farfus, your top six. That's a decent top six in driver lineup, isn't it? Really is. And Taylor right there now in the Cunningham and Alta Acura. Acura, yeah. not with a perfect reliability record this weekend. Both the number 10 and the number 60 ARX 06s have ended up at various stages of this week in practice or in qualifying. Actually, qualifying was OK, but in the practice sessions, they've had their issues, uh, electrical issues. Yep. New steering wheel required at one stage for the number 60 car, but that didn't cure it, and that they actually caused a red flag at that point. And they must be slightly concerned, I would say, about the potential Look, for reliability issues. Looking to the inside there, going to turn 17 was Ricky Taylor, but, Rick, uh, but uh, unable to make that pass. Last time around, uh, it was a new fastest lap for Pippa Durrani in the lead of the race, but that was then eclipsed by Manny Campbell in that Porsche. So new fastest lap to him, a 149.67. Top three cars absolutely together again. At turn number three into four and five, that little serpentine run after the ultra-quick first corner. They've cleared the traffic. Mathieu Jaminet, not that far behind either. He'll be on the back of them as soon as these three start fighting and taking the less than optimum line around this circuit. You get dirt on your tyres, there's a lot of dust. The track was swept immediately after the checkered flag last night from the, uh, the WEC race. But there's still a lot of dust getting dragged onto the circuit by various of the competitors. Dustin Sands, Durrani pulls away again. It seems when Durrani is in clear air, he can make up the time. He's being very careful through traffic. And as the leader, of course, you wake up the cars yeah. as you're coming upon them. So you do have to be a little more circumspect as you come up to traffic. Uh, very, very true there, John. Absolutely right. And uh, he's certainly doing that. And, uh, and then when he gets clear air, he puts his foot down and goes for it and uh, edges out a little bit once again over that accurate in second place. The Cadillac right there in third. Then just a very short gap back to Matthew Jaminet in number six Porsche and Tom Blomquist in number 20, uh, excuse me, number 60 Acura. The two BMWs, they're still sandwiching Maddie Campbell, who's the fastest car on the track in terms of lap time so far. The people's on a really good one now. Just went purple in sector two. He crossed the line. He was lost a bit of time in the first sector, but a 49.9 last time around for our race leader, Pippo Durrani. In the classes in this VP Racing Fuel in-race update, it's Ben Keating by about two seconds, Francois Ariot. 
for TDS. His teammate, seven seconds further back, Stephen Thomas. 52, 35 and 11, your top three there. LMP3, Dan Goldberg took the lead on the restart from Glenn Van Berlo, who dropped quite a long way back. He's got that down now. He's got Dennis Anderson recovering between himself and his class leader, but he's got that down to under two seconds now. It was five or six seconds earlier on. Gar Robinson is uh, 30 seconds further back. I suspect there was some kind of malarkey went on uh, at the restart there, and Dan Goldberg picked his way through it. Antonio Garcia for Corvette Racing leads the GTDs from Jack Hawksworth in second in the number 93, uh, in the number 14, excuse me, Vasa Sullivan Lexus. So bright yellow Corvette from highlighter yellow and black Lexus number 14. Three seconds between those three, then the best of the GTD cars is next up, and that's the number 93 Acura NSX GT, Carl Marcelli for Racers Edge Motorsports. And at the front of the field, the top three are separated by under three seconds as we come round to complete lap number 19 as they go across the stripe. Next time by with 11 hours and 20 minutes to go. That's your VP Racing Fuels in race update here, live from Sebring on IMSA Radio. Whether you're joining us around the world on IMSA Radio or IMSA TV, of course, outside the US, full, live, free, no subscription. No sign-up, no side-by-sides, unless it's on the track and we're getting excited about it. <laughs> Just the racing, flag to flag, on the World TV feed. Also around this part of Central Florida on ESPN, Highlands ESPN 106.3 FM. Thanks for loaning us your airwaves. And good to have your company again this year. Jeremy Shaw, action down at the hairpin in the lead. I'm watching yeah. that. You're looking at the timing screen. <laughs> Lots of cars down there. Where the are hairpin, we supposed they? to look, Jeremy? Yeah, Where well, are we supposed to look? You know, it's it's great. Uh, and, uh, I mean, there's you know, certain, uh, a certain amount of cat and mouse going on out front of the field. But Matty Campbell once again sets a new fastest lap. 49.47 uh, for the number seven Porsche. Uh, very interesting to see that. I mean, he's still not made any any headway. He's not able to find a way past Augusto Farfus in the number 24 BMW. Uh, but he's, yeah, he's not losing much ground to, to anybody else. Every, all of the GTP cars within 10 seconds or so of each other. Conor Di Filippi, perhaps the most conservative, back in at number 25 five car in the eighth position. But again, you know, there's still... How long have we been in this race? We're 40 minutes into the race. I would expect the LMP2 cars to be coming into the pits fairly soon for their first stop of the day. Wouldn't expect to see the GTP cars for another probably 15 minutes. They can do about 50 minutes or so of green flag running, somewhere between 50 and 55, I think. Uh, so longer than their stints were in the old DPI era. Yeah. Uh, and um, But I don't expect anybody coming into the pits just yet. And one thing we have to trail ahead to, Jeremy, it's a whiz away yeah. yet, uh, is the Michelin Endurance Cup points, because there are interim points awarded through this race, as there were at the Rolex 24 Daytona at four and at eight hours. So we might, for cars like, for example, that race's edge number 93, who are only doing the long races, uh, we might see them go off strategy to be leading at the four or the eight hour mark in their category. And that sometimes means that they'll shorten up a stint and then let everybody else cycle through who perhaps are prioritizing that four race championship. Uh, true, true that. That's certainly something that, to keep an eye on um, over the course of the next you know, couple of hours to see if anyone goes off strategy, planning ahead to that four hour mark in the race. Uh, in LP3, by the way, uh, Glenn Van Berlo has not only caught up to Gant Dan Goldberg, who made that lightning start and pulled away uh, as much as uh, five or six seconds, I think he was, ahead of one, at one stage. Well, Glenn Van Berlo, the pole sitter in LP3, kind of a 36 for Andretti Autosport, has. Uh, has now retaken oh, that wow. advantage. So he's back in the lead, so to speak, from the start. Uh, uh, Dan Goldberg in second position. Gar Robinson, a distant third now, more than half a minute back in that number 74, uh, number 74 Riley Motorsports, Ligier. Yeah, I'm not sure what went on at the restart there, um, but 
Glenn dropped nearly eight seconds back uh, from Dan. Whether there was, maybe that was part of the argy bargy when the, well, the inception car would have been behind them, wouldn't it? So, um, but we did see, we did see a prototype spun at the hairpin, on the exit of the hairpin. So maybe they had to check up for that and that disadvantaged Van Berlo. So traffic beginning to clump back up again. There's a big field here, 44 cars taking the start. Uh, excuse me, 54 cars taking the start. 53, of course, yes. Yeah, the uh, MRS GT uh, LMP3 car was withdrawn. They didn't uh, find any drivers in. It's a shame that car had a really good, really good showing at Daytona. Uh, they were entered wow. here, but uh, never with any drivers. Andretti Autosports, Glenn Van Berlo now having hit the front, as Jeremy reported a moment or two ago in the number 36 leash year. He's just put the fastest lap of the P3 race in, 158-0. Gar Robinson at 2 minutes, 0. 0.6, so... What, two and a half seconds away, and that's that's cars fastest lap of the red. Two minute point two for Ari, Ari Baylock in the Junior 3, number 30 car. And Dwight Merriman fighting his way back after issues at the start in the number 18. He's just put his fastest lap in for the Aero Motorsport LMP2 Oringer, 156.6. And movement down at TDS. Yeah. Shea Adam in the pit lane. Francois Aro is the first one of the LMP2 cars to come in for full service. This will be fuel. Does not look like they are going to change the tires, though. So maybe it isn't complete full service, but they are going to clean off the windshield. Francois staying aboard this car. And yes, fuel only confirmed. But this sister car, the one that has more yellow on it than red, this one with more red than yellow, the sister car, when it comes in, Stephen Thomas will be receiving a new nose as well. There's an old joke in there about dogs and no, that doesn't matter. Move on. 11 and a quarter hours still to go as we head towards 11 o'clock local time. Hello, everybody. Good to have your company. Clocks changed here last weekend, so just four hours behind the UK and five behind Europe at the moment. Weather tech in as well. The 79 AMG. That looks like fuel and tyres, no driver. Joe Bradley has action at his end of the pit lane. Yeah, we've got a few LMP2 cars showing their cards. Uh, just in now is the Rick Ware Racing car 51. Uh, that car's in for fuel, looks like tyres as well. But more importantly, I think, the, with the uh, regards to the top three, the 04 car, the crowd strike, ra crowd strike racing by APR team have burst into life and are on the wall ready to receive their car from that third place in class. Yeah, uh, right on schedule for the first fuel stop for the LP2 cars. I expect the, the other lead or the leader, Ben Keating. Uh, George Kurtz hasn't stopped yet. Stephen Thomas. No, just in, just in the crowd strike car. Is it in now? Yeah. Uh, not quite, sorry, coming in at the end. Yeah, it should be the end of the track, exactly. Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, expect all those guys. In fact, uh, George Kurtz just got past Stephen Thomas uh, last time around. Uh, made that p or, uh, f the pass for what is now third position with number. Uh, number 35 car already pitting on that last lap. Ben Here comes Ke Ben Keating now. Yeah, Ben Keating in the lane, leading, coming out of ninth position, leading LMP2. That's right in front of Joe Bradley as the leaders go across the line. I'll get to Joe in a second. Sebastian Borte in the yellow fronted Cadillac goes up the inside of turn one. Copy boot pass at Sebring. And it's back to a Cadillac 1-2. Ricky Taylor didn't fight that one. He knew his goose was cooked. Didn't get the exit out of turn 17 that he wanted. People Tarani has scarpered off to a two and a half second lead. And in the context of what we've seen in this first run for the GTPs, that's a substantial lead. Bourdais puts cars between himself and Ricky Taylor. And it's Wheel and Engineering now in their Cadillac V-Series. Dot R 
ahead of Sebastian Borte in the 0-1 Chip Ganassi run machine. Also, Tom Blomqvist uh, has just overtaken the number six Porsche of Matthew Jaminet. So Blomqvist up into fourth position now. Uh, and right behind Jaminet, or a few seconds behind, is now the other Porsche, Mali Campbell, who finally has got away past Augusto Farfus in the BMW. So it's now... It's now uh, uh, Cadillac uh, first and third, Acura is second and fourth, Porsche is fifth and sixth, BMW seventh and eighth, all covered by 12 seconds. So head into the pit lane for a, a little catch up on everything that has been going on. Remind you, you're listening to IMSA Radio live from Sebring around the world on RS2 and here in Central Florida on Highlands ESPN 106.3 FM. Start with Shea Adam in the pit lane. What have you seen, Shea? I just had a stop for Tower Motorsport. The number eight, John Ferrano, stayed aboard fuel and new tires, but the right front tire that came off of that car had a bad blister on it, so something we're going to have to keep an eye on for the LMP2s. We also had the number 11 in that TDS racing car for Cena Thomas. There was quite a bit of damage to the left front of the car, so it did need the new nose. The louvres on the front were completely missing. They did fuel tires and went to send them, but the fuel nozzle was still attached, so that's going to be a drive-through penalty for Lee with pit equipment still attached. And Ben Keating, he came in in the number 52 in the lead of LMP2. Ben Keating stayed at the wheel of the Wins livery car, just took on fuel, no tyres, and in from third place, the 04, the red and silver livery CrowdStrike racing car did exactly the same. George Kurtz stayed on board, fuel only. It's Joe Bradley before that, Shea Adam in the pit lane, Jeremy Sean, John Heindhoff, as we have flag-to-flag -flag coverage in sound and vision. If you're outside the US, go to imsaradio.com. The drop-down menu, menu on the top left-hand side of the website, the first item is live video. Click on that and enjoy the sights as well as the sounds of Sebring. The 93 Racers Edge Machine, one of the cars that we mentioned just doing the Michelin Endurance Cup and still leading its class in GTD for Kyle Marcelli, the bright red Honda NSX. Yeah, what a super job uh, Kyle is doing. His first pole position yesterday, uh, first for that uh, for that team in IMSA Tech Sports Car Championship competition. A really good effort for them. Uh, meanwhile, a couple of notes here. Uh, Ricky Taylor having over, been overtaken by Sebastian Bourdais. Bourdais, on, on that lap that he passed Taylor, set a new fastest lap of the race, 148.794 for car number zero 01. So he's homing in a little bit, or was last time around, as uh, Pippo Durrani uh, himself sets his best lap at a 49.4 this time around to maintain that gap around about two seconds over Bourdais. Ricky Taylor, though, all of a sudden, is five seconds further back in third position, and he's dropped right immediately into the clutches of Tom Blomqvist. That's interesting. Yeah, it, and his, his lap times have gone out a bit, as you mentioned, Jeremy, but he, he just seemed as though he had nothing to fight with when Bourdais came through a couple of three laps ago. And Bourdais now within two seconds of Pete Portorani. He's taken about half a second out of him over the last couple of laps, and that's prompted people to respond with his fastest lap of the race last time around, as you mentioned, in 149.466. Tom Blomqvist right there in the white front with the pink on the back of the XM Sirius sponsored machine. Meantime, in LMP2, oh. Francois Aro, after the exchange of pit stops, is now half a second ahead of Ben Keating. Now, they didn't come out like that. No. That was a pass coming down to turn 17 when they were three wide with the Porsche, one of the GTD Porsches, and that was very nice driving from the Frenchman to take the lead. I cannot imagine Ben Keating coming off a fabulous result yesterday in the first time out for the privately entered Corvette in the FIA World Endurance Championship. Says that's like driving in an armchair compared to the LMP2. It's violent. Now, the Inter-Nicene Acura battle going through turn one. 
Tom Blomqvist right there with Ricky Taylor. Just gets separated for a moment by one of the LMP3 cars. Steve Thomas, Stephen Thomas for TDS. That was the car that had its nose changed uh, on its last stop. So, and, and then of course a drive-through penalty. Drive-through penalty for that car, Jeremy, for leaving with pit lane equipment attached. Gives it its second stop. Number three, Corvette leads in GT Oops. Daytona as a spin from the fifth place number 30 LMP3 car Junior 3 Racing Ari Burlock he was going along quite nicely Just loses it we've seen I think there's a few places on this track that do seem to be a little more tricky this year we all know about turn 17 and turn 1 but Coming through and out of turn five, the breaking into turn three, and for some reason, the breaking into turn 10 and 13, tower turn, have all seen as many incidents as I can remember. It could be that given how highly competitive IMSA is now that everybody's just having to push a little bit harder and on the ragged edge of everything. So, waiting for GTD pit stops to happen. We're 55 minutes in with a little bit of, little bit of safety car early on. So, waiting for the overall leaders to come in as well. Six tenths at the front of the field, Cadillac racing Sebastian Bourdais, the yellow fronted machine, closing in on the red fronted Cadillac. You'll notice they have very similar paint schemes with the fade into the dark gray on the back. That is the Cadillac racing colors now. It was uh, blue yesterday in the FIA WEC. So those two cars now within striking distance, Bordet closing in at the end of the lap. As we're waiting to see the first pit stops for the pro categories. Seven minutes past 11 and 11 hours and four minutes still to go of yeah. the Sebring 12 hours, the Model uh, 1 Sebring 12 hours. Uh, and Ricky Taylor definitely losing some ground here, so I wonder whether maybe that Acura's kind of used up too much yeah. more energy than they would like, because uh, he certainly seems, seems to have cut his pace. All of a sudden, uh, he's now eight seconds behind those leading pair of Cadillacs. He's just gone uh, personal best in Sector 1 as Ricky Taylor on this lap, which is Turn 1, of course. So here comes the pit stops, the lead given up to Sebastian Bordet as people Durrani in the wheel and engineering Cadillac heads towards Sheer Adam for his first pit stop in the 71st running of the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. This will be fuel only for people, fuel and energy, I should say. As the car hits its marks, no new tires. They are doing a windshield claim for people, whereas other teams including the 24 BMW, this is the M Hybrid, is coming down the pit lane. The mechanics sitting on tires with guns in hand. They will be doing at least two. Let's see. Nope, they're going to do all four. So this is the second set of Michelin tires going on this car out of their 11 for the course of the race. Pippo still on his first, still on his qualifying tires. We're also expecting to see Sebastian Bourdais into the pit lane. They have tires for Sebastian and tires as well for Ricky T Taylor in the number 10, Konik Minolta Acura. I do not yet see tires on the wall for the number seven Porsche, but they are in hand for the number six. People is down and away. No new Michelin tires, so the RFID chips that he drives through now at the end of the pit lane will record that those are the tires on which he started his, his race, and therefore they are 20 eight laps of racing plus his qualifying and he only used this set of tires in qualifying 
to snatch pull position. You are now allowed to use a second set of tyres in pull position. Action Express Wheel and Engineering Racing had decided not to do that. It was a bit of a gamble, but the, with a late late qualifying session red flag, it really the carts really fell the right way. Now, Sebastian Borde has the same decision to make. He's in the pit lane and trundling on the pit lane speed limiter towards Shea Adam. And it's a very long way for him to go, coming down to the... Uh, let me see one second best pit box uh, that we have. The car finished third at Daytona, but second place on points coming into today's race. Now, Sebastian hits his mark, staying aboard the Cadillac. They do give him a new drinks bottle. Very hard work out there. And they are putting the new Michelins on. Also into the pit lane, we have Ricky Taylor, who will be stopping in the prime pit box. That's pit box number one. Championship point leader after leaving Daytona International Speedway. We've got four new Michelins going in for Ricky Taylor as well as a brand new energy set for him uh, because we don't actually know quite how that works. It's black magic. Sebastian Bourdais stopped a little bit too close to the pit wall, meaning that when his mechanics went to work on the right-hand side of the car, it was a bit more difficult, but Bourdais should leave well and truly ahead of Ricky Taylor. They are moving the car back by human power, not by electric power, meaning that there is no penalty for still having the fuel nozzle attached. We've also got the 25 in. That is Connor Filippi with new boots for the 25 as well. So, so far, the only car not to take tires has been that number 31 of Nico Durrani. Six goes out and away. New tires for that Porsche as well. We've seen a flurry down in the GDD part of the pit area and LMP3. Uh, keep an eye out, guys, for a number, the number 85, the GDC Miller car, being given an unsafe release, released straight into the path of the Settler -La Ferrari. And uh, I'll be surprised if that doesn't appear on your screen soon. Adam and Joe Bradley as into the pit lane the number 35 Francois Aro TDS racing car this is his second run down the pit lane was this uh, that must be a penalty there as well he didn't stop at his pace now I, I, I know the 11 had the penalty the team car for TDS um, so that was a um, Fueling too fast. Thank you, Alyssa. Up in Charlotte, in my ear. Also, we have a penalty for the 04 Glenn Van Berlo class. Uh, excuse me, the 04 George Kurtz, fourth place LMP2. Failure to adhere to the minimal full refueling time. So that car will have to come down same through same. the pit lane. So couple of flurries of penalties which is exactly what we said you don't want here you need to be perfect in the pits in our Porsche keys to the race Porsche number seven the 963 in the pit lane with shit fuel only for the Porsche as well so the seven and the 31 are still on their initial set of tires they have used one set the 60 also into the pits John and for MSR and they're accurate they are on their third set of tires because they change their qualifying too uh, problems for the 023, the Triassi Ferrari. That's been delayed, and it's what was a scheduled pit stop. They've taken the opportunity to rectify whatever was going on there. I can see sort of shards of what looks like it could be shards of some sort of rubber or maybe wiring that's gotten tangled in the drive shaft area. And it's taken a bit of time. They've had to remove the rear bodywork, including the rear wing. That's now gone back on. The engine cover just going back on. But uh, at this early stage, they did not want to lose this time. And uh, it looks to me, you saw the car very closely, engine cover back on now, and now that car's going to be released. But it's not time. Uh, not a full course yellow. It's uh, out of turn 10. We have a car stranded and high centred on the on the kerbs there and it's the crowd strike machine windscreen wiper flailing on the front of that car and i think that's still george kurtz at the wheel yes it is that was the zero four car that was going to have a penalty anyway and george is rather he penalized served it. himself thank you jeremy uh, however the number 35 tds car in coming in for its penalty was speeding in the pits so Ooh. it will have to come through again only one kilometre, but all of your gimmies have been gimmied by this time. All of the warnings are used up. Full course yellow and safety car number three, two. two. 
Yes, yeah. we didn't get the second one, did yeah, we? So we number went. two. So we'll see that pretty blue Cadillac V Series back out on the track. 52 George. minutes of green. Uh, George had. Uh, uh, well, that was the Sean Creech car yeah, right in front of George, I think, was it? No, he just spun it himself. And unfortunately, didn't know really whether to stick or twist there. Just rolled over the blue and white kerbs and just didn't have enough weight over the back wheels. Pushed himself about eight, nine inches forward. It's just going to need a very quick either push from our AMR safety team. Hello, gentlemen and ladies. I know that you tuned in on 100.9 or maybe on Highlands ESPM 106.3 FM. And a special hello to one of our former team members who is back at the racetrack this weekend, Mike Roberts. Nice to know that he's been around. And uh, Ryan, part of our safety team, absolutely smashing idea. Got a brand new bell helmet signed by pretty much all of the drivers and that was a presentation made yesterday to Mike Roberts who stepped away now from the safety team but had been around for a very long time going back I'm pretty certain Mike went back to the ELMS days now the pits are closed and we have got Jack Hawksworth into the pit lane now is this for emergency service as he comes down pit lane if if he's realized it then the team wave him through he shouldn't get a penalty emergency service is exactly that if you are running out of fuel five seconds only and looks like the heart of racing aston with alex raberes at the same time this is a disaster for those two teams yes they'll not run out of fuel on the track but then they'll have to come back in again so they're losing track position just five seconds of fuel remember and the inception mclaren the 70 car also into the pit lane and the number 27 aston martin also coming in Ian James now the McLaren has a flat tire Joe Bradley yeah that's uh, not exactly what we thought it's uh, I thought the car looked as though it was leading a little bit oddly and I was right it's got a left from uh, a left right puncture a left Sorry, right a left front I said it right the first time didn't right. I left front puncture uh, that's been sorted and it's back out but I'm not sure what that, that'll mean with pit stop penalties well, it, no, it, penalty being that's replacing a tyre if it's got a problem is absolutely allowed under emergency service but you'll have to come back again once the pits are open to uh, complete a, a full service and the pits are still closed it, it's this rule was brought in quite some time ago now. So you can have a five second splash of fuel because quite clearly you don't want to run out of fuel behind the safety car. That's just going to make you have more time behind the safety car. And similarly, if you've got a tire or a piece of bodywork hanging off that could be a danger to anybody else, it's far better for you to come in and have that rectified and then get sent out. IMSA officials in the pit lane under the magnificent Johnny Knotts. By the way, I just noticed in our pit walk, and fair play to IMSA and the pit lane team for this, that uh, I reckon about 50% of the pit lane officials are female. So we are split uh, right down the middle there. That's great to see. And they are watching very carefully at these emergency services to make sure nothing else is being done other than either that five seconds of fuel or something that needs to be rectified to keep the car safe while it's circulating behind the safety car. But very unfortunate, particularily for the Vassar Sullivan team. I Correct. mean, Hawks was running down in second position, just getting ready for his pit stop, and out comes the yellow. Really, really irritating, that is. Cost I mean, they're, they're, trying to do, they're trying to do an hour because yeah, they're looking toward the... Uh, toward the four hour mark in the race. If you can do an hour uh, for the first three stints, maybe you can get to the end to the end of that four hour mark where the Michelin Endurance Championship points are uh, handed out. So that's one of the reasons you'd, you'd stay out as long as you can, particularly with that early caution period, should be able to go comfortably an hour with the GTD car. Happened to Brendan Hartley in the Toyota Gazoo racing car, custom the race uh, oh. in the WEC. 
to his teammate uh, in fairness. Well, take this opportunity to do a VP Racing in race update. We'll start at the front where Sebastian Bourdais, who has stopped, is he now leading the race? Yes, he is. Yes. Right, so that yeah. was the change over on the, and he took four tires. He went, yeah, one, one more lap and uh, got out um, ahead of you. He closed right in before the uh, before the pit stops, and then he got a, a really good in lap, I think, for Bordet. He was able to jump people to Rani on the uh, on the out lap. Also, to change the position, number ten car lost uh, a couple of positions, uh, and the Corvette coming in for emergency service as well from the lead of that class Antonio Garcia oh. so this hasn't worked for them the pass around is going on this is any car that is caught between the safety car and its own class leader so they are not going to lose the full lap so here's how it stands the VP racing field rundown Sebastian Bordier for Cadillac racing ahead of Pipo Tirani, the pole sitter in second, 0-1 from 31 and 60. Tom Blankwitz has moved up through the field, as has Matt Campbell in the number seven Porsche Penske Motorsport machine. Ricky Taylor losing the spot. He was as high as second off the great start that he made in the number 10, Konica Minolta Acura. Mathieu Jaminet in sixth for Porsche Penske Motorsport. Then the two in BMWs, 24 from 25. They've all made one scheduled pit stop. In LMP2, Ben Keating back at the front of the field in the number 15. 52 wins PR1 Matheson Motorsport from TDS Racing and Francois Herreau who started the race in that number 35 car. So despite some penalties, I think he's still got one penalty to, to run because he came in to, for his drive through and had a speeding penalty. He hasn't served that since the yellow came out. Rick Ware Racing's Eric Lux in the 51. Eric is in third. Then it's Stephen Thomas for TDS in the number 11. Nose change for that car and John Ferrano, Tower Motorsports, uh, in fifth for the number eight, Origa. In LMP3, Gar Robinson for Riley, and the number 38 has not yet stopped and therefore has assumed the lead of that c category from Performance Tech's number 38. That is Christopher Allen in second. Jared Andretti now in behind the wheel of the number 36. Andretti Autosport is the first car that has made its pit stop in LMP3. In GTD, Tonio Garcia has just given up the lead and he has gone back out. So he will have given up the lead in GTD. Emergency service, he'll have to come in again. GTD leader uh, Kyle Marcelli, Racers Edge Motorsport in the Acura, leads the green plates. That's the GTD category. And there's a mix of cars that have and haven't yet stopped in that GTD category. Now, as I said a couple of moments ago, we are just taking the cars out of line to do the pass around. And just in case you're wondering what's going on and you uh, missed it a moment or two ago, or you've just come back to us on Highlands ESPN 106.3, saw that the cars are not disadvantaged in all but the top class. If you are in the line behind the safety car, but in front of your class leader, which effectively almost puts you a, class, a lap down on your cla class leader, you're allowed to pull out a line and go back around to the end of the safety car line. So a mixture of cars from the four non-top class have just been able to do that, which means we will open the pits next time around, in fact, this time by, for the prototypes. And it's not been that long, Shea Adam, uh, since the GTP cars were in at uh, Mostly Down Awards pit out. Any takers, do you think? Oh, yes, we have. Fueler ready to go. There are tires on the wall for the 24 BMW, but I do not expect them to change them necessarily. We've got uh, action up on the wall for, uh, which one is that? Oh, no, sorry, that's the Acura. We are expecting them to come in for the 60. The shank, they're going to make another trip down the pit lane, it looks like, just to top off with fuel and energy. Shea Adam rounding up our VP Racing Fuel in race update. We, we can't give you any more no, uh, uh, descriptive uh, information about the energy because we don't have those times 
and they're not given to us and they're not uh, promoted or available. Now, we've got a car going very slowly. This is the number 17, which has in fact now stopped for Anthony Mantella in the green and black AWA car. And we're hearing that car is out of fuel coming out of turn seven towards turn eight. So it didn't come in for emergency service. And this is going to cost that car dearly. BMW in the pit lane is fuel only for Augusto Farfus. Now that, so they were hoping to get round to the end of this lap in that AWA car to get in when the pits open and they've slightly misjudged it. It was fuel only for Farfus. He's being held. The pit lane red light is on as the rest of the field comes through. Good spot by Augusto Farfus. He's a very experienced driver. That's very purposeful looking BMW. The M Hybrid V8 accelerates out and leads, leaves two big dark lines down the uh, away from the RFID lines. Joe Bradley. Yeah, you mentioned the 17 car rolling to a halt there out of fuel. The, the 13, the sister car to that one. It's made it where it's made its calculation correct. It's on pit lane. It's taking on fuel. It's in fact, it's taking on a full service. They've changed the driver, they've swapped the tyres, and now it's just waiting for the fuel, and then they'll get on the way. Well, this has uh, thrown up a few interesting opportunities for strategy calls. Our Porsche keys to the race. You have to stay open-minded and flexible with your strategy. We've seen pit stop penalties so far, leaving with pit equipment on for the number 11 TDS car. Just can't afford to do that. And also on the tyre front, holding on to your tyres. Well, Pete Durrani has not changed since the we started qualifying on Friday. Same set of tyres on the car that he set his fastest lap, the pole lap, for the start of the 71st annual Mobile World 12 hours of Sebring. So still on his first set of 11 that he's allowed, and the rest of the team are allowed between now and 10 past 10 this evening. It's your Porsche keys to the race. We'll also be looking for the best strategy calls. Are they happening now? Will they happen later on? Our BDO Nose Strategy Award at the end of the race tonight. And of course, whilst the chequered flag will end the race at somewhere around 10 past 10 this evening, it's only the start of the conversation. We'll stay on air on RS2 IMSA Radio for Michelin Post Race Tech, the original listener uh, the original listener driven show where you get the tweet in IMSA Radio at IMSA Radio and the hashtag Michelin PRT. That's a ways away yet, but make some notes just in case you, uh, like me, have issues when you say, oh, I must remember that for later, and then later comes and you can't even remember, there was something you might not remember. Never mind what the thing that you might not remember was. So I'll make some notes. Here's the GTDs and GTD pros coming into the pit lane. Coming all the way down the pit lane, it's a very long, slow trundle, but it is the best pit box available for GTD cars, and that goes to Kyle Marcelli. The yellow coming out at just the wrong time for the Acura, but they did not need to make an extra trip down the pit lane. They were okay on fuel to make it in. So now they're doing driver change, fuel and tires. Looks like Ashton Harrison is taking over that 93 Acura. In for the emergency service fulfillment requirement, we've got two of our cars so far. That would be uh, both of the Aston Martins, actually, I should say, for Heart of Racing, no driver change there, but for new tires going on to those two Aston Martins. We've got the Corvette now in as well. That is not a driver change, but Antonio Garcia is getting new tires. New tires for both of the Lexuses, by the way, and new drivers for the number 12. It is Frank Montecalvo who's taken over for the number 14. It is Kyle Kirkwood back with the pro car with which he won the Petit Le Mans at the end of last year. Lexus on Lexus. Oh, that came very close to some violence there leaving the pit lane. But we are back out and running once again. Corvette is still in its box waiting for the fueling to complete. That was a little bit further down the pit lane. And we've also got the Iron Dames Lamborghini in. That is car number 83. Driver change there from Sarah Bovey to Michelle Gatting. 
pretty much everybody in by uh, the, down at my GTD end. Uh, one in particular that caught my eye, the Paul Miller BMW, car number one, barely, the, the fueler was on for literally just a couple of seconds, so they just needed that little bit of top up there, the dust just beginning to settle as that, what seemingly, the whole field came in there. Joe Bradley before that, Cher Adam, live from Sebring International Raceway. This is IMSA Radio. Uh, problems continue for George Kurtz in the crowd strike prototype, the 04, getting pulled back to the pits. He let the rope go slack, the tow strop go slack a couple of times, and I think it snapped actually. Uh, our AMR safety crew very quickly on that and have put another one on. While it's quiet out there, thank you very much indeed to all of our volunteers, marshals, flaggers, medical staff, track workers, even those of you checking tickets and parking cars. Thank you to Riley, who's been helping us out behind the tower here in the last few days, early starts and late nights for all of those, but all of our volunteers, without whom we cannot go motor racing, we thank you for the precious gift that you give us of your time. Joe Bradley, let's pick up some uh, driver interviews from those who started the race. So the number 13, the AWA Duquesne, uh, in LMP3, uh, Ori Fidani uh, nursing a bit of cramp in that right foot. Is that because you want that car to go quicker? Is that, that right leg jammed against the bulkhead? I wish it was, but unfortunately, it's from a previous accident a couple of years ago. I just get random cramps, and uh, yeah, it was sore in the car. Right, you, you'll nurse that. Um, you guys must have been pretty close on fuel. Your team car, your teammate, I should say, the 17 stranded now out of fuel. Just how close was your car? I literally ran out of fuel as I engaged neutral rolling into the box. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, tell me, how was that? session it looked it looked quite controlled and ordered from where we were uh, it was a little tough getting real hot in the car uh, we had the front taped off and the feet were starting to get real hot thanks all right louis delatraz the story so far has been ricky taylor off the start hounding pippo durrani why did he want to lead so badly yeah i don't know we need to ask ricky after but i think the car was fast he did an amazing start as usual and uh, yeah, he had definitely more speed in the beginning Then we seemed to struggle a bit more on tires and we will see how, how it goes now. Well, you mentioned the tires, four new tires. Do you think that'll make a good difference for him? I think it will make a big difference. Obviously now we're offset on a different strategy kind of uh, to the others. Uh, some cars took tires, some not. So in the end, we will see at the end of the race who's right. Does it feel good to finally be back in the GTP car this week? Feels very good. I've been between LMP2 and GTP and definitely being back in the top class is great. And uh, hopefully we can get a trophy today, which we didn't do yesterday. Good luck. Thank you. Just uh, reset something. It wasn't George Kurtz on whom the tour hitch, the tour strop broke. It was uh, indeed the uh, team car to Ori Fadani, the number 17 machine, as that was coming back out of fuel so a couple of leaders came in on that lap mm -hmm. for make pit stops number six and number 25 so one of the Porsches one of the BMWs both came in on that last lap fuel actually. only mm. for both of those of oh, fuel and energy if you will I, I do I do hope we can get some um, handle on what that is. Um, I, I, I think it's a, it's a it's a mandatory time that depending on what you've used within the stint uh, as well as your fuel in terms of the kilowatts of energy that you've used from your energy store battery by any other name and there is a, a mandatory time that you take for that. Uh, let's say, uh, whilst we're still under yellow, we're doing the GTP class split, so the fastest cars go to the front. Joe Bradley uh, has Wayne Boyd down in the pit lane. Yeah, Wayne's got the sorry sight of his car stranded out there. What's the news, Wayne? Are you going to get the car recovered? 
Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's coming back now. There was uh, just a slight miscommunication there, but no, nothing really big dramas or anything. Get it back, get it serviced, and then we'll get back out there. Yeah, I mean, what does this mean? I mean, you know, you're going to drop weight to the back of the LMP3 field. Um, does it take the pressure off a little bit? Nothing to lose now? Uh, it, it doesn't really worry us so much because, you know, obviously with the, the yellows and stuff, we can get laps back. Um, you know, at Daytona, we were a few laps down at a few different stages of the race and we came back and won it by 12 laps. So, um, you know, anything can happen. So we'll, uh, we'll not panic just yet. We know we've got a fast car, so we'll see. And how, as a driver, do you work that out? Do you leave that to the strategist who is passing you the information of what he needs from you? Oh, yeah, definitely not my department. I, I, I just get told what's going on. Yeah, you just press the pedals. <laughs> exactly, try to. <laughs> okay, Hopefully the car will be here shortly when Boyd waiting patiently for his car to be recovered. Yeah, that will go back yeah. into the paddock, I believe. It won't be recovered to the pit lane here. Yeah, probably lost three laps, though. Mm. Uh, in, in GTD, by the way, we've got number 32 and number 78 leading the class at the moment. Those two, I think, uh, both came in for emergency service, so they'll have to make another pit stop before we go back to green. The number 96 car, however, which is running third in line in GTD, 24th overall, that car came in before the full course caution, so that's legitimately where it is on strategy. Uh, and of course, for those who were here yesterday, very different strategies, very different rules between WEC and IMSA uh, in terms of safety cars and uh, what you're allowed to do and when. Yeah, full uh, course yellows in WEC, the pits stay closed all yeah, the way through them. Yeah, so uh, it, that's, uh, it, it allows you a lot more strategic options uh, under the IMSA way, uh, but it also means you can gain or lose much more than you can in WEC. In WEC, it pretty much stays as it was before the caution period. It's very much not the case in uh, in IMSA. Yeah, you can't get your laps back. That's what cost the Ferrari so much. Antonio Fuoco knows all about that. Two drive-through penalties at inopportune moments meant uh, he dropped a couple of laps, which he was stay never there, able there. to get back. Let's go back down to Joe Bradley. Lance Wilsey, 33, Sean Creech, LMP3 car. That was a very, very eventful start for you guys. Yeah, no, um, I feel horrible for the team and Focal One and Exelixis and things. Just coming into turn one on the start, things started to stack up wide. I came to the inside and um, got just locked up the fronts, went into the wall there, tore up the car. Um, again, I feel horrible for the guys, the team. We, you know, we had, we had some good tests. We had pretty good pace throughout. Thought we had a good car to go out and race. You know, we're back out there. We're pushing hard, and we, you know, we'll push hard until the end. But, you know, it, it was on me 100%. I just saw things stacking up outside, stuck, you know, ducked to the inside, got into some marbles and stuff. And, you know, I know better, but you know, you see a gap to take it, and um, it's the wrong choice at that moment. Yeah, I just worried, Lance. I'll leave you to cool off, mate. Yeah, Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, mate. Uh, facing the whole field coming through. Really nice of him to talk to us after all of that as well. Safety car lights are out. The Cadillac V Series uses all of its torque and power. That's one of the IMSA special editions. And it drives away from the GTP leader. Also a Cadillac V Series. That's the race car. And if you look at the headlight treatment, you'll see there are stark similarities between the wheel and engineering car in second and the 31 of Peter Durrani and the leader, the 01 of Sebastian Bordi, and that is absolutely intended. The whole GTP category allowing the car manufacturers to give their racing cars the look and the personality of the road going cousins street cars and it's been very very successful indeed from the dpi days which were wrapped up after six glorious years at motil patilamon last year into this new era and it's two cadillacs in front of the Acura number 60 that will restart and Matt Campbell watch that Porsche Penske motorsport car as well Jeremy yeah absolutely right uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's been very fast so far and he's now got some better track position with the other BMW and the other Porsche coming into the pits green flag is in the air ten and a half hours still to go 
Thank you for joining us. Highlands ESPN 106.3 FM around this part of Central Florida. Good restart from Sebastian Bourdais. Not really a surprise that plenty of restarts under his right foot down through the years. People to Rani having to fight off Tom Blomqvist for a moment in the Acura. But now Blomqvist has got his mirrors full of Ricky Taylor, who again has made a good restart, exactly as from the original drop of the green, and he's got past Matt Campbell, and is now behind the similar car, the Acura ARX 06 ahead of him. Now, he did this last time, but the performance dropped off in the last third or so of the stint. Two Cadillacs, two Acuras, a Porsche, a BMW, a Porsche, and a BMW. That's your top eight on the far side of the circuit. Borde with clear track pulls away. Blomqvist, the Auto Nation Sirius XM machine, heading through turn 13, trying to attack at the same time. He's got to be aware of Ricky Taylor in the Cunningham and all the Acura, the Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti Autosport machine. What a partnership of giants that is, Wayne, telling us earlier in the weekend that the access to so many more people, so much more knowledge, and hoping for a second car in IMSA for next season. Battle for second through turn 17. The yellow fronted Cadillac is bought it. He's pulled away from the red, grey and white. Whalen Engineering, Action Express run car in the hands of Paul Sitter, Pete Zarani. He got a great exit from turn 17. Does not have to defend into turn one. The bumpy left-hander at the start of the lap. And in fact, it's Blockfist who's under pressure from the shades of blue and black Acura sitting in behind him. Second, third and fourth going through turn five now. Yeah, and that number 10 car got past Manny Campbell's Porsche on that restart lap. So up into fourth place then for Ricky Taylor. Uh, he'd been running in, uh, well, running in second before he was overtaken by Bourdais shortly before that, fourth, before that first round of pit stops. Yeah. He came out, though, in the, in the fifth position once the pit stops were completed. Yeah, I, now back up to fourth in car number 10. I said that on a restart lap, Jeremy, that that, that car starts very quickly, yeah. um, but he just didn't have the pace in the last bit of the lap. We've got penalties coming and some of them being served, in fact. Yeah. 63, 35 and 78. Now, there's a drive-through for the 35. That was the TDS car, which is the um, pit lane speedy when he did his last drive-through. But two stop at 60s there as well, Jeremy. The 63 uh, and the 78. That is going to cost them a lot of time. Indeed so. And uh, the, uh, the 78 car is the uh, the force racing with US Race, Race Tronics. Uh, Lamborghini that it's up into where is it now second or third is right up to, to the front in uh, in GTD um, I'm sort of surprised number 32 car didn't come back in again as well and make us another stop because I thought that came in for emergency service but maybe I was wrong spinner and it's the number 38 Ooh. performance tech machine that's out uh, at it's Robert Mao who's had a couple of little incidents this year and he's offered turn 10 he's well off the circuit there Meantime, Tom Blomqvist has shaken off Ricky Taylor and has closed right in on people to Rani. The white, blue and pink Acura has shaken off the blue and black Acura and now starts to attack the red and grey Cadillac as they go under the Corvette drive over bridge. It does seem, Jeremy, as soon as you have to defend in these cars, you lose track speed quite a lot and it's Durrani defending down towards the hairpin at turn number seven drives up the right hand side of the road that'll compromise his exit Blomqvist tries the cut back but can't get underneath now these two are slowing each other down so Ricky Taylor will be back on them again in a moment down to turn 10 did Mao get going again yes he did no yellow flags down there this is also allowing Matt Campbell in the Porsche number seven, the one with the black stripes and swooshes on the side to come through. Flash of the headlights from Augusto Farfus behind uh, Matt Campbell. He's in the 24 BMW, so Farfus thinks he's being held up. Meantime, Blomqvist right under the rear wing of Pipo Tarani as they come into the twisty section through 
15, 16, 17, down the inside, into 16. Uh, looked to me as though Durrani didn't, uh, didn't defend as much as he needed to there. Well, wh who, who did not take on fresh tyres of that round of pit stops? The number 31 car, he was clearly struggling there for grip, going into 14, uh, slid a bit wide, and that was all the opportunity that Tom Blomqvist needed to get alongside taking advantage of that fresh rubber on that number 60 Acura. And now, Durrani under intense pressure from Ricky Taylor. Yeah, I'm not, not sure the long yellow helped people at his tyres there. And here comes Taylor down the inside, putting that heat cycle through them and then letting them cool down again. Sometimes on a worn set of tyres, that's not the best thing to do. So Durrani dropped two positions then in a couple of three laps since we went back to green flag racing. Live from trackside, IMSA Radio at Sebring International Raceway. Just under ten and a half minutes to go. Ten and a half minutes, ten and a half hours. <laughs> it feels like ten and a half minutes, the way people are battling, in fairness. So Borde, Blomqvist and Taylor, Cadillac, Acura, Acura. Then it's Durrani who, remember, did not take... Oh, spin at the final corner. TDS cards, the 35 machine. Well, they're having an eventful day. That's the red car with the yellow stripes. Uh, team car is the yellow car with the red stripe around the nose. Porsche battling against Porsche. The FAF car right in the mix there. And that is Klaus Backler and Alan Metney. The number 91 Porsche ahead of him. Also right in there, the Corvette, Alex Riberas in front of him at the moment in the Aston Martin. Don't forget the Corvette came in for emergency service, so had to come back down through the pit lane and lost the lead of GTD Pro. Antonio Garcia, however, has stayed at the wheel of that car. Haven't really had it chance to have a good look at the GTD battle because there's been so much going on everywhere else but as the usual street fight it's been led at the moment by Kenton Cook in the I say that in the AMG is it yes yeah, it is team caught off Mercedes really then the two BMWs of uh, Brian Sellers for the number one team Paul Miller Racing Michael Tynan is behind the wheel of the Turner BMW in third position. Now, we're going to get some more penalties here for the restart. And the 33, Joao Barbosa, Sean Creech, no, scratch that, my apologies, the 23 is going to get a penalty. That's Alex Riberas in the Heart of Racing team. Jump start also. Getting a jump start penalty. Gunnar Jeanette for AO Racing. Two very, very experienced drivers being pinned for a jump start on the restart. Wow. Wow. That's uh, the, the number 23, Aston Martin, the heart, one of the two harder racing cars, that car running in the Pro, GCD Pro. That was one of the cars that had to come in, in the for lane emergency now. service. In the lane now, serving that penalty, Jeremy. All oh, right. OK, so that was the one that came in uh, for emergency service. So I had to make that extra stop, as did the Corvette and several others as well. I thought, I thought the number 32 car was one of that bunch, but it stayed out. Hasn't made a second stop, so um, curious on that one. But it, that uh, 32 car then leads. It's Kenton Cook driving that car. Number one car is second in GTD. That's Brian Sellers at the wheel of Paul Miller Racing BMW, having taken over from Madison Snow at the first stop. Then the first of the GTD Pro cars, that's Daniel Juncker-Dela, who had to start at the back uh, for that ride height infringement following qualifying. He now leads in GTD Pro. Yeah, don't forget when Mick Grenier got out of the car, that uh, machine had to go at the back because they lost all their times out of the car before the session was called. So the GT battle fast and furious as ever. Now, yeah, and people are now coming under pressure from Augusto Farfus. Whoa. Yeah, big, big. Ah, well, 
It was people checking up in the midfield that caught out both Gunnar and Alex Reberes. And I think they went through. You don't have to wait till the start line on the restart, but you do have to wait until the green is thrown. And I just think that they went a little bit early and it was probably precipitated by the fact that it was backing up halfway down the Ullman straight. They sort of pulled out to avoid that and then probably heard the green and pressed the right foot down as hard as possible. They'll have to come back through. Corvette up the outside of the number 91, Riley Porsche going into turn one. This is going to be brave by Garcia on the outside. No. Position eased off and Alan Mechney has come through the Porsche Carrera Cup Championship. Porsche Deluxe Carrera Cup North America as it is for this year. Gives up a couple of positions there as the FAF Porsche goes through as well for Klaus Backler. Yeah, but only two pro cars going through there. So didn't lose a position in uh, in GTD non-pro. So he's not too worried about that. He's uh, you know, doing, his, uh, doing his job there, running in sixth position. Uh, they're actually the best place of the Porsches at the moment. Uh, until he just got part, he was just overtaken by Klaus Backler, of course, in the pro car. But still, uh, it's been a good early start to this race for that Kelly Moss uh, with uh, Riley team and the Porsche running in six. So Kenton Cook still leads in GTD from Brian Sellers. In LMP2, once again, Ben Keating hasn't been able to pull away at the front. This time he's got the number 51 Rick Ware racing. Uh, car of Eric Lux right with him and Stephen Thomas in car number 11. Just mulling over uh, Pete Motorani and that Cadillac dropping back a little bit. He's still on his first set of tyres. Uh, now, Porsche keys to the race was how many sets can, out of your 11 that you're allowed from qualifying through to the chequered flag? How many sets can you keep hold of? Now, he's taking some pain at the moment, Jeremy, mm -hmm. but... We are not even two hours into this race yet. And where he is right now is fine. And there presumably will be more opportunities for me to fawn over that very lovely light blue uh, Cadillac V-Series IMSA edition. So yeah. short-term pain, long-term gain? Is well, that what we're looking at? I think so, because uh, the, the two Acuras that have just got past him Number 60 and number 10, they both used an extra set yesterday in qualifying. So they've already got one more used set of tyres in, in terms of uh, whether it be new or used than the, the uh, Cadillac for number 31 team. So, Three sets so yes, them, yeah. I, 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 thought, I thought Wayne Tain, Taylor told me shortly before the start when I bumped into him that uh, they were going to double stint in the first couple of uh, stints in this race. Well, they didn't on that first one. No. Thanks to Wicker Bill for that point on the tyre strategy. Gradient NSX just having a big slide through turn number three into four. It's the full season NSX. JG went with green and white car. May have lost Ooh. position there. And now, oh, just gets a little side swipe from the number 10 Ricky Trailer to Taylor driven Conning and Minolta. Gonna be very careful there as a GTP driver. Going down into turn seven as Ricky was there, down the inside of the gradient accurate, and then try to pull back over onto the racing line. So turning left before sweeping right, right through the turn seven hairpin. That's where there was the big accident in WEC with Richard Westbrook doing exactly that on the Proton Porsche that wrote the Proton off against the left-hand side wall. The heavy GTP cars do not break as well in any way, shape or form as the GT3s that run in the GT Daytona category. They've got ABS in the GTDs, of course. And so they break a little bit later, believe it or not, than the prototypes, even though they've got the addition of downforce. Very easy to run into the back of the GTP if they take your bit of the track and then jump on the brake pedal. So the GTP drivers learning all this. These cars nowhere near as nimble into and through the corners as the DPIs, and yet are turning in similar times 
around the circuit. Lap record here. Remind me, Jeremy. Uh, lap record here for DPI 46 1. 1 minute 46 1 in race trim. In Around race here. trim was 461, yeah, Rogue of Alexander and Felipe Nasser actually in, two, in uh, 2021, identical lap times, 46151. Last year's fastest race up was a 47.01. Cher Adam down in the pit lane. One of our Porsche keys to the race was was uh, the Michelin Endurance Cup. Oh, hang on a second, just had the leader giving a bit of a side swipe to the Chetelar Ferrari coming through turn 14 and 15. That'll be being looked at, I'm sure. Shay, Michelin Endurance Cup points at 4.8, and of course at the end of the race, we're just over a couple of hours away from that first tranche of points, but that doesn't stop teams working out where they need to be in a couple of hours' time. No, and I think that's what we've just seen. The first car to react to that option was the number 23, Heart of Racing, Alex Ramirez, who had the drive through penalty, of course, for the jump restart. They came into this race second in the Michelin Endurance Cup with 14 points out of Daytona. They were having a great run until they had an issue in the left rear, uh, something within the drive line that gave way. I think it was the drive shaft, actually. Um, but that car, very competitive, and they know that they're going to be strong for the remainder of the race. They want to take five points at the four-hour mark, though, and they figured out that if they stop now for fuel, their next stop, fuel and tires, should put them in good standing for that four-hour mark. Yeah, I was just listening um, back to a couple of races on the flight over and the drive up from... Miami, it can throw your race strategy out for the end of the race just a little bit. But we've seen in the past in the Michelin Endurance Cup, Jeremy, for those teams who are only in those races, then obviously that's their championship. And those interim points through the race do make a difference. We've seen championships in the past in Michelin Endurance Cup being decided by not just a handful of points, by a single point. True that. Yeah, it, it is uh, likely to be uh, a really close battle. Um, watching now the, the, the two the two Porsches running uh, pretty much together at the moment. They've been passed. Well, they've both been passed. Number seven car has been overtaken by number 24 car. Of regards to Farfus, who's also got past Pippa Durrani. Um, the, the top three are really spreading themselves out. The top four actually spreading themselves out. Battle at the front of GTD as well, with the number 93. That is the Michael Dynan, uh, excuse me, that is the uh, Ashton Harrison driven races age. Acura with Klaus Backler, one of the pro drivers, just going through there. He wants to get up the road. He's fourth in that Faf Plaid Porsche. And he wants to get onto the tail of Antonio Garcia and Davide Rigon and Daniel Juncadella, who are the top three. Meantime in GTD, Kenton Cook, 6.2 seconds to the good on Paul Miller Racing's Brian Sellers, with Michael Dynan in third, another six seconds behind for Turner Motorsport in the number 96. A little bit of a mix-up between GTD and GTD Pro. It's GTD, mm. GTD, GTD Pro, GTD, GTD Pro, GTD Pro for your top six. Yeah, no, number three car is really uh, f forging back pretty quickly, yeah. having, to, having had to make that uh, extra pit stop. Uh, Antonio Garcia is flying through the pack here uh, and uh, pulling a bit of ground on um, Klaus Backler. He's already four and a half seconds ahead of Klaus Backler. And we saw only, what, two or three laps ago, both of them had gone past the number, I forget which one it was now. Uh, the, 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 just, who did he just, oh, Alan Metney they overtook. Correct. Uh, uh, but since Sorry. then, there's yes. four and a half seconds gone between that pair. Meanwhile, in LMP2, we've got the old protagonists here the last couple of years, Ben Keating and Stephen Thomas going at it, hammer and tongs as they uh, <laughs> uh, head through a really good battle between those two. It's Ben Keating who still leads, but Stephen Thomas right with him. And Eric Lux was in that fight as well. He's yeah. fallen back just a couple of seconds, but doing a nice job for Rick Ware racing in third position. That, that battle coming out of turn five through the long sweeping right hundred, six under the mobile one, walk over bridge and into the Heavy braking area, turn seven, the TDS car, easily recognizable by that bright yellow highlighter color, the red stripe down the front.
across the front, should I say. Now heading towards turn 10, they're in traffic, the Chetelar Ferrari right there. Keating gets down the inside. The Chetelar car moves across as rightly can do. At number 47, behind the wheel of that at the moment. Here did we put in that car? It's Roberto Lacourt, isn't it? Yes, it is. Sarah Borvi right there for Ian Dames as well in the bright pink number 83 Lamborghini Huracan. Sarah with a tremendous qualifying lap in WEC earlier in the week in a Porsche because there is no Lamborghini for the Dames to run in GTE. So they're running parallel GT programs with two manufacturers before heading to the GTP ranks and LMDH ranks with a prototype powered by a brand new Lamborghini engine. We believe that's going to be a V6. And that'll be the Iron Dames in 2024. Tower Motorsport just going down the inside of Sarah Bovey there. Sarah keeping a weather eye. And I just wonder how much fatigue, Jeremy, for the drivers who are doing double duty. It was hot and very physically draining. Yesterday I heard Ben Keating say that and he did a, a very interesting strategy with the rest of his team in the 33 Corvette yesterday because they all drove all their time in one go. So there were only two driver changes. Ben did all his time um, and then his teammates followed in with their time straight off the back which uh, I thought it was very interesting, but it, it has to be draining to come back today and do it again. The Biohaven sponsored car in the pit lane at the moment. And that is the number 51 for Eric Lux, and that's fuel only. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought that he needed to come in just yet. A little bit earlier than I would have anticipated, but again, perhaps that team is looking toward the Michelin Endurance uh, Championship points, the first uh, transfer points will be available at uh, four hours into the race. We're currently coming up for two hours. Hello, if you're listening on Highlands ESPN 106.3, we're around the world on RS2, part of the IMSA radio syndication and the Radio Show Limited network of audio and visual channels. Thanks very much to Johnny Parr and Peter Snowden for the live coverage for the World Feed TV and radio broadcast from the NLS Nürburgring Lang Strecker Series earlier this morning. Started at quarter past six over here. Looking and sounding very good. I won't spoil it for you if you're going to watch the archive later on. Shea Adam, you've got the LMP2 pit stop starting. I do. The number 35 is in. That's Francois Aro who's staying here in the pit lane. It looked like Josh Pearson's helmet climbing aboard the number 35 machine. Fuel and new tires going on to that car as well. And the leader is in. That would be one Mr. B. Keating who is staying aboard. Uh, two stints in a race car, hardly enough for Ben at this stage of his life. And he is taking a new drinks bottle. That's good to see. New tires as well. New Michelins going on to the number 52. Wins livery. PR1 Matheson Orica. We've also got Stephen Thomas into the pit lane. Stephen also staying aboard. Anything Ben can do, Stephen can do as well. No tires for Stephen Thomas though, so Ben Keating should have the upper hand. Coming around to the end of the first two hours. We'll do another VP racing fuel update. And where are we going to see the big strategy call? Have we already seen it? Is that the reusing of that set of qualifying tyres twice over? Oh, a little bit of a nudge from, that's the number 11 car. Going up the inside, that was a bit of an ambitious lunge into turn three. And Stephen Thomas is in the pits for TDS Racing, an eventful day for them. They've already had to put one new nose on that. Then they left the pits with the fueling hose on it and had to come back through again. Our BDO Nose Strategy Award coming at the end of the 12 hours of Sebring. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, Piva Duran is losing at least a couple of seconds a lap uh, to the to the the, the real front runners, uh, the the other Cadillac of Sebastian Bourdais, and then the two Acuras 
of uh, Blomquist and Taylor. Did who Porsche's are... put new tyres on as well? I can't remember. Uh, the uh, number seven did. car didn't, and that yeah. is struggling now. Yeah. Matt Campbell has just lost two positions uh, in the last couple of laps to his uh, sister car, which did change tyres, and Conor Di Filippi in the BMW, who also, I think, uh, put on a fresh, fresh set of Michelins. Yeah, I, I think they're looking further down the race, aren't they? The, the, yeah. the, there's only 11 sets of Michelin slick tyres available, all the same compound for everybody it's a controlled tire from qualifying on friday to the end of the race 11 sets of tires now some of the teams used two sets took the best out of the two sets in qualifying durani only used one and got pole position he's still got those tires on the car as we're coming round to the two hour mark so he's still got 10 sets left which means that he is in much better condition to have a fresh or a couple of fresh sets of tyres at the end of the race. Everybody's going to have to double stint, as they say. That's the terminology. That means two tanks of fuel. You're going to have to double stint at least one or two sets of tyres, depending on what you used in qualifying. And this could be crucial at the end of the race, as the... Porsche and BMW battle goes through. Jaminet and Conor de Filippi. And those two, a little bit of rub in his racing. Ooh. Ooh, that's another TDS car in the wars again from the Jaminet Porsche. He was, as it was coming out of the pits, that Stephen Thomas was the nudge -er before, has become the nudge and the BMW's gone through. So that is a change of position for Conor de Filippi going past Matt Jaminet. Filippi in the 25 yeah, so BMW. He's passed both Ferrari, uh, Ferraris, both Porsches in the last couple of laps as uh, wow. Conor de Filippi. Round the outside, take the long way around out of turn five through the sweeping turn six and into the braking area turn seven. That looks like a, that looks like a grip advantage to me, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure whether either of the Porsches took tyres. But that looked very easy. Uh, we at, at this point in the race... No, Gordon, sorry, they did. I don't think I... Well, I think number six car changed tyres okay. on its first stop, and they came in again for a flash. That's what we were told, anyhow. Right. But number seven car, uh, we were told, did not change tyres. Coming up to the two-hour mark. Let's uh, just keep an eye on what's going on, because people are Durrani now under pressure for fifth position. Yeah, he's really struggling. Yeah, his lap times really have gone struggling. way out. He's down in the 53.9s, 54s, yeah. Jaminir 54, Campbell a 55. It's the heat of the day here. Yeah. Track temperature 28 degrees, air temperature 29 Celsius. That's 82 and 84 on track and in the air in Fahrenheit. We'll do our VP racing fuel in-race update as we come towards the end of our number two. And Durrani has lost about two and a half seconds a lap to the BMW ahead of him. Yeah. Uh, got so far, let alone the three leaders, the, the Acura out front, uh, excuse me, the Cadillac out front, and then the two Acuras as well, who are edging away also from Augusto Farfus. Best lap of the race so far there for number six to come. Tom Blomquist in second position. He's chasing after Sebastian Bourdais. The gap has and it's pretty much stabilized now around about six seconds over the last four or five laps between first and second overall. Whoops, there's a Cadillac going straight on at turn 10. That's Pippa Durrani. He's oh. really struggling out there at the 31 car at the moment. That's going to cost him at least... Uh, did it cost him all three positions? It did. Yeah. Wow. Uh, now you've got to wonder about this. Alexander Sims with his race gear on he was fighting slightly offline uh, maybe had uh, dirt on the tires lost the position to team rll through turn 10 just can't get the power down on the ground he's compromised out of the corners for for forward motion he's compromised into the corners for retardation so it is now 
How long do you hang on to this? How Porsche keys to the race was react and be flexible. Let's just see if he comes in this time around before we go to our VP racing fuels update. No, he's staying out. All right, two and a half minutes to go to the first two hours completed. Here's how they stand. It's Sebastian Bourdais by six seconds in the number one Cadillac, the one with the yellow front from Tom Blomqvist in the Acura number 60, the white, blue and pink car. Then Ricky Taylor in the number 10, the black and blue. Connick and the Acura. He's another seven seconds behind. Augusta Farfus and Conor de Filippi in the two BMWs, 24 and 25, showing decent pace at the moment. Jaminet, wow. Campbell and Durrani all struggling for grip in the 6.7 Porsche and the 31 wheel in engineering. Durrani, two minutes, 0.9 last time around after that mistake at turn 10. In LMP2, John Ferrano for Town Motorsports leads Dennis Anderson in high class racing. That's 8 and 20, there's six seconds be between them. Stephen Thomas, well back on that, nearly a minute behind that battle, and he's got the LMP3 cars between them. That's led in 11th position by AWA and Matthew Bell in the 13 car. Jared Andretti for the 36. Andretti Autosport is 2.8 seconds behind. That's Duquesne from Leisure. Another Duquesne in, Duquesne in third is Dan Goldberg, who's a further 10 seconds back. In the GT categories, it is Kenton Cook who's the best of the GTDs and the best of the GT cars for Team Court of Motorsport in the AMG GT3 number 32. Daniel Yucadella leads the pro category in the number 79 WeatherTech Racing. Then it's Brian Sellers in GTD as we've got a couple of cars off. This is down at turn 13. It's, Durrani, isn't it? it's Durrani and he's hit, he's had contact with uh, one of the LMP3 cars just as we're finishing off our update. So that's going to throw everything up in the air. The pits are closed. The blue Cad Cadillac safety car comes out. That's what the wheeling cars wanted to see, but they didn't want to be the cause of it. Now, what's the damage on that as we complete our VP Racing Fuel in race update? A flick turn from people to Rani at the end of the second hour. More drama here at Sebring live on IMSA Radio. Well, as we move into our number three, people to Rani, the Paul Sitter with damage after contact at turn 13. He's really been struggling for grip. And ah, he was very, very unlucky because the P3 in front of him had spun of their own volition and left the wheel and engineering Cadillac with nowhere to go. It was the performance tech car that went around Robert Mao, who's been struggling this week. Now, will people come in for emergency service? He's got a deranged front wing. I think he stays out. I think he can do that when he comes in. Yeah, that car's drivable. Yeah. So it, it's not disastrous because he's still on the lead lap, but there's a lot of bodywork rubbing and that didn't sound good. Oh, and he's had a tyre go. He's had the left front tyre, I think, is gone. Yikes. And that's done more bodywork damage as he went across the star finish line. Now, not sure. Uh, I th wow, there's, there's definitely some debris around that area. No fault to people there. That was Robert Mayer spinning in front of him. No, he's still got air in all the tyres as he comes to the intervention vehicle. He'll be waved past that. So that was carbon fibre that I saw coming off that car. You wouldn't believe it. Absolutely extraordinary. Just as we were doing our VP Racing Fuel in-race update. It all changes again. Pits are still closed. And we've got another penalty for minimum refueling time breach. 
can't be served, of course, during yellows. And this is the number 11 car again. That's their second or third penalty. And we're barely two hours into this race. TDS and Stephen Thomas will have to be told that. There is a statutory refueling rate uh, that is, is based on the time to fill the whole tank. And that if you break out of that bracket, of course, you're going to get a penalty. And Pete Mudarani now passing one of the Allergy Automotive Supplied Rescue Trucks that are supplementing our AMR safety team this weekend. Another opportunity to say thank you to everybody involved in keeping our drivers safe. They sprung into action a couple of times at turn number one over the last few days. Huge pieces of debris coming off that wheel and engineering Cadillac. Now, that's now at least not rubbing on the front wheel for people, Durrani, but that's going to take a little more time on the back straight to clean up. As he is still trying to make it to the back of the safety car train, yeah. Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, that's right, because if he comes in now, he goes, he, he'd be in danger of uh, the pits being closed by the time he completed that, whatever service they're gonna do, and then he would fall a lap down. So he's gonna try and stay on a lead lap if he possibly can. Uh, uh, but uh, that, uh, that call early on to Ch not to change tyres on that first pit stop for number 31 car certainly has caused us some problems now. Whether it'll come back uh, in their favour later on in the race, of course, we will have to wait and see. But right now, there's a fair bit of damage on the front end of that number 31 car. They're going to have to bring that car in for quite a lot of work, and they're going to try to sell on the lead lap if they possibly can. He's got to wait for the pits to warm and now yeah. anywhere. And, and I wonder, is it worth him coming in for emergency service to change the nose now before they do the rest of the service? Because they'd be allowed to do that for broken bodywork. You've got you to work this. We said in our Porsche Keys the race, you've got to have... You've got to be able to be flexible. Ian Watt is on the perch in the pits. Well, the pits are now open, so that uh, means that people can come in the next time around. The front left Michelin has taken a heck of a lot of pounding from the bodywork. Uh, no, pit's still closed. My apologies. Yeah, because the, 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 the fuel hasn't yet packed up behind the safety car. We've got the, uh, the waiver out going now, and that's uh, those cars that are trapped in between the safety car and their respective class leaders. They're able to go past the safety car and run around to take up their rightful position behind their class leader at the back of the train of cars. So we won't get the pits open until that whole procedure has been completed. And that number 31 team there, as you say, uh, the chief engineer there is is uh, Ian Watt, uh, Tim, Timmy Keane uh, works on the strategy there, along with uh, Peter Barron as well, who's uh, sort of taken a roving role with Cadillac these days. And uh, he's there to help out Timmy Keane. Now, that was a very interesting uh, hey, second Durrani. stint of the Durrani's race. Durrani's come into the yeah. pit lane. He may have been called in by race control, but I haven't seen that on the screen at the moment. But I reckon, Shea Adam, that they can change this nose and possibly one tyre, the left front tyre, under emergency service regulations. Correct. And the difference with the emergency services is that if you do fuel and you don't need fuel, then they can see that now. So they are very aware of what's going on. But yes, this was definitely an emergency service situation. The nose coming off of this car, they are putting a new left front because that left front was shredded. There was actually a piece of rubber hanging off of it, a bit like a jump rope that was still trying to attach itself to other bits of bodywork. The other problem, 
though, with that bit of rubber flailing around, it knocked off the left-hand wing mirror. That mm -hmm. has not been replaced during this service because they didn't know that they needed a new one until after they'd put the new nose on the wall. So that is something that they can address when the car comes back in for its normal stop. The jump rope now tangled up with one of the mechanics, actually. Uh, pull the rope out of the way, guys. You want to make sure, yeah, that Pippa doesn't drive over it. There we go. Now the car cleared to leave. Pippa will leave. He will come back in at the first available opportunity, refueling the emergency service requirement. That will involve a driver change to Alex Sims, and they will yeah. put on the three other he new Michelins. And just to let you guys know, because we're keeping track of tires right now, after watching Pippo suffering out there, every other one of the GTP teams with sticker tires up on the wall. I, he's in trouble with that car. The, the, the nose has gone on, but the headlight on the left-hand side and the marker lights aren't illuminated. Now, I, I wonder if they just didn't take the time to fasten that wiring loom on, although the right-hand side one is on. I need to see the car on the circuit and see if that's a pit lane thing. No, it's not on. So the marker light on the left-hand side and the headlights are not on. Now, this is a dark racetrack. You need your headlights here. And the issue would be if there was any further damage, you can run with one at the front and one at the back as long as you've started with them but the issue would be if there's any further damage a ball of rubber or something like that that gets thrown up they'd have to come in again immediately that's aside from the fact that there's no working illumination on the left hand side and the particular things you want to pick out there are the side marker lights that uh, pick up the curbs for your turning and your clipping points now, there's far more right-handers here than there are left, so that perhaps isn't so much of an issue. Uh, we're about to get the pits opened, so we'll keep an eye on that. And uh, as we welcome in to the IMSA Global Broadcast Centre, talking to a world worldwide audience, as well as on Highlands ESPN 106.3, XM Sirius, of course, here in the US. John Doonan, president of IMSA. Hello, John, how are you? Fantastic. <laughs> you see those aerial shots, it's hard to not be. Uh, it's, we're talking to a worldwide audience here with you all telling the stories, but boy, I feel like a worldwide audience has come to watch the 71st running. John Story told us yesterday, the man at the head of Sebring, that all of the infield uh, general admission parking was gone. So they've opened up extra parking on the south and west side of the circuit for people who are still arriving today. Back with John Doonan at the moment. Let's go to Shea Adam for the leaders in GTP. Hello, John, and welcome to the booth. We've got lots of cars into the pit lane. The only one of the GTP cars not looking to do tires is the number 10. Konica Minolta Acura and actually the 60s not doing tires either. So Meyer Shank Racing staying on the same rubber, but everybody else is doing tire changes. Now, remember, they both did tire changes the last time around. They're both working their third set for the race, whereas everyone else now shifting over to their second, and for BMW's case, their third as well. We've got people back in. This is going to be driver change and the rest of the tires to be changed. First car back out will be the number 60. No, beaten out by the 10. And then the 0-1 Cadillac. That is now Scott Dixon behind the wheel of that car. Then the two BMWs getting out the 25, the head of the 24, and one of the Porsches, the one with the black accents on it, that would be the number 7. Still in the lane, we have Pippo Durrani's car that he has now handed over to Alexander Sims. And the number 6 Porsche with a bit of a lengthy stop. They did four tires for that car as well. Plenty of action down in the pit lane now. There are major work going on on Pippa Durrani's uh, 31 car. Alex Lynn has been installed in that car. The six Porsche with the rear deck off there with the white stripes. You can see that they're working on the V8 twin turbo motor. That's not good news at just over two hours into this race. Now it goes back down and is fastened back on. They're putting the left-hand uh, wing mirror, and it is a wing mirror here. It sits right on top of the front fender, and that has to go on. The IMSA official uh, is 
quite insistent. I think they're going to send him so they don't lose the lap. They've taken the old one off their share, and I think they've sent him whilst they removed the remnants of the old one so they can fasten the new one on next time around. Correct, that's what happened. Uh, the old one had mostly broken away and left itself on the front straight, as a matter of fact. So they got all of the remaining shards out of the way, and now they can bring Pippo Durrani back in when the pits are over for everyone. Uh, sorry, Alexander Sims uh, back Sims, in sorry, yes. the next time around. See, we, we both. Half, half rise. We knew where we were going with that. Um, <laughs> uh, but the next time that the pits are open, it's for the GT cars only. We are going to have a lot of takers for that, I see. A one Maro angle up on the wall for the 79 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes new tires there as well. We've got Jordan Taylor ready to go for the number three and a lot of other drivers. Uh, we'll let you watch those stops uh, uh, while we have a quick chat with uh, John Doonan, president of IMSA. Um, the the harbingers of doom on the weather forecast were wrong, <laughs> that John. That'll make you very happy. Yeah, as you said, uh, yesterday we had to stop selling infield parking. Uh, Florida State Patrol and the Highlands County Sheriff indicated we were pushing maximum uh, space here. But uh, also the weather, you know, uh, three days ago, we were looking at 90% chance of, of rain and, and storms and uh, the good Lord blessed us with a beautiful day. It's certainly warm. I think that's probably playing a role into some of the tire wear mm. and I'm sure it's gonna uh, play a role in the crews uh, executing all the stops all, all day. But really proud of the 71st running and those, again those aerial shots this place is jam-packed and i think it's a great sign uh, for the overall sport here of the fans are speaking and uh, they're speaking with their attendance they're certainly speaking with their viewership our last episode of win the weekend just surpassed two million viewers and uh, can't wait to see what the tv numbers look like after tonight You've always, you've never shied away from the tough questions. You say the fans have been speaking, they've been speaking out about the Rolex 24 Daytona and the penalties applied to Michael Shank and MSR for gaming the system, manipulating data that was going back to you and to Michelin, and not only a performance advantage, but a safety issue there. Fines, loss of points, but they were allowed to keep the win, the trophy, and the watches. Was there a, a discussion that went on about that, uh, John? Because that seems to have, have uh, riled up a few people. Well, first of all, when IMSA was founded uh, by the France family and by the Bishop family, it was founded on a set of core values, and that's fair competition. That's a good fight, and uh, that's what everyone comes here to see. Um, obviously, IMSA found out about these infractions after the event was was over um uh, a considerable quite, time quite quite, a, yeah. quite an amount of time and you know we have a very very thorough tech inspection that these cars will go through as they did at the rolex 24 and i think uh, matt kurdock eric haverson and the team spent you know nearly 36 hours examining the cars after the race uh, all cars were found to be in compliance through our process but you know, we, we learned about this at a time uh, long after the official results had been posted. Uh, fans came to see an amazing race like they have here today. Um, and uh, we then immediately went into a, a deep investigation, and not only looking at the cars that were identified uh, to us, uh, but the whole field. And uh, we went through all the data. And I think after long discussions with uh, the teams, the manufacturers, uh, our board of directors, um, our competition folks, we issued a set of penalties which we felt were fair given all the circumstances. You know, there's a, a responsibility on IMSA to have a rule book uh, that can be monitored and regulated. And then there's a responsibility on our manufacturers and our teams to bring cars that are compliant with that rule book such that we can have fair competition. So. You know, I understand uh, different philosophies. There's a lot more to the investigation that we had to take into consideration. But in the end, we issued those penalties. And uh, I can ensure, assure that uh, going forward, we'll continue to make sure that there's fair competition. It's, it's very unfortunate because it takes the shine off what was a fantastic debut for GTP. And nobody um, more disappointed about it than David Salters, who's the man at the head of HPD. Now, it would appear, uh, and you can tell me if this is right or wrong, that it was HPD that brought some of that information to the to the knowledge of IMSA and the technical team. Yeah, I mean, IMSA was notified. Um, you know, David and his folks, uh, John Akeda, the entire 
uh, HPD and, and Acura brand have been longtime stakeholders, and so we we learned uh, about the infractions uh, through through their uh, contacts with us. And uh, again, took it took a deep investigation, did what we felt was best, and uh, here we are now celebrating another uh, record-breaking crowd in front of uh, this audience here uh, on USA Network uh, a little bit later, and certainly on NBC Peacock and all the folks listening to you guys around the world. Yeah, and the international feed getting more and more uh, important with the international uh, uh, the international auto manufacturers who are involved. We'll quickly go down to Shea Adam for a quick update on, on what went on. I know our Highlands ESPN audience are going to leave us uh, for just a couple of minutes in a minute or so, Shea. For the GT cars, we had a lot of stops with a lot of driver changes, but the biggest thing was it looked like tires for everyone. Now, we've got the pits open for everyone, and two relevant cars are back into the pit lane right now. We've got the 25 BMW. This is the one driven by Conor Filippi at the start. He handed over to Nick Gallo on the last pit stop sequence. They are changing the nose on this car, John. The headlight is cracked on the left front. The number seven Porsche has just come back in. Splash of fuel and energy replenishment for that car only. Exact same thing for the number six, the sister car, the one that was in here for a long time. They saw something that they didn't like, so they wanted to look at it closer in the engine bay, decided everything looked better. And now they're sending that car back out as well. But the pit closed light is on at the pit exit, and both of the Porsches are now having to wait patiently. Uh, which of the, of the Porsches didn't do the, the warm-up this morning? That, that was, would be the 7. That was the rebuilt 7 Correct. Car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, we did hear Nick Tandy say that they, when they fired that car up, that that... Uh, uh, that, that they had this when they saw something on that that did help them on the six car. I wonder if that's the same problem. Might be worth a, a, a little note to them. I'll duck my head in and uh, ask them right now. The only thing I've noticed on the number six car is there is now a lot of white tape on the right rear of that car behind where the uh, driver's or passenger side door opens, I suppose it would be, um, uh, covering an air inlet. So I'm wondering if maybe things are a little bit warm in there right now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Adam. There were some very close competition with that in the BMW, which may have precipitated the change of nose. John Toonham, president of IMSA, with us. We're doing the GTP class split at the moment. If you're uh, around at the circuit, listening on 100.9 uh, FM and seeing some cars passing under yellows, fear not, that's putting the fastest cars back behind that brilliant blue Cadillac V-Series IMSA edition, which we're using as our safety car. Underlining, John Doonan, the commitment from the manufacturers to this championship and why DPI and now GTP has become so popular because, as I said earlier on, you look at the front lights of that car and you looked at Bordier's car that was sitting behind it, you can absolutely see that that, 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 uh, that zero one car is a Cadillac. You're right, John. The, the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship is built on uh, manufacturer participation. You know, no other sanctioning body in the world has 18 automakers competing. Uh, we're so proud uh, of the fact that so many of them have decided to use IMSA as a marketing platform, not only for their brand, not only for their nameplates, uh, but for their styling. And you're exactly right, GTP, um, you, you put a, a road going um, Cadillac or Acura or BMW or Porsche and soon to be Lamborghini uh, alongside one of these GTP cars. You can definitely see the brand. And uh, we have a fantastic mix of multi-class racing here with the prototypes and with the GT cars. And in GT alone, uh, you've got 10, 11 manufacturers that have decided to run cars that look like their road going brothers and sisters so um, you're right it's about uh, telling the story of these brands um, this is a marketing tool in their toolbox and uh, we're so proud that so many of them have decided to come here be with us and and do battle in the weather tech championship and uh Alexander Sims back into the pit lane in the wheeling car for some more remedial work I expect to see the left hand uh, wing mirror bolted on this time around. John, it, 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 IMSA, not unique, but certainly different in the fact that two of your biggest races of the year come at the start of the season. It's almost like starting with the World Cup final or the Super Bowl, uh, then going to your semi-finals and, and then going back to league play. Uh, I'm not at all uh, playing down the importance of any of the other races, 
It is a front-loaded schedule, though. Does that give you any particular issues or indeed advantages? Well, I think from a, a fan standpoint, you know, we're so proud each year to kick off the global motorsports calendar with the Rolex 24. Uh, we come here to Sebring in its traditional slot in March. Um, I think hopefully that attracts our current fans, gets them fired up for the motorsports season around the world. And then along the way, my hope is that these premier events, these events with so much history attract a new fan base. And uh, then you carry on to Long Beach. You go out to WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. We head up to Watkins Glen uh, for the Salem Six Hour, which of course is part of the Michelin Endurance Cup. Uh, we go to great places like Road America, like VIR uh, throughout the season. We're gonna uh, go to a new venue in Indianapolis Motor Speedway this year. And of course, end the season at our very own Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta with Motul Petit Le Mans. So you go through the calendar. Yes, of course, there's some big ones to kick off the season, but right in the middle, you get that six hour. And then of course, Petit Le Mans, which never disappoints. I think I was in the booth with you guys last October and you know, I was laughing because uh, the racing was so good there <laughs> in the last 30 minutes. I couldn't, uh, couldn't contain myself. John Turnham with us in the booth. We'll get back to him in a moment. Let's go down to Porsche. Problems for the number six. Uh, Porsche Penske Motorsport Machine, Shea Adam. Matthew Gemini, uh, how difficult is it out there on a GTP car with used Michelin tires? Uh, look, um, yeah, it was tough. Uh, it's warm, uh, cars are sliding around, uh, so obviously, yeah, it was a, a tough double stint. Um, but we are still in the race. Um, from our side, we got a small contact with the P2 out of the pits. But yeah, car seems to be a fine, so uh, yeah, just trying to survive the day and hopefully when it gets a little bit cooler, you know, performance and then the track will come to us and we'll be able to fight up front. Yeah, taking the pain now so that you get the new tires later on when it matters. Um, the engine cover was off when you got out of the car. Was everything okay? Yeah, we had some, um, let's say not, not problem, but I have a feeling with the steering wheel well, it was a bit heavy, uh, the power steering. so. Yeah, we just double check and then put some off it and uh, making making sure that it that it runs uh, because yeah, it felt quite heavy in the, towards the end on the bump. So uh, yeah, just double checking, but it seems to be all right. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, finish off very quickly here before we go green with John Turnham, president of IMSA. Big team effort here at Sebring as ever. John Story, I mentioned his name earlier on, and his team did a cracking job this weekend for us and for the WEC. Um, are we going to get WEC back, or is that their announcement to make, John? I know you were uh, handing out some trophies last night for them. Yeah, for sure, their announcement to make. Uh, Super Sebring has been a terrific event, uh, but it's... Uh, when you look at it, 71st running of the 12 hours of Sebring, this uh, venue and this event um, is a critical part of motorsports history, um, the birthplace of, of endurance sports car racing here in America. We're proud of it. We have had a great week. We kicked off the IMSA Hall of Fame. We showed a commitment to LMP2 for the next couple of seasons. Uh, we'll make some comments and, and announcements about LMP3 going forward, but I hope everybody listening, I hope everybody watching enjoys the rest of this race. Uh, nine and a half hours to go, and uh, I suspect we're in for another incredible and historic finish uh, come tonight at 10 after 10. Great flag just underway. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure having you as always. And let's look forward to the rest of the season and beyond because let me tell you, the, uh, the excitement rolls on with IMSA and uh, hopefully we can be a part of it for many years to come. Thank you, John. Thank you. John Doonan uh, joining us in the booth, the president of IMSA off at turn number 10 uh, for, I think that's one of the... Porsches that went wide there, was it? As they went uh, off on the circuit, the Acura number 60 also struggling a little bit, has got some dirt on the tyres as they have gone through the far side of the circuit. I don't think it was the Porsche, actually. My apologies. I was trying to look at it on a very small screen. Oh, he was. I should have stayed with my original thought. Turn 10. It was the leader of the two Porsches. So that would have been the uh, number six car. Uh, Shit, Adam, a little while ago... We, uh, uh, a little while ago, the 23 Harder racing car went behind the wall and we've been fighting to find out what happened with that. What's the news? Ah, well, what happened was it was in the pit, did the service, but dropped the car before the right front tire was fully on. That
not jam the car into gear, when they put it back up, the wheels started spinning. So they had to serve a drive-through penalty, which meant two trips down the pit lane instead of the one. But it didn't go behind the wall, or it did go behind the wall? Uh, team said it's out there. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Extra pit stop, then, for that car. Down to turn number 17. The battle continues as at the front of the field, Scott Dixon now with a yellow flag somewhere on the circuit. We'll get that through in a moment. The minimal refueling time is going to cost TDS car number 11. Uh, and seem to have called the number quite a lot of times for penalties today. Actually, that one was from before the yellow, wasn't it? And they couldn't get in. And also the leader in a, in the GT uh, LMP3 category, Matt Bell. That number 13 AWA car. That car also with a failure to adhere to minimum fuel reef few telling times. Uh, uh, very odd that we've seen so many of those. And also the Alex, Alex now Alex Sims driven 31 Cadillac improperly served emergency service, so they'll have to come in and stop for 10 seconds. Mm, okay. Sure. That's all we have on that. Well, that would have been that first stop when they came in, changed the front tyre, which was flailing around, and the bodywork, which was falling off. Uh, so might need a little bit more on that as well. At RSL underscore studio, welcome back. If you've uh, just rejoined us on Highlands ESPN 106.3 FM, Sirius XM for the whole race, flag to flag and of course RS2 part of the Radio Show Limited network we've got live world feed video for you as well if you're outside the US on imsaradio.com drop down menu, menu is the first item from the top left Jeremy Shaw so Scott Dixon taking advantage of that fresh start to get past Ricky Taylor, who did not change tyres at that restart. So number zero, one car now into the lead. That's our fifth lead change. 63 laps completed now by the race leaders. And that car off the road at, at turn 10 was number 60 car. Uh, so uh, Elio Castroneves fell to the back of the pack in the GTPs as Alexander Sims serves that stop and hold for 10 seconds penalty for that improperly served emergency service obligation. It's in the penalty box now and away it goes. It's not been their day so far. No, but with but. nine and a half hours still to go, I am absolutely not putting the Black Mark, the pain of doom through that 31 car on Andy Blackmore's in the Spotters Glide. They are more than capable of coming back. Uh, even with that stop in 10 seconds, I think they're still on the lead oh, yeah. lap, Jeremy. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, <laughs> the car has pace. Now, let's see what Alex can do, Xander Sims can do with that car. And he's got that new mirror. Tires. Yeah, he's got that new mirror as well on yep. left-hand side. Yeah. So uh, the car lo looks in good shape right now. Whether there's any damage to that left front suspension, uh, we won't really know for quite a while. We'll find out maybe on his lap times. But yeah, he's back in the fray. He's back on the lap. He's served his penalty. He's got that hardship of not using that fresh set tyres out of the way, or Pipo did at least. And now we'll see. But uh, fairly interesting to see how much of a difference fresh tyres makes here. And Scott Dixon is romping away at the front now three seconds he has over Ricky Taylor Philip Eng having a great run for that number 24 BMW in third position and right on the tail of Ricky Taylor yeah that is the battle for third position the BMW is rather coming to life now Jeremy in this restart after that safety car intervention Six tenths of a second between Scott Dixon and Elio Castro Neves. This is a sports car race, but those two big names from Open Wheel Racing at the front of the field. Meantime, this battle's a little bit further back down the field, but not much. Three seconds now between first and second. Scott Dixon and 
It's Ricky Taylor, isn't it, in second place now, excuse me. Uh, what's happened to the number 60 car? That's dropped back a bit. In the hands that, that, of, I just uh, said that's the, that is the car that went off at turn uh, 10. Right, he okay. fell to, right to the back there of that group. That was that was Elio Castroneves on those old tyres. OK. So he's uh, fallen, he's about three seconds behind the second of the BMWs. Elio Castroneves now running in seventh position as uh, Philip Eng really putting the pressure on here for Ricky Taylor. This is, I mean, the, the, they're doing high 50s at the moment, so, you know, not quite as quick as they were going earlier on, but we thought, you know, 1 minute 50 was going to be around about the race pace here, and that's what these cars are doing right now. 50.0 for Scott Dixon in the lead, 50.9 for both Ricky Taylor and Philip Eng. Uh, in second and third. At IMSA Radio, thank you, Alan Prosser. You're upset. exactly right. Hello to Adam Wareham. Tweets at IMSA Radio. Are the six and seven Porsches completely different machines to the cars that raced yesterday in the WEC? Short answer, yes. And you couldn't have raced them from yesterday to today. Detailed differences, uh, particularly in the scrutineering wiring for the different series and also slightly different aero packages. WEC cars a tiny bit more draggy due to the differences in the baseline measurements gained from the FIA WEC wind tunnel, which is the Audi Sauber tunnel in Hinville in Switzerland and North Carolina's IMSA tunnel that they use, which is the wind shear facility. Not impossible to change them around, but as was explained to me over the prologue weekend by a couple of the manufacturer representatives, not the work of a moment, with a smile on the face as they said that. Thank you, Adam, for that. At IMSA Radio. So across the line for the battle at the front of the field. Scott Dixon, Ricky Taylor, Philip Eng, Philippe Manazza for Porsche, 963. Then Nick Tandy has been released into the action. Second fastest lap in a row for Josh Pearson in the TDS number 35. It's a couple of laps down on the rest of the uh, LMP2 field. Just one, just just one. one lap down, yes. yeah. Um, after its trials and tribulations. And as I said, two laps in a row. His first one was a 152.2, which was the fastest lap in that class. And next time by a 151.8. So another four tenths there by young Josh Pearson. Still haven't had that number 11 minimal, minimal, minimum full refueling time penalty served. By the team. Uh, yeah, no, he did. He came in as we were about to green, in fact. All right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just has it cleared from the screen. Oh, That's fine. Think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he came in as we were about to green. That's say, why he's at the a... back of that pack, because he was leading at the restart. Yeah, couldn't couldn't serve that during the safety car, of right. course. Let's pick up some of the other class leaders. Antonio Garcia did a great job, and the Pratt & Miller Corvette Racing Team, as ever, working the strategy perfectly. An inopportune time yellow flag, I mean, they had to have emergency service and make an extra trip down the pit lane, but now in the hands of Jordan Taylor, the Corvette number three is back at the head of GTD. That's a GTD Pro car with the red number panel. Smaro Engel, about a second and a half behind for WeatherTech racing the white, red and blue swoosh on the side of the AMG, the number 79. Kenton Cook for Team Court of still leading GTD ahead of Corey Lewis now, who's taken over Paul Miller Racing's BMW. They're the top two in GTD. Another quickest lap from Josh Pearson now has come down from a 52-2 to a 51-5. And by the way, Kenton Cook's just set a new personal best as well in that GTD leading car. That court of AMG. 
Yeah, and the fastest lap of the class in LMP2 so far was said earlier on by Ben Keating at a 54.3. That was on lap 46, so just after. No, if you can scratch that. Yeah, and Pearson now down to a 51.2 last time yeah, around. That. Sorry about in that. P2. No, no, this it's fine. Behind, this is behind. And the. Uh, so, yeah, that is. Oh, a new we've had Gar Robinson's car off. And this again is side by side action on the far side of the circuit. Ooh. And it's the Andretti racing car that's that, involved there. That's as the well. battle for the lead and in LP3. Exactly right. Yep. And the 74 car comes off worse. Gar Robinson dropping down to fifth position and has come straight into the pits to take some service. There's some brand new Michelin tyres about to go on there. It was Jarrett Andretti and Gar Robinson behind the wheel of those two cars. The 36 now leads. Five seconds behind is the 85 of JDC Miller Motorsports. Didn't see Gar get out of that car, but that will be being looked at. I'm absolutely certain IMSA stipulates that you have to give racing room for competitors and not usher them off the track. Another fastest lap in LMP2 for TDS's Josh Pearson. Now a 1.51.3. He's taking the better part of a second out of his personal best in four laps. And indeed, the Andretti Racing and Riley 74 cars incident has gone to the stewards. That is under review in race control at the moment. Little or no damage on Jarrett Andretti's left-hand side pod. So he's got away with it, but Gar Robinson having to come into the pits. And Gar has rejoined, stayed in the car, but dropped out of seventh position, Jeremy. Yes, indeed. And uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's kept it going again. But uh, too, somebody who has experience of Andretti Autosport has joined us here in the booth as Oliver Askew, who's... Uh, not driving this weekend, unfortunately, Oliver, but you've got lo lots of experience about LMP3 cars around here, and uh, th they're a lot of fun to drive. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, some big shoes to fill after uh, John Doonan being in the booth just a couple <laughs> minutes ago, but uh, good to be here, good to be in Sebring, just a, an hour and a half from where I live in Jupiter, Florida, and, uh, and yeah, I, I got the chance to race here in 2021 in LMP3 with 47 Motorsports and the Dakin. And uh, yeah, it's it's a difficult, definitely a difficult track to to race at with the with the bumps and undulations through turn 17 and turn one. But um, yeah, it's it's enjoyable. So through that sort of uh, 14, 15, 16 area, you can go side by side, but you need cooperation from both parties. Definitely, yeah, you, you need. Um, you need both both classes to to play nice, and uh, it's it's a very difficult portion of the track to to overtake. And a lot of times, it's better to have some patience and wait until the back straightaway um, to overtake, and in order not to lose uh, as much time. That's that's the dance in sports car racing when when you have multi-class racing, um, trying to get around other cars and in, in places on the track where you won't lose time. It's one of the few places where there's a bit of runoff on drivers left there. There's quite a lot of runoff, actually. Does that sometimes make drivers a little bit too brave and go for go for manoeuvres that perhaps they wouldn't if there was a concrete block there? Yeah, you, you, you can. You can, although when you do go offline uh, with these Michelin tires, there's a lot of clag and, and marbles on the, on the outside line. And yes, um, you know, there is a lot of space to, to use if you need it, but you'll be working to get those marbles off your tires for multiple laps. It's been called as a racing incident. There'll be no action for Jared Andretti and Gar Robertson after that impact between the 36 and 74 as they were battling for the class lead. Robertson's rejoined uh, some, well, well over a minute down. And Jared Andretti now uh, has Till Bechtelsheimer trying to Close down him in the JDC Miller Motorsports number 85, the bright yellow. That's a Ligier out there. And that last time around uh, for the race leader, Scott Dixon, John Hindoff was a 157.1. It was a full uh, eight seconds slower. Uh, well, seven and a half seconds slower than his previous lap. That's how much uh, traffic is uh, yeah, causing you a problem here, Oliver Askew. Sure. And 
the more laps that these cars get around this track during the race, the, the more that second groove around these corners on the outside is, is going to come in, and it'll be a little bit easier for for drivers um, and, and the faster cars to overtake you know, around the outside of some of these corners. Is there any way to, to sort of sense that without actually driving out there? Because the problem is, if you get all that pickup, you're going to be in big trouble. Yeah, it just, just takes um, some experimenting out Ed, there. Edge out yeah. a little bit, put two wheels out there rather than four. It's a bit similar to racing on an oval. You know, you don't yeah. want to commit four wheels to the outside line too soon um, in, in a racing situation. Maybe watch it, watch another couple of cars try it first uh, before you really commit to that outside lane. Ricky Taylor trying to close in on Scott Dixon. It's the yellow fronted Cadillac with the dark gray hind quarters, the rear deck. That faded color scheme is uh, across all the Cadillacs. There's a red and red fronted one in this race, a blue one that we had yesterday in the FIA World Endurance Championship. Philip Engs only 1.3 seconds further back in the number 24 BMW. And he's only uh, half a second ahead of Philippe Nasa in the number seven Porsche, the rebuilt car after the qualifying accident at turn one, they clipped the inside wall. So this still plenty of action here with just on nine and a quarter hours still to go. And the story of the day is all about tires at the front of the field so far. We highlighted it in our Porsche keys the race and Michelin counts down to green. The drivers trying to double stint tires have found a severe performance issue towards the middle and the end of the second tank of fuel. And there's not much you can do about that, Oliver, ask you. You, you know, you've, you're racing, you know you're going to double stint, so you look after the tyres as best as you can in the, the first stint, but these excessive bumps and the relatively high temperatures that we've had in the last few days around here. And this is a, a very abrasive circuit as well, it should be said, old school. Um, what can you do as a driver to mitigate that? Is there anything you can do with your control inputs, etc., that you can make those tyres just breathe a little easier? Yeah, there, there's three things in, in my mind that play a key role in, in tyre management. Uh, one is how hard you push on the outlaps when they're new. Um, and how, how hard you're, you're taking life out of the tire over the first quarter of that stint. Um, that's, that's going to multiply into the end of the stint and even the next, um, the next session if you're, if you're double stinting tires. Um, the next would be, yes, your controls, your, your braking balance, um, your traction control leaving the corner, uh, how much heat um, you're putting and energy you're putting into these tires, both decelerating and accelerating out of the corner. And um, running in dirty air as well plays a massive role. Right. Uh, you'll, you'll see drivers um, in classes and racing series all over the world, you know, running, running behind another car in dirty air, um, trying to get by, and then all of a sudden they drop, they drop back massively, um, just because you don't have as much pressure on those tires in the dirty air, not as much downforce, and you're just creating uh, a little bit more heat and energy in those tires and some unnecessary heat. It's a misconception from people that, that if you've got a, um, a track that doesn't have a lot of grip, people think, oh, well, that's not going to wear the tyres as much. If it's a very grippy track, it's going to wear the tyres. It's quite the reverse, isn't it? Because it's the sliding around that kills the tyres. Yes, and as we see a, is it a Lamborghini? It is the Lamborghini, number 63. He's just been off the track, dragging a bit more of that dirt onto the circuit. That's not going to help the tyre wear either. No, it's, you'll uh, be sliding for the next couple of corners at least. <laughs> Roman Crochon uh, in the uh, number 63 Lamborghini. Yeah, just going back to that grip coefficient. Y you want a grippy track because it helps, it helps the tyres stick rather than slide. Yeah, and here today in Sebring, you have the worst situation. You have a very abrasive circuit. You know, it hasn't been repaved in a long time. Um, some of some of the corners here are almost like shell, you know, very rough um, surface. Then you also have a very hot track temperature. So it's it's not uh, not aiding any of these drivers, but it's causing for a, a very good show, and uh, it's nice for us to watch. <laughs> what we're going to see you driving in next, Oliver? I don't know. We'll see. Um, uh, it's important for me to 
to be here and, and show face. And uh, you've been knocking on some yeah, all the doors while you've been here. As we know, it's it's very easy to be forgotten in motorsport if you're not around. And um, yeah, I've been coming to this race for a long time as a as a fan. Uh, I used to camp camp over the infield, um, not too close to turn 10, but around that area. <laughs> and um, yeah, I love endurance racing and uh, enjoyed myself in this championship racing in LMP3 back in 2021. And you've been doing some commentary lately as well. Yes, I am doing some commentary. It's a good practice, by the way. Yeah. I'm doing some commentary in Formula E, so I'll be off oh, to, yes, yes. to Sao Paulo yeah. uh, next week for that one. Yeah. How have you been enjoying that? I like it. Yeah. It's not just talking, is it? Everybody thinks it's just talking. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my, my position there is just a driver analyst, so with my experience from last year in Formula E, um, I can hopefully bring a different perspective uh, to the commentary booth. Um, working as we do um, on the World TV feed as well as uh, our syndicated radio around the world as well, uh, means we've got a lot of people listening into you here. And and I've just like Anthony Florio says he's tweeted at Limsa Radio with Wayne Taylor Racing adding Andretti Autosport to the ownership. Does that enter you into the conversation for a drive in what Wayne Taylor tells us will be a potential for a second GTP Acura next next year? Is that a door you've been knocking on? I hope so. Uh, I would love to come back here in, in the top class. Uh, you'll have to keep mentioning Michael Andretti on Twitter maybe slide in his inbox for me and uh, and keep bugging him about putting me in that car. <laughs> I'm, I'm told that Formula E drivers have a, um, a, an experienced Formula E driver has a, an advantage in dealing with hybrid cars because they understand the systems because they've been used to energy saving and energy deployment. It would definitely help. I would say it would be an advantage. We see Tom Blomquist um, doing really well here in, in the GTP category. He has some Formula E experience and some success. Uh, I, th I think he spent two or three years in Formula E, and uh, it's, it's not going to hurt, no. We'll be listening to you when we get to, to uh, Sao Paulo, Oliver. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks Jeremy. for having me. Yeah, we've got a new change, a change of lead in LMP2. Nolan Siegel has been flying through the field. That uh, a, the crowd strike by APR got its lap back during that previous caution period. Uh, Nolan, youngster from California, started last in that group. He's moved his way from, uh, from fifth place to the lead a couple of laps ago, uh, and he's uh, relegated Dennis Anderson's high-class racing, number 20 car to second place so it's number zero four that leads in lmp2 uh, jared andretti continues to lead in the andretti autosport car number 36 in lmp3 he's about 13 seconds ahead of till Bechtelsheimer for jdc miller motorsports and a similar back gap to the number 30 junior three racing car number 30 ari baylog uh, the starting driver back at the wheel of that car vp Racing Fuel in race update from Jeremy Shaw with John Heinoff in the booth. Nice to have Oliver Askew uh, with us. Be great to have him back in a sports car and in this series. Yeah, uh, talent. Should yeah, be, yeah big should be driving talent. something. Big talent. Now, coming out of tower turn, BMW still right with Ricky Taylor. Yeah. That is Philip Eng. And the BMW. Remember, did take new Michelin tyres last time around. And how about Philippe Nasa joining in as well? Oh, and hang on, I'll just bring Nick Tandy and Nick Yellowly with me as well, if you don't mind. Yeah. So now we've got second down to sixth in a line. Here comes the Porsches, they're moving out. That accurate, super slippery and super quick down the Ullman straight, the back straight. The BMW feeling the need to defend there in the hands of Philippe Nasa as uh, Nick Tandy tries to go around the outside of his teammate and Nasa trying to go around the ins the outside of Eng and they're still tied together on a very short bungee cord at the moment. And it's Nick Yellowly who just misses out at turn one as one of the TDS cars was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But this fantastic five car battle from second down to sixth. And again, this is all down to the fact that Ricky Taylor did not take tires at the last stop, and those behind did. That's right. On that, on that, lap, on this most recent lap, Ricky Taylor lost two seconds almost to Scott Dixon. The previous lap, he lost uh, a second and a half. 
So uh, he slipped, you know, he's again losing ground now, but pain now, gain later uh, is, uh, is the hope for that number 10 team because, whoops, there's a spin for the high class racing uh, LMP2 cart running in second position ahead of Ben Keating. He was a couple of seconds ahead of Ben, so let's see what happened there, but the car's gone around at uh, Dennis 14, Anderson and comes back across the track on the far side of the circuit to rejoin at turn at 15, 14 call it. And plenty of runoff there as we were discussing. He was in traffic and yeah. he was with, he was right with Ben Keating. So Keating's gone through. Okay. Um, or at least the Keating cars, it's still Ben at the wheel. Yes, it is. Yes. So they were having a side-by-side -side battle when that happened. Can't tell you, I'm afraid, whether there was contact there or not, but great work by our replay crew up in Charlotte to find the requisite piece of footage for us to put those two cars at the same place on the track. No, he lost it on his own, and Keating had to move to the right. Oh, brilliant work. Thank you very much indeed for that. We rely so heavily on uh, the brilliant techni technicians and artists of our replay team, affectionately known for many, many years since before the advent of digital as tape apes. And they do a great job. Thank you very much indeed. Joe Bradley in the pit lane with the TDS cars. Josh Peterson with a string of improvements at fastest lap into the pit lane. Yeah, he hasn't worn his tyres out, though. He's been in for a splash of fuel. I say a splash, full tank of fuel for the number 35. Uh, we've now got the other TDS car in, in as come the number 11. Completely different here. We're taking on tyres in that number 11. We're, we're, we're going to keep the driver plugged in. But interesting, Josh Peterson, fastest LMP2 car out there. That youngster really has come to the fore. And I think we've... Uh, discovered a couple of young uh, bright talents, haven't we? Nolan Siegel catching our eye as well. These two are rapid and a couple of weeks ago, St. Pete's, we saw these two youngsters, I say youngsters, relatively speaking, uh, competing in the Firestone Next Championship and they were running at the front, pair, the pair of them. So two superstars in the process of developing here. Yeah, it's interesting to me about that, uh, Jeremy. That's a good point that Joe makes there is that those drivers are doing parallel programs in single-seaters and in yeah. uh, sports car, prototype sports car racing, not feeling as though they have to make a choice right now and taking the opportunity to get as much seat time in different machinery as possible. Yeah, and Nolan's uh, only, only 18 years of age, and to tell you what, he started racing when he was 14 in the uh, Cooper Tire Joseph 2000 Championship. Quite, and since I mean, then, that, that's quite, he did, did not have a karting career before that. Yeah, yeah, he did some karting before right. that, but uh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's got lots of, he's grown up so much, I mean, he's a really fine young man, seriously impressive, uh, and, uh, you know, he's got, he's got some good uh, support behind him, uh, but he's, he's really showing Tremendous improvement uh, and, uh, you know, on a regular basis, both in, in cars, in, in open wheel cars, and in sports cars as well. Really good speed. It's Jeremy Shaw in the booth with me, John Hindhoff. We're at Super Sebring on our Super Saturday, and we're all having a super time. <laughs> Particularly Scott Dixon, who's leading by 13 seconds now. Ricky Taylor fighting somewhat of a rear guard action to keep the tyres underneath the Acura Air XO6, number 10. With behind him the combined driving talents of Philip Eng, Philippe Nasser, Nick Tandy and Nick Yellowley. And that's quite a lot of talent behind him. And they're all on new Michelin rubber at the last stop. Now, the performance will balance out a little bit. It won't be quite as much of a performance advantage as we get further through this stint. Uh, Ricky Taylor doing a very good job, I'd say, at the moment in terms of managing his pace through this difficult second stint. Everybody's going to have to double stint a couple of sets of tyres. So... Everyone's going to have to take a little bit of pain. In GTD, Paul Miller Racing, Corey Lewis, just ahead of 
Russell Ward in the blue Mercedes AMG as they battle for second and third. Here comes that battle for second on down in GTD through turn, excuse me, GTP through turn one. As he, he being Ricky Taylor, has to go by the Iron Dames. The 23 car, ah, I sent Sheer Adam on a fool's errand. It was the 023 car, the Ferrari that had gone behind the wall. Joe Bradley. Triassi car. I wonder if you could pop down there and find out why the 023 went behind the wall. I got the wrong end of a message there. It has just come out. Uh, what we want to know is why it went behind the wall. Yeah, locally based team, uh, Triassi competition uh, up in uh, Orlando. And uh, they, they would vote that they also have various Ferrari dealerships, one of which was uh, voted the best Ferrari dealership in the world by Ferrari. In the world? In the world. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I believe so. Uh, so uh, that's a feather in the cap, but they, 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 they run a really nice racing team as well. Um, quick note here about the number 31 car. It's still a long, long way behind everybody else, a better part of a minute behind Elio Castro and Neves. But Alexander Sims set that car's best lap of the race about five laps ago. So after that incident earlier on, there doesn't seem to be any lasting damage. It would appear at this stage. So good pace from that number 31 car, but not really apparent at the moment because he's so far behind everybody else. But here's the two uh, Porsche's going side by side into uh, turn 17. How's that going to work? I think it was a, is there a change of position there? I think there is. It was uh, Nasser ahead, ahead of Sandy. Yeah. So if the, the I think just white changed. stripes have gone they through, have. Uh, Nick Tandy in the traffic makes the move. Now goes through turn one with Nasser behind him. Then Nick Yellily in the second of the BMWs. This is still a great dogfight out there. Carving their way through traffic. Now, yeah. is this an opportunity for Philip Eng to do what he hasn't been able to do recently? That accuracy, so quick, accelerating, but was slightly held up by the LMP3 car down to turn number seven and that right handed hairpin. More GT traffic ahead with Roman Grosjean uh, just ahead of them now. Flashing of the headlights from. <laughs> The number seven Porsche and Philippe Nasser. As through goes Ricky Taylor being compromised on the exit. Nick Tandy takes a completely different line from the two GTPs ahead of him. May just get a little bit of a run down into turn 13. Here comes Eng. No, blocked off by Ricky Taylor. Yeah. Taylor's putting his car exactly where Eng doesn't want it to be. And here comes Nick Tandy side by side with Eng fast part of the circuit drops back in behind as he goes through turn number 14. Now the gradient car in front of them as well as the tower number eight has had a spin for John Ferrano. That's fourth in LMP2. That was out at turn 12. He's got it pointing in the right direction. And still the battle rages on for second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth with Ricky Taylor, Philip N. Nick Tandy, Philippe Nasser, and Nick Yellily. They'll come past us in a moment. Really good driving by all of these pilots. Big squeeze down the inside from Nasser there. Got some damaged bodywork, being absolutely Sheesh. fragmented on the back straight. And that was. Uh, just a few moments ago, and there's carbon shards everywhere. That might bring out a full course yellow. Yeah, number six car just and ducking it, into the pits. Yeah, in I, anticipation. I, left rear puncture. Left rear puncture ah. on that number six car. Now, that's Nick Tandy. He was battling. He got alongside, I thought for a moment, he got alongside Philip Eng as he was going into turn 14. So was there a little coming together, but a big piece of carbon fibre has been shredded and disintegrated. Now, this will be a new set of tyres. Left-hand sides only, I think, going on here. So was, was that Tandy that ran over? That? It was one of the Ferraris. I think it was the Ricci Competizione Ferrari. Cracky. And that's left all kinds of shards. 
Chetila Ferrari went through straight afterwards. So... That's pretty scary. That's a lot of carbon fibre. Yeah, and you do not want to have... It was coming out of 16, my apologies. I thought it was uh, a little bit further down the straight. It's taken it off the racing line-ish, but there's still a lot of carbon fibre lying around down there. And Tandy then drops out of that fight and back down to seventh position behind Elio Castro Neves. That's rather spoiled our enjoyment of that little battle there. And through goes the Porsche and the BMW on, on Ricky Taylor. So new second place car is Philip Eng and Felipe Nazar follows him through, as does Nick Yellowly, and from second to fifth in the space of a couple of corners for Ricky Taylor, again, fighting on the back foot with the tyre wear in the second part of the stint. Corvette in and out, new set of Michelin tyres for the number three car. Tristan, uh, excuse me, uh, Jordan Taylor was in that car when it came in and he has stayed in the car. Uh, and each of the last two laps, uh, John, uh, Philip Eng, who's, uh, well, now up into second position, what happened to Ricky Taylor? Ricky Taylor dropped, as I said, they dropped those th uh, positions. But, well, Eng, Nasa and Yellowly went by him last time around in the down at uh, 16 and then 17 he dropped those oh. positions was that what all, while they were going through all that debris no okay, no sorry. that was uh, that was later on that was the next lap around i think um okay. finally had to give up the position uh, eng had already gone through earlier in the lap and then coming down to 17 philippe manassi got down the inside and nick yellowly followed him through in the bmw that's Ricky Taylor, by the way. Jordan, his brother, is in the number three. Alexander Simmons is, uh, by quite some margin, the fastest car on the track at the moment. All of a sudden, the gap from himself to Elio Castroneves is down to 41 seconds. It was a, it was almost a minute, only about five, five laps ago. Now, in comes the WeatherTech number 79. Joe Bradley is our man in the pits at the moment. This looks like full service, Joe. Yeah, you can probably see better than I can, John. I'm down the other end, uh, singing out that Triassi story. There is a, the, the team principal's going to talk to us. She's a little busy at the moment, but uh, give us a couple of minutes. I will have the story on that one. That's the 023, remember? Thank you. Yes, thank you. The uh, local team from just up the 27 in Orlando. Corvette coming around the final corner now. And the weather tech is down and away. Maro Engel behind the wheel. Full service for that car. And there goes the Corvette. So has Ricky Taylor, as we described, getting his full service, has gone through. Kenton Cook. Still to pit in the team caught off Motorsport AMG. He's the best of GTD cars at the moment. Also, that sparked off a whole load of GTD machinery coming in, including the right Motorsport car. Zach Robichon just coming out of the pit lane. Yes, that puts Kenton Cook now yep. back into lead for Team Courthoff Motorsports. Also, a pit stop, though. Yes, yes. The Corvette was in the last time around. Mario Engel just made his stop in that number 79 WeatherTech car. It's got the side of the back of the course after losing its qualifying time because of a ride height infringement. As did number 57 car that's currently running third in GTD behind Corey Lewis, who's driving the Paul Miller Racing number one BMW. Yeah, it's been a nice little run for that car. Keeping out of trouble. Now, where did that debris 
come from in the first place? Oh, right. So was that was from the gradient car, was it? As they were being passed. Yes, it oh. was. It was a clip on the right front of the gradient car by the, Porsche, wasn't it? the lead Porsche at the time, which was Tandy. Um, and that was how he got the left rear puncture and had to pit. Now, that right front has already been repaired once for Gradient. When uh, that car clipped, it was George Kurtz, wasn't it, who got sideways in the darkness practice. That's just taken out the right front of that car. Again, brilliant bit of detective work by our replay team. Up at Charlotte. Also, thank you to all of our camera operators here. Long days this week, Wednesday, Thursday in particular. And again, today will be another long one. And the extremes of temperature and wind that we've had this week. Wind's not too bad today, blowing behind the cars as they go into turn one, just on the tail of the cars. So on the nose of the cars coming into 17. It does appear that the JG went with number 66 with Mark Miller at the wheel, the gradient racing car. This is a full season accurate NSX entry for GTD. That hasn't really slowed Mark down a lot, but it's going to have some aerodynamic differences as into the pits comes Ricky Taylor. Now, is this on time, Jeremy, or is it a bit early? Has he finally decided it's... Uh, the right time to come in. It's a bit early, but he was yeah. losing a lot of ground. Yeah. There's a balance to be struck here between losing ground and possibly ending up off the circuit. He's getting out of the car. For the first time. And Philippe Albuquerque gets... Uh, sorry, it's uh, Louis Delatras that's getting into that car. Saw the green on the helmet, thought it was Philippe. It's uh, the Swiss flag driver... Louis Delatraz, hop, hop. Having a look to make sure there's nothing in. Also in down the pit lane is the leader in LMP2, Ben Keating. So Scott Dixon, he's lapping, he's lapping the f 1 minute 51s. Uh, on a regular basis. Uh, before the, uh, the most recent caution periods, the, the leading cars were doing high 49s or low 50s. So pretty conservative pace. But here comes Scott Dixon now in for service uh, as he completes his 85th lap and he'll give up the lead to Philippe Eng, although he's a long way behind. He's 26 seconds behind, so he might go past the start finish line. So he might, might not be credited with the lead this time. Uh, not. Waiting for him to come round. He won't be, but uh, next time around, if he says that, he will be, which will be very cool for BMW. It looks like a fuel and tyre stop. Yes, it is. Fuel going in. New drinks bottle going in for Scott Dixon. And Scott's going to get another precious set of brand new, shiny Michelin slick tyres. 11 sets for qualifying and the race. So this is Scott's second stint of fuel and he's been given new tyres both times. Tyres were done before the fuel, that's exactly how it should be. A little bit of wheel spin just to take the shine off the rears. Head out between the RFID readers that tell IMSA and Michelin which set of tyres he's got on and how many laps they've done. And he rejoins. And as he rejoins, he is... Who was that that was going round the outside? Number 31 car, I think. I think it was, yes. That's why I was mm. I was looking. So that will... That would have been Alexander Sims down in sixth position. And a spin for John Ferrano at turn 10 in the tower number eight. Should have been 13, really, shouldn't it? That's tower a tower turn, it would have been. Again, that braking area proving very, very difficult. These cars 
right on the ragged edge of adhesion. So Scott Dixon back out with a new set of tyres in the zero one. Uh, let's go down to Joe Bradley. Ben Keating has jumped out of the wins number 52, uh, led the race and was I leading the anything. race as he came in. <laughs> Uh, inc incredible. Ben, have, have I got this right? You started the race. That's correct. And now you've just got out of the car. Did you not want to give it up? I, I really didn't, Theo. Uh, with all the safety cars that we had that came at the right time, I, I felt really good in the car. I, uh, I did a much better job this year preparing for this race than I did last year. I feel really, really good. Uh, you know, the, the car was handling well. I was having a really good time. We were double stinting the tires, and the tires felt just as good at the end of the double as they did at the uh, beginning. So I, I really had a good time out there, and uh, I kept on encouraging those guys to leave me in, let me finish my time. So you've done, you did the, exactly the same yesterday in the uh, World Endurance Championship. You got all of your driving stints out of the way. Is that the same tactic today? You're now done for the day. Uh, I haven't checked officially, but I think so. Wow, that's a great idea. I mean, just to give the listeners an idea, I'm sweating more than Ben Keating is. Uh, incredible Ironman stint once again, Ben. High pressure, though. You were, you know, in and out the top three, leading a lot of that, a lot of the uh, early part of this. Yeah, it was a lot of work for sure. A lot of work. You know, my heartbeat is usually about 15 beats per minute higher in the P2 than it is in the GT. It is. Uh, <laughs> I described driving an LMP2 around Sebring as being violent. You, know, you did. You said that yesterday. Uh, yes. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it's very violent. Ben's just showing me. Is this your personal, hu the human side to data logging? Uh, I don't have enough. Uh, uh, I, I don't have enough uh, 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 data to see what it is right now. But uh, yeah. uh, I know I had a pretty high heart rate out there. And uh, it's going to be nice to relax for the rest of the day. You enjoyed I like the tactic, Ben. Gonna, I like it. I'm going to enjoy watching this race. Yeah, off, off to hospitality. He's made a habit of that, hasn't he? Yeah, very good. Uh, did the same yesterday. Pit stops from the front of the field for Philip Eng, who was scored as a lap leader. Philippe Nazar has come in as well. Nick Yellily was in the previous lap and has rejoined. Elio Castro Neves for the number 60 Acura ARX06 uh, coming around and going into turn one now. So he actually is leading the race. Yes. Um, but again, he must do us a pit stop. Just come in now as Philip Eng, along with Philippe Nazar, the top two cars both into the pits uh, to complete lap 87. That's our fifth different leader in this race. <sighs> Whoops. Another prototype pulling across the front. Yeah, of the uh, leader in LMP3. Which, w yeah, that was uh, the LMP3 prototype pulling across the front of the AO car. Yeah. Mm, and behind there was a little tap as well for the Chetilar Ferrari as they checked up. Um, just going back to the damage on the gradient number 66, that was definitely Nick Tandy's car and pulled into it. And it's not, I haven't seen that being looked at um, the AO Porsche has got damage to the right rear just underlining we heard it from the GT drivers at Daytona and earlier this week here the new GTP cars are not as nimble as the out the outgoing DPIs were at the back end of last year they react very diff differently under braking and acceleration and Nick Tandy made a slight error, but did pull across the front of the gradient car with Mark Miller in it and caused himself a left rear puncture. That tells you where it was. It was the left rear tire scraping across the right front of the car. It's a minor misjudgment, but that's caused damage on both cars. And by the way, the number 79 WeatherTech machine, which uh, at the moment has got Maro Engel at the wheel, just avoided that schmozzle down at turn seven. Uh, the parting of the wheels for was him. It, wasn't it the number 36 car that was. Yeah, it was, okay. Huh. Uh, let's go down to Joe Bradley. The 0-23 went behind the wall and stayed behind the wall for quite some time. Joe Bradley's been on this one trying to find out why 
uh, for a little while as well. What have you got, Joe? Well, I thought I'd go straight to the top. Samantha Spies, team manager down here at Triassi. Uh, the Ferrari, Samantha, it uh, lost a chunk of time going behind the wall. I saw a bit of a repair going on in one of the early pit stops as well. What, what's the update on it? So it was just a mechanical issue that was too big of a fix to do out here on the pit wall, so we took it back. Right, what, what, what do you mean mechanical issue? What exactly? The, so the pulley on the alternator drive. Ah, right. So, so that, that, that started at that first pit stop. I saw that's where the guys were. We replaced the belt at that point, but then that wasn't enough of the fix, so we had to take it back. Right, the, and the guys are telling you they're happy with it now? They, the guys are telling you they're pretty happy with the repair? Yes, yes, all good. Right, good stuff. Thank you. Ah, there you go. Thank you, Joe. Good hustle. Thank you, Samantha, for talking to us down there in the Triarci pit. So that incident involving the LMP3 leader and the AO Porsche is under review. See, I may be wrong, so I'm going to quickly, while Jeremy's keeping an eye on what's going on, I'm going to just quickly scroll back and see if there was any investigation of the bounce between the Gradient car and the number six Tandy Porsche driving into them. No, not not on the screen as yet. Okay. No, new, uh, new race leader is, is now into the pits. Elio Castro Nevers in the Maya Shank. Sirius XM number 60 car that is in the pit lane from the lead. 89 laps now completed. This is third pit stop of the day. Jamie McEwen tweeting at IMSA Radio what a legend Ben Keating is. Engaging to listen to. Delighted he's doing well, keep my fingers crossed. He's an inspiration to all of us of a certain age, isn't he, Jamie? <laughs> he doesn't right. get older, he just gets faster. Side by side, Ben Keating's car now in the hands of Alex Quinn, coming out of the final corner, has got uh, Mikkel Jensen for company, the TDS racing machine. That's second and third going into turn one, second and third in LMP2. And they are being gained upon by the number 10, Louis Delatraz now behind the wheel, as we mentioned of that Acura. Joe Bradley down in the pit lane for some more driver insight. Well, it was a frantic start at the LMP3 class and uh, just as frantic as ever for the 33 Sean Creech car. Joe, you've just got out of the car. Joe, what balls hurt with me now? Joe, um, tell me. It, sail, it looks like a very typical Sebring 12 hours from, from where I am. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's busy out there for sure, but unfortunately we had um, a problem in the beginning that we fell behind a few laps and now uh, we're having uh, other issues going on, so uh, I have no information on the on my steering at all, no no gears, nothing. So I dri I'm driving it by ear, but which is fine. The car actually is running really good, but unfortunately we have this issue and we're going to try to fix it. It's a 12-hour race, that's a good thing. We have plenty of time to... Uh, to fix it, and if anyone can do it, the Sean Bridge guys can. So that, that's that's a that's a bit of an give us a bit of an idea. So when you say no dashboard, with a paddle shift, you're relying upon that number showing in front of you. Are you having to be old school and remember what gear you're in? Absolutely. Even on the, on coming into the pits, we have no information if we're in first, second, third, or whatever, and we have no speed limit, also no pit speed, so we have to go by ear. Uh, so far, so good. I didn't get any penalty, which was good. You know, and after a while, you just get used to it, to the sound of the engine. And you remember where you shift all the time, so it becomes pretty automatic after a while. Joe, if it was easy, we'd all be doing it. I'm glad it's you <laughs> that's doing it. Thanks, man. Thank At least he doesn't have to double D clutch and hail and toy in it as well, um, which uh, could be part of it. Uh, so coming round to half past one in the afternoon here. Shea Adam has rejoined us in pit lane at pit out. Hello, John. Uh, well, before I go down to pit out, I was actually just having lunch on one of the pit boxes and noticed the driver change. Nico Veroni, who was one of the victorious drivers yesterday with Corvette Racing, jumping aboard for his first stint in the LMP3 car. A 
of AWA. This is number 17, the green one, and they are having issues. They brought the car right back in. Now there's three mechanics pushing it, trying to get it going. Also into the pit lane, though, we've got that 33 Sean Creech Motorsport car that we were just hearing about. And further back, Paul Miller racing into their pit box with Corey Lewis staying aboard for a second stint. But massive drama down here for two of our P3 contenders. Led by 31, uh, 38 car performance tech motorsport. So that's Zhao's car. Joe Bradley has not moved that far since he got out of it. Uh, in point of fact, stopped in. I think it's going behind the wall here. Joe Bradley, is that going behind the wall? Uh, it's showing every indication that it is. It's got crew pushing it. The car is off its pit box and away from its own pit box. And it looks to me as though it might be going to be pushed all the way into and around and behind the wall. It's, you remember, Jao's just, Jabba Boss is just telling us, no dashboard. Ah, then now the steering wheel in the hand of one of the crew members. I don't know if they're going to try a quick fix and uh, replace the steering wheel. That usually does. The way that uh, Jao described that problem, um, we'll, the, ah, Johnny Knox, the, the pit lane official, stepping in. I'm not sure if they're going to be allowed to work on the car away from their own yeah, allocated area. I was about to say that. Yes. Uh, now they're pushing it back towards their own allocated area. It looks to me as though the car got off from the pit box, but didn't get very far. Um, as I was talking to Chow, while that was going on, we were thinking that the car had made it, uh, it had resumed. It hasn't. It's still in the pits. Yeah, it drove away from the pit box, but didn't get out of the pit lane. In comes... The number 93, Racers Edge Motorsport Acura NSX. That's the leader in GT Daytona. Uh, delighted to say, and welcome back, by the way, to those of you on Highlands ESPN 106.3, as well as listening around the world on RS2 and on the World Feed TV. Delighted to say that we are joined by our Grand Marshal, Lynn St. James. Hello, Lynn, how are you? I'm fantastic. You look very well. You look very well. How's the weekend been going for you? It's been just too much fun. Um, I've gotten to be able to see a lot of fans and see a lot of race cars, and I actually got a lap around in the Grand Marshall uh, Cadillac. And so, you know, what more could we ask? The sun's out, it's a beautiful day, and lots of race cars going around the racetrack. In addition to your duties here as Grand Marshal, we've been hearing a lot about the Women with Drive 3 uh, conference, Women in Motorsport North America. The, you had a little meeting, uh, uh, quite a big meeting actually, earlier on this race weekend. Uh, I'm told it was a huge success last year, uh, that uh, Women with Drive conference. That would have been Women with Drive 2, of course. Yes, yes, it was. I mean, what we really wanted to do, and we are doing, was to have an annual summit, an annual gathering of of the entire industry. You know, OEMs, race teams, um, sponsors, you know, suppliers, everybody that is in the motorsports business, um, gathering them together and talk about uh, how we can help grow the sport. And one of those ways, an important way, is to is to not only celebrate the women who are already here and successful, because we got lots of those, um, but to be able to do that and show the new up and coming people coming into the, this sport that this is possible. And then to kind of learn from each other about maybe things that aren't going so well that we could improve or things that are really going well, you know, kind of best practices that could also help other uh, other ent entities within the sport. Uh, at the sharp end of that, obviously, are initiatives like the Iron Dames. They had a great result uh, in WEC drove very very well and that's a well that's now into its I think third or fourth year we've got uh, Catherine Legg uh, we've got Sheena Monk in this we've always had women drivers what we perhaps haven't understood quite so much is what's going on behind the scenes engineering uh, team management all that kind of thing it encompasses the whole thing oh it does absolutely it's about careers it's about having a career in motorsports officials i mean it, it it really leaves it doesn't leave any stone unturned because there's so many different careers there's so many different categories of expertise that's needed um whether it's logistics management skills marketing skills finance skills you know handling the finances of, of all of this. this is a big business it's a small entrepreneurial type of business but it's also big business i i i made a comment at the start of the race actually i was looking down during the um 
the celebrations before the race started. And our pit lane official, say for IMSA, Johnny Knotts is our chief pit lane official. Half of his team are female. I saw that. Marshall Pruitt did that uh, interview, and I saw that. And I'm like, so we got to celebrate that. Not to just focus on it's women. I don't know. It's hard to explain, but... The more, I call it follow the female because we really want to be able to show on an ongoing basis, not make such a big deal about it once a year because it's Women's History Month, but to be able to kind of talk about it regularly, integrate it into the conversation because that way the fans out there, the female fans out there could go, oh, wait a minute, I, I, I could be a fan and I am a fan, but I could also maybe have a career here. Uh, and and is, is it important to make people, everybody, feel comfortable so whether you know about motorsport or you don't know about motorsport sports car racing in particular i find particularly inclusive and whether that is people who are knowledgeable about the sport or not whatever background you come from whether you're male or female it's about make people making being made comfortable and seeing people perhaps like themselves being involved in the sport? Right. I mean, I think traditionally, whether it was sports cars or whether it was even drag racing or almost any form of motorsports, it had a tendency to be, if you came from a family who did it, whether it was a, or friends that were did it, that was your entree, right? Yeah. Uh, more now, I can't, I mean, I'm amazed at how many very successful women that I talked to who came, you know, had nothing to do with motorsports, but had no idea that it was available to them. And those are the types of things that we that, that we want to be able to, to encourage more of um, the sport will only grow because of it and that's really about growth I mean and, and one of the things that I continue to say though is that we, we do want to open the doors to say hey come on in and become part of our sport but you can't be mediocre at what you do you can't just be a fan and, and, and take up space you can't take up space in this sport you have to be excellent at what you do we only want the best it's results oriented on the track and off the track exactly. always, always has been I've always said the stopwatch doesn't know or care who's driving the car it's just a stopwatch it's going to no. It's going to tell you time. But whether it's engineering and dis the decision making that makes cars go fast, and, and whether it's teams that are well gelled and work well together, it comes from being well organized. Uh, stay with us, Lynn, if you don't mind. We're going to head down to Shea Adam, one of our women in motorsport, down in the pit lane. Shea's with David Rigo. David, it's been a very busy week for you so far, bouncing back and forth between the 488 and the 296. How nice is it to finally get back into the new car for some racing? Ah, of course, yes, a busy, busy week. Uh, yesterday the race went quite well. Now full focus on this. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to drive uh, this uh, new 296. Uh, actually, we did uh, a good job. Now we need, need to get the experience with this car. Uh, together with Team Rizzi and the other Ferrari team, we are really working strong to, to, be, to improve race by race. Still uh, missing something, uh, but uh, we, are, uh, we are pushing for it. Uh, let's see. The goal, again, is to defend your Michelin Endurance Cup win from last year. So these endurance races, they mean something a little bit more special to you, don't they? Yes, of course. We know exactly what we need to, to win the championship. We need to, to finish all the races uh, and, of course, to be fast when needed. Daytona was very unlucky race. Here looks uh, much better. Still, we are missing top speed, so the, the race ability for us is very, very difficult. Uh, is uh, the main limitation now for our car. But uh, in the corner, we're pretty happy and uh, looking forward for a, for a good result here. It's a good news then that you've got one of the best pit crews in the business. You can make up positions here. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Davide Regon from Brescia Competizione and that beautiful new 296 Ferrari. Oh, big moment out on the far side of the circuit. The 24 BMW has gone off a turn four. That's the second place car and Felipe Nasser was right with him. Now, I'm not sure whether he tapped him into the spin or hit him as he was spinning, but I think there was a little bit of contact there uh, out of turn four, and the BMW has refired on the dirt. Nice flick turn from Felipe Eng. Nasser and Tandy were right there and had to have avoiding action. So coming through into the area, Eng goes through, there's gap between them there. No, he lost it on the inside curb and Tandy just missed him, didn't clip him there. There was not much more room than an envelope's width as they went through. Just a little bit too much inside curb. They, yeah, dropped the left rear Michelin onto the dirt. Those curbs, very unforgiving, uh, particularly 
when you come back on. And it was right at the end of the curve, and that just kicked the 24 BMW M Hybrid V8 around. Tandy having to be on his metal as he was accelerating through there and somehow managed to avoid. Also good driving by Nick Yellowley in the team car. Philippe Eng is back uh, running. Lynn St. James with us here. So, Lynn, tell us about Women With Drive 3. It's in uh, Avondale, Arizona, Arizona in early November. How do people get involved? What do they need to know? No, November 7th and 8th at Phoenix Raceway, which is officially at Avondale. Just go to our website, womenwithdrive.com uh, or womeninmotorsportsna.com. And we really w couldn't be doing this and wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't so successful because we have sponsors that want to be part of this. That's I mean, great. Mo that's why we announced Mobile One came back. That's driven by Mobile One. And I, I, I was in the Mobile One suite and the majority of the executives are females that are, you know, so we, we really are, you know, it, all the OEMs are there. Uh, GM was there. Ford is there. Toyota's there. You know, all of our, our, our corporate sponsors that are in racing. And so, you know, we've got engagement and that's what makes this stuff work. But we definitely want people to show up and, and they have, can sign up and register. Uh, and what are they going to find out and what are they going to see and hear when they get there, Luke? We are going to have two days of seminars and out, you know, little outbreak sessions discussing all of the topics of what it takes to be successful in the sport. So whether, you know, it's it's just about understanding um, the rules, understanding, you know, how how is, how is a team structure? What does a team structure look like from a business standpoint? Um, what is a corporation like, you know, what is IMSA? How does it actually organize? So we'll be talking about the organizational structures of race teams and, and of race organizations. And we'll be talking about, you know, what type of education did you the variety of educational programs that maybe you didn't study motorsports, but be, because there aren't a lot of you know programs around the country, but maybe you did study marketing, maybe you did study finance, and and so you know we'll be able to kind of look at those entrees and the the pathway that other people have taken, and 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 you've come from other sports, you know. I mean, we had last year, which was amazing. Um, oh God, I can't remember her name. All of a sudden, that was the head of of Fontana when it was Fontana and now she's the head of the um, the basketball team in in uh, LA. Um, oh my God. We, we had some amazing speakers that tell their story of how much they learned in motorsports that applied to also some other careers. So it's a real ca career sharing um, about how to how to have a career and what you've done if you have a career how it might help you actually advance in other forms as well. And to think of motorsport as a business and an opportunity as well as a sport. Yeah. 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 I like no, it's that. business. It's business. It's business. Yeah. Absolutely is. Uh, just. Uh, so yeah. I mean, I would ask people that are fairly new to sort. Yeah. What's real life? Yes. Because for most, for many, for many races, it's not real life. But there is a real life here in this sport, and and that's what Lynn is doing. It's such a fabulous job of getting that message across to people who. Yeah, as, as she said, might not have really thought about it as being a viable option. And but it also, is. Yeah, understand you may not have weekends off. You may be working yeah, weekends no and things like that. Right. So there's the reality, yeah, yeah, about that. But it's it's great, and it was great for me to come back to Sebring. It, it's been a long time. I, somebody, I signed an autograph today. I realized that the first time I ran here was 1978 in a Corvette. I think we finished eighth overall, actually, in that Corvette, which was not bad. I, I co-drove with uh, Louis Louis Saray and Phil Curran, and I still wow. follow Phil Curran on Facebook. Um, and so, you know, I, it's been a great part of my history, and it's a great history here, and it was a huge honor to come back and be Grand Marshal. How great is it as well? You've come back here to be Grand Marshal, which is fabulous, to see this place literally full to overflowing today, and sports car racing being back in everybody's thought, as we've just had a change uh, at the head of uh, GT at Daytona as uh, Mara Engel has gone ahead of Jordan Taylor for GTD Pro. That's the WeatherTech AMG uh, up uh, on top again. The WeatherTech car. Uh, sports car racing looking really healthy oh again. Thanks to it's, I mean, Daytona was sold out and it's Sebring, you know, overflow here. It's, it's really showing that race fans are alive and well and they want to see our sport and our sport is growing. We're, our technology is changing. And so it's all on a, a very trajectory of, of going up. Just a, a, a quick final thought. Um, 
we know your fantastic history in open wheel racing. And Catherine Lake from our paddock is going back to Indy. I know. I'm so year. happy to see that. That's great, isn't it? She has got unfinished business there, and uh, I hope that she can accomplish it this year. I really do. Uh, the Women with Drive 3 is at November the 7th and 8th at Avondale, uh, Arizona at Phoenix Raceway. Womenwithdrivesummit.com is where you'll find it all. Lynn, thanks for coming to see us. Hey, thanks for having me up here. Always a pleasure. Well, it's... And always smiling, Lynn St. James. <laughs> yes. Every time I have ever seen you, whatever you've been doing, you've said hello and smiled. And that's uh, it's really lovely. Thank well, you. Well, I'm always smiling at a racetrack, unless the car broke and I'm maybe not so happy. But anyway, yeah, no, I, when I'm at a racetrack, I'm in my happy place. Still a racer at heart, always <laughs> a racer at heart. Lynn St. James, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, let's go down to share Adam in the pit lane. I don't want to say curse to the commentator, John Fletcher, 23, Heart of Racing Aston Martin, has just come back out from behind the wall. So we called it going back there quite a bit earlier than it actually did, but yes. it seemed like something wrong with the transmission when the car oh, came in. Right. They were wiggling the wheels, trying to get the rear wheels to turn in the proper direction, and they were not complying. So the car went back to the garage. It is now back out onto the racing circuits, I believe. That was taking it back out for his first stint to this race. Yeah, so the 023 with a, an alternate pulley issue, that for the Triazi Ferrari, and the 23 now with a problem. So uh, maybe I did have the crystal ball out there. Cadillac from the two Porsche Penske Motorsports. 33 seconds between Scott Dixon, Felipe Nazar, and Nick Tandy. And those two cars have swapped since that near miss uh, on the back uh, of the Philip N car. He's resumed down in eighth position for BMW Team RLL. And uh, those two Porsches, though, trying to get some time back on Scott Dixon, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, and Eng, a lap or two ago, was just overtaken by uh, Alexander Sims, who's charging along there, number, thir number 31 car. Uh, he's fairly, uh, has been fairly regular, the quickest car on the track, and uh, closing that gap to the cars in front of him. He's now only, what, seven seconds behind Elio Castro Neves. Uh, that gap what, 10 laps ago was about 13 seconds, so he's going quite a bit quicker. Both of those two cars did take on tyres at their last stop, I believe. And uh, Tim Grace just reminded me, it was Gillian Zucker who's the president of operations at the LA Clippers. I bet that was a very interesting chat. Uh, that is someone who's been Quite. highly successful down through the years. Just again that. Check it out, all the details, womenwithdrivesummit.com uh, for that uh, get-together and uh, learning opportunity as well as a networking opportunity, part of Women in Motorsports North America. 100 laps completed by the race leader, Scott Dixon in the 01 Cadillac. He's got... Uh, a bit over half a minute ahead of the two Porsches, Felipe Nasser and Nick Tandy running in tandem as they're working their way through some GTD traffic. But right behind Tandy is Louis Delatraz in number 10 Acura, looking to make up for that lost ground uh, running at all the third tyres a little while ago. Incident involving Kiffin Simpson and Miguel Molina, the 8 and 21 cars under investigation and a penalty uh, just a warning given to the number eight car and meantime nick tandy is touring in the porsche with his driver's side door open now it looks like there may be some dust and dirt being thrown off he's well offline going through turn six down towards turn seven he's pulled the car off onto the grass he'll be talking to the team I suspect he's got the door open because there's fumes inside the car and he's trying to get the car out of the way and not just park it in the middle of the road right in front of, that's interesting, right in front of the wheel and engineering car. No, he's taking it round. The wheel and engineering car now has the right hand headlight not working and the left hand headlight working. It was the other way around <laughs> earlier on. So I can only assume there's some kind of smoke or something inside the car unless that door no nick's popped that open hasn't he and he's got the hazard flashes on now he's pulled the door back to no he's pushed it back open again so there must be something in the car that nick's not happy with 
and he's trying desperately to get that car back, but unfortunately he's got half the lap still to go. We've got about one and three quarter miles. This is the white pinstriped Porsche. So the number six coming through tower turn now. Iron Dames Lamborghini coming up behind the man from Bedfordshire, right in the middle of England. Well, that is through a look for yeah. a car that was finding a bit of pace. And has he dropped off the lead lap, Jeremy? No, not yet, no. Down nice. the back straight now, he's over to driver's right. So what happened to this? He's come out of turn. Right, he just came out of... Ah, he got hit. Well, I, I think it the car like slowed. It looks like the car stopped, yes. Yeah. He, the car slowed and he got hit by the... Acura behind him, which is the 10 car, Louis Delatraz. And in the acceleration area, out of turn five, into the right hand of the long sweeping right hander at turn six. That's almost as if the car is in either pit lane speed limiter mode or limp home mode. Our pit lane reporter is there, Shea Adam. The they, door's still open as he came to a halt there. Yeah, they popped both of the doors open. The fire bottle is in hand from the mechanic. That was the number one thing that they're doing. They do not have the refueling nozzle plugged in. They are not recharging the car. And they are looking in the cockpit with Nick, with the mechanics on either side of the door. It's almost as if uh, a hose came loose and was blowing in the wrong direction. But they are not hurrying. There is no urgency here. And they have the sticks to take the engine cover off if need be. But they are not utilizing it. Now, both doors have been closed. Nick pops the left-hand one open immediately after both mechanics close the doors. And, uh, yeah, no, no sense of urgency is the biggest problem right now. The green light is on in the dashboard, which means it's high voltage safe. The, the hybrid is safe. Right, now they're going to work. They've just fastened the door back on. And from the outside... Well, they said going officials to work, there. but they sent the car. Let's see if he makes the hard right-hand turn yeah. back to the garage area. I'm guessing they didn't even bother refueling, which you thought they might have done. Nice going out. No, he, he's, he's gone. He's so out. why did the fuel that? Hmm. Still got the right-hand indicator on as he rejoins the track. Did you see the computer go on there, Shea? Negative, no computer, just mechanics in either side of the cockpit. Well. They're talking as if he's going to come back in, though, John. OK. Well, he is up to speed. He's dropped down to the very back of the GTP field and has dropped a lap away from the leaders, which is Scott Dixon from Philippe Nasser in the seven Porsche. That's the one with the black pinstripes and side flashes. Louis Delatraz just about two seconds behind Philippe Nasser, seven from ten, battling for second. Let's have a quick update. In-race update from VP Racing Fuels. Then it's Nick Yellowly for BMW, the number 25 in fourth. In fifth, Elio Castro Neves, Brian Shanks, Acura. And in sixth, Alexander Sims for the Cadillac of Wheel and Engineering. Philip N and Nick Tandy for BMW and Porsche. Seventh and eighth. P2, Nolan Siegel, crowd strike racing. 0-4. And that car's about to pit this time or next time around, where racing's... Pietro Fittipaldi, number 51, is in second. Ed Jones for high-class racing in the number 20 car in third. Top six made up by Mikkel Jensen for TDS in that number 11 car. They've got some stories to tell. P.R. Matheson's 52, Alex Quinn. It's the wins car. Started on Paul Kiffin Simpson for Town Motorsport. Being given a warning for the contact that he had with the number 21, Miguel Molina car and now hearing that the number 38 car is going slowly around the circuit uh, 
and we'll try and pick that up for you. That is the Christopher Allen Performance Tech LMP3 car. Here are the runners and riders in LMP3. Andretti Autosport by now 17 and a half seconds. The number 36 has over the bright yellow number 85 JDC till Bechtelsheimer behind the wheel there. Then AWA is Ore Fadani in the 13 cars, another 11 seconds back, and he's got four seconds on Garrick Grist in fourth position for Junior 3 Racing. Maro Engel in the 79 white, red and blue WeatherTech AMG by a second on Jordan Taylor in the bright yellow number three Corvette. Then Mike Skeen is the third best GT car and the best of the Pro-Am cars for Tim Kortoff Motorsport with the Mercedes AMG number 32. Dennis Lawrence Van Fort for, Paul, for Porsche and Faf, the number nine, the plaid car. Then Ben Barnicott for Vassar Sullivan. Yeah, that's been a good comeback after yeah, that, really uh, uh, that. That and the Corvette, of course, both were caught out on that first caution period, weren't they, John? They had yeah. to come on, uh, come on in for emergency service, had to make another pit, so it dropped them from the front to the back of the class, and they're now up in the, the top three, well, three or four positions, fourth for Ben Barnicott in GTD Pro. And winding up the top six in GT is the second GTD runner, Paul Miller Racing, Corey Lewis, in the number one BMW. That's your... VP Racing Fuels in race update. We're live from Sebring on IMSA Radio, Highlands ESPN 106.3 FM, Sirius XM here in the States and around the world on RS2, part of the Radio Shore Limited network of channels. So, coming into one of our Porsche keys to the race here, Jeremy. The Michelin Endurance Cup, under 15 minutes now to the first tranche of points. So we might see some little funky pit strategies here. Um, well, they're going to try and start. I think that's why they, they came in a little, little bit earlier. I think that they might have otherwise done uh, in the most recent stops. Uh, so I think they're all good to go to that uh, four hour mark from here. And uh, Scott Dixon has got a pretty handy lead. He's, he's charting very consistent laps mainly in the 51s he turned a 50 flat a couple of laps ago to extend his lead uh, out to over 36 seconds but down to 35 now over the accurate of louis delatraz who's got just got past uh, felipe nasa nasa must have had a an incident on that last lap he's lost the position so nasa down to third place now in the porsche and delatraz in the number 10 accura up to second position uh, louis delatraz doing a good job uh, in that car remember we are uh, off kilter at the front for who's on which tyre from when. Uh, Joe Bradley down in the pit lane. We've talked a lot about Nolan Siegel and his dual career in both sports cars and single seaters. Let's hear from the young man himself. Yeah, the 04 car brought in in the lead. Nolan, great drive. It's a good job you're young. You've been working very hard by the look of the sweat on your overalls. Yeah, it's it's hot out there for sure, but um, no, it was it was a great stint. You know, brought it to the lead, and I think we have a, a pretty comfortable gap now to P2. So, um, yeah, everything's going smoothly, and the team's doing a great job. So, really happy with it. I noticed they didn't change tires. What were they like when you left it? Um, still quite good. I think that we're being pretty easy on tires, managing the pace well. So. Um, yeah, hopefully George has, you know, an easier time getting up to speed when it's when it's green here and um, they'll be good to the end. How how close is an LMP2 prototype to the single seater car that you're going to be driving in the Firestone series? There are definitely different beasts. Um, the LMP2 car is physically a lot bigger, a lot heavier, uh, a bit more horsepower. So um, it's a bigger thing to get around the track, but um, I'm having a great time. It's a lot different at karting, mate. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. 24 BMW into the pit lane. Philip Eng has jumped out and walked quite slowly back over to the pit wall, trying to conserve any energy. New tires for Marco Wittmann, who is being belted into this car. It is too early for the stop, and the driver change actually took longer than the refueling did by a dint of that. Now the car fires back up into life and goes out onto the track, but that seems a little bit too early by my account. I think, wouldn't, wasn't that the car that was off the track, John? Yes. So maybe uh, Philip Eng's tires had finally just given up a little bit earlier than we expected. Let's uh, find that out from Bobby Rahal and the team. 
Good run though this far for the BMW. In fact, oh, really interesting for GTP. Nobody's had an absolutely clean run apart from probably the car that's leading at the moment, the Zero One Scott D Dixon. Everyone else has had some kind of either tyre uh, management issues, being off the track, facing the wrong direction. The uh, Porsches haven't had it all their own way either. Meantime, Scott Dixon, the answer to pretty much every IndyCar trivia question that Tim Gray ever poses on midweek motorsport on a Wednesday. It's 35 seconds to the good and doing um, doing a Scott, Scott Dixon thing, basically, Jeremy. He is uh, superb, just nice and consistent, doing 150.8 last lap, just come across the line again, 55-4 this time, some traffic on that lap, but uh, a lead now about 35 seconds over Louis Delatraz. Behind him, uh, Felipe Nazar is falling back pretty quickly. He fell back nearly two seconds on that last lap. See when they when they come across again now. And closing in on Nasser, is, well, next behind Nasser now is Elio Castroneves, who got past Nick Yellowley's BMW last time around. That uh, number 25 BMW also struggling for pace at this stage in the race. It's Jeremy Shaw. I'm John Hindhoff. Good to have you company. Just after two o'clock, so just over eight hours to go, counting down to that first set of points for Michelin Endurance Cup. Shea Adam and Joe Bradley in the lane. 30 degrees in the air and 28 Celsius on the track. That translates to 82 Fahrenheit on track and 86 in the air. Certainly getting toasty, but not as hot as yesterday. A little bit of cloud. But just sort of Simpsons opening titled credit type cloud bubbling up. Cotton wool not throwing any shadow. Wind still blowing on the back of the cars as they go down into turn one. Therefore on the nose as they come into turn number 17. And the battle in GTD, the cars with the GTD Pro with the red side panels for the numbers is hotting up again because having got through the WeatherTech AMG has not pulled away from the bright yellow Corvette, Jeremy Shaw. And no. Maro Engel is looking in his mirrors now because Jordan Taylor's back well within a second, down about half a second or 10 cars lengths. Yeah, and this pair, about 20 seconds ahead of Mike Skeen, who's leading GTD car. Mike Skeen is just ahead of Lawrence Vanto in the best of the Porsches, which is running third in GTD Pro, that's car number nine. Uh, and then about a 13 second gap back to Ben Barnicut, uh, and then the rest of the GTD cars from there. The number 31 car of Alexander Sims, he's also just overtaken Nick Yellowly. So uh, that, that both of the BMWs, as I say, struggling. Uh, 25 car now back to sixth position, and Alexander Sims, he's about a bit over a minute behind the leaders, and uh, it was a better part of uh, 1 minute 40 when he took over that car after the uh, earlier dramas for, for Pipa Durrani. Yes. He's turned some really good laps string of them now can the corvette then just get a little bit closer going into turn three now and while we watch the battle at the front of gtd philip eng is out of his 24 that was a bit of a short stint here adam what was the issue yeah i'll start with that uh philip it seemed like your stint was ended a little bit early what was the issue oh, we tried to be a little bit more flexible with the strategy um it was quite, uh, quite tough out there, but also a lot of fun uh, driving those cars around here. I pushed slightly too hard in the first stint, trying to get by the uh, number 10. Uh, but it was really good fun, very hard racing, very good racing up there. A big difference from Daytona, you guys are very competitive. Do you feel like a win is on for today, potentially? Well, it's still very early in the race, but uh, uh, I think we have, we have some made, we've made some good steps from Daytona coming to here. We've been working flat out BMW, uh, BMW team RLL as well, um, such as us drivers. So I really hope we get the credit for it at the end of the race. How careful do you have to be when you're double stinting the tires? You have to treat them uh, very, very early in the, in the stint already, in the first stint. Otherwise, uh, they overheat and they degrade uh, very quickly. So it's not easy, but if it was easy, somebody else would do it. Thanks, Philip. Thank you. Uh, nice of Philip Eng to 
get out of the car and Kubator was very classy driver we are so lucky in sports car racing to have such great people to talk to now here's another problem out on the circuit and it's the uh, TDS number 35 that's the red car with the yellow out at turn 10 now making its way through tower turn 13 but that car was very slow a moment or two ago Shea's uh -huh. just gonna pop next door to Porsche and see if we can find out why Nick Tandy was driving around with the driver's door open I don't think he was waiting for his drive-through delivery Might have been. so what happened to that car the number 35 ah got tipped into a spin by the number six Porsche of Nick Tandy down at turn 10 that's the second time Tandy's made contact with another category of car took the front end off the gradient number 66 which wasn't looked at I suspect that one will be and I think that might be a penalty coming the way of the number six which also seems to be just throwing a little bit of smoke or vapour out of the left hand exhaust at the back of the car keep an eye on that maybe it was just dust the front of GTD Pro that battle that we were talking about heating up is now burst into flames as Maro Engel is playing defence against the bright yellow Corvette sitting in behind Engel from Taylor and just being passed by the number 60 Sirius XM Acura who's also in a battle with Alexander Sims that's Elio Castro Neves getting caught up in that traffic and here comes Sims trying to go around the outside for a moment we had three cars across the track in a place at turn 16 where that was never going to happen and Engel is disadvantaged there Maro Engel disadvantaged and through goes Taylor takes no second invitation needs no second invitation and goes through to take the lead of GTD Pro that's the traffic effect when you have five classes Engel fighting back down the inside at turn number 17 hits the bumps drops in behind the low slung sleek Corvette the C8 going towards turn one the tech car right in the wheel tracks Engel pulls out to get a bit of air on the nose as he turns in that's really experienced driving no aero push there that was very clever from Engel he thought clearly thought about that he's still there now will he get a run down towards the hairpin at turn six down to the bottom of the circuit so if you're watching on the on the stream around the world the big box is the replay of what we just described there was a little touch from the 60 Acura onto Maro Engel he'll not be happy about that that was instrumental Jeremy on him losing the lead and the yep. GTP drivers today are being uh, particularly aggressive and so far they've not been penalised for it. No, uh, that was certainly a, a forceful move. That, I mean, that, that was a battle for fourth place that was going past him there. Uh, Elio Castroneves has that position, but Alexander Sims has caught him uh, and he is uh, trying to get past, uh, trying to get back up into the top four. That's Alexander Sims in that car number 31. He's made up on that car uh, about a second second on lap uh, really in the last uh, dozen 15 laps or so uh, he's now right with him and now he's got it now Sims wants to get past it's good out of Shea Adam uh, who we tasked with finding out why Nick Tandy was driving around with his door open we have then had that incident uh, with the the TDS car and now the car's back in the pit lane the number six for Porsche Penske Motorsport did just come into the pits to make a normal service stop. They changed the left side tires only, took Nick Tandy out of the car and put Dane Cameron in. And no need to worry for fans of Tandy all around the world. It was a weird gas that was in the cockpit, but they managed to re-tighten some hoses and the smell disappeared. So the good news for them is that apparently everything is okay now for the number six Porsche. Just had a visit from the number 85 of Till Beckenschleimer who came in. He's in the LMP3 class, of course, and it was only fuel for the...
the second place car that will ebb down the field but then we get this flip flop of we get this flip flop of effect of people swapping the lead backwards and forwards through the pit stop phase and also in the pits is the troubled 023 Ferrari that's on a recovery drive remember we spoke to Samantha from Triassi and they had a problem there so they're on a recovery drive straight forward pit stops down here thank you Joe so a little bit of something leaking into the cockpit for Nick Tandy which required uh, venting and tightening He's out of the car now, and Dan Cameron has taken it over. Jeremy, we've just gone by the four-hour mark. We'll come back with the points for the Michelin Endurance Cup in just a moment here on IMSA Radio, live from Sebring. So four, eight and 12 hours for the Michelin Endurance Cup, which is the Daytona Rolex 24 hours, the Mobile 1 12 hours of Sebring, Seal and six hours of the Glen, and Motul Petit Le Mans at Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta. Do we have the result? Uh, not officially yet, no, so we better wait for that. But, but unofficially, certainly in, in GTP, uh, the uh, number zero 01 car was leading at that uh, four hour mark so that'll get maximum points there that'll now have a total of 16 points the Konica Minolta Acura car number 10 was leading the points coming into this weekend with the penalty to number 60 car from Daytona uh, that will score second place points here so it'll be 18 points now for the number 10 car 16 points for the number zero one car and then third will be the number 31 car on 14 points uh, after the uh, four hour mark in this race. In total, that's total points from Daytona and Sebring thus far. So now we just have a WEC race to go. Eight hours to go, yeah, right, good point. Fabulous weather. No worries so far. 84 on track, 86 Fahrenheit in the air. That translates to 30 Celsius in the air and 29 I'll on the set. What. Nick Yellowley. Nick Yellowley is really struggling that 25 car. He's way off the pace at the moment. He's losing four or five seconds a lap. At, well, pr probably more than that, actually, to the, uh, that pair ahead of him. So 25 car uh, has... Two in. Yeah, well... Uh, Joe Bradley has the second place car in the pit lane. That's the number 10, Conning and Manolda Acura. Shea Adam. They are doing fuel only for this car, adjusting tire pressures potentially. Yes, it looks like they are for the left front and the left rear on this Konica Minolta Acura, but other than that, no new tires going on. Louis Delatraz staying aboard as well, just waiting on the fuel for that number 10. That's the sound of the 14 Lexus going back up, by the way. Ben Bardic had stayed aboard, but he did get four new Michelin tires. And into the pits now is the number 31. This car, which is doing full service. Alexander Sims jumping out. Jack Aitken taking over for his first racing laps around Sebring International Raceway. And I heard you mentioning the 25 struggling out on track. Well, they are on an in-lap. This will be Nick Yellily pitting and handing over to Sheldon Vandalinda. Also into the pit lane, we've got the Corvette. This is Jordan Taylor, who has following him in the number 79 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes. Let's see, is there a driver the change leader. at Corvette? Does not look like it. Uh, and no driver change for WeatherTech either. Let me just make sure that that's correct. As first and second and GTD Pro come in, in first and second, yes, no driver change for the Corvette. There is a driver change for the Mercedes as Jules Gunion, the Andorran driver, is taking over that white Mercedes. It should be the Corvette who leaves first because they were first back into their pit stop. That's interesting. So that means that must have swapped back again because uh, the WeatherTech car was leading, but they did indeed come into the pit lane with the Corvette in front. The Corvette went past him with an incident, didn't they? Out on the racetrack. Right. That's when the Corvette got past him. Okay. Yep. And now the two pit crews working together. It's going to be full service for both. Corvette is down and away and probably four or five seconds in hand for the Corvette who 
releases the pit lane speed limiter now. John Taylor and he has stayed in the pit lane. Shield Canon has jumped in to the 79 as reported by Shea Adam. Highlands ESPN 106.3 FM syndications all around the world and on RS2, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels, Sirius XM here in the US. And if you're outside the US, you can access our world feed if your country does not have a network TV deal for IMSA. And in that case, you'll be able to watch live, uninterrupted, free coverage all the way through till the chequered flag tonight. Go to IMSAradio.com, click on the drop down menu on the top left hand side of the menu bar. And the first option is live video. Uh, BMW in, that's uh, Nick Yellily, Jack Aiken going out for wheel and engineering in the 31 Cadillac. But Scott Dixon is in the pit lane and headed to Shea Adam. And he'll be staying here because it is Ranger time. Ranger Van de Sanda taking over that 01 Cadillac with uh, the bright yellow accents all over it. But for Ranger, no new tires. They uh, are Ranger. just doing fuel and energy, topping off a bit of fluid as well in the left-hand side with a pressurized bottle. But they did give Ranger a windshield tear-off. So clearly they still like him, even if they're not giving him some new Michelin rubber. BMW service is done with the four new tires going on that car. And that car is back out and rolling. And now we wait for the Cadillac to finish getting its energy stores. Ah, uh, so beautiful, so quiet, as it all of a sudden pops back into life. And Ranger is set free. Also into the pit lane, the number seven Porsche behind me. They are doing four tires for this Porsche. It was two for the sister car as Michael Christensen is taking over the number seven. And we've got Faf Motorsport into the pits as well. Lawrence Vantor brought the car in. He is staying in the pit lane though. I think that's Patrick Pile's yellow and blue helmet. But I'll be able to tell you in just a second as he powers the Porsche back into life and gets rumbling by me. Yep, that's Patrick. Bye, Patrick. And sticker Michelin's for Patrick Pile. Also, another Porsche pit stop is for the first form. Number 16, blue, white and black Porsche. That's just rumbled away on the pit lane speed limiter from the from its pit box, which is just by our commentary point, actually. Zachary Robichon brought it in. And as he goes out, I'll check to see who it was. Michael Christensen, by the way, behind the wheel of the Porsche Penske Motorsport machine. Now the 16 is uh, on the, the track. Let's see if we can pick off who that was behind the wheel there. Of the blue Porsche. So Zach Robichon has got out of that car. Zachary Robichon. Jan Halen was in the car before that. It's Ryan Hardwick, of course it is. Ryan Hardwick, who didn't get a fair go of it in uh, FIA WEC, put it off the track by a Cadillac, which wrote off the 88 Porsche. Didn't get even into qualifying. 20 minutes past two at Sebring International Raceway. Joe Bradley and Shea Adam down in the pit lane. Getting a bit toasty down there for those who are clad in protective fire suits. Imagine what it's like in the cars. There is an element of cooling within the cars. But uh, I can tell you, it will still be very uncomfortable point is when you're concentrating I think you don't notice it so much it's when you get out of the car you realize Ben Keating telling us that our Michelin counts down to green that he lost uh, 12 pounds and burned something like 11,000 calories whilst he was doing his uh, stint in the WEC from the start of the race to about a third distance yesterday that was in the Corvette 
See if we can uh, pop down the job, Bradley, and uh, speak to Zachary Robichon just out of that right car. Uh, Zachary, that earlier puncture really put you guys out of contention, out of the clawback. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it didn't really uh, hurt us too much. You know, a little bit of an off-sequence pit, but I think right now at the four-hour mark, uh, we were running P3, which is good for the Endurance Championship. So, you know, to be completely honest, I think that over a long race like this, a small thing like that is, is nothing to worry about, and, and we're right back in it. And uh, we've, we've seen people not bother with changing tyres. Is that the case on your car? Definitely not. Yeah, we definitely, we, we would definitely like those new tyres whenever we come in. Uh, it's super hot, the track's getting very greasy, so, uh, you know, we'll see once the temperature comes down how the, the, the pecking order sits. Typical Sebring, by the way, of the, you know, the, the prototypes tripping over the GT cars. Have you stayed out of trouble? I have, for the most seen part. seen lots. Yeah, I've seen lots of them. Uh, there's lots of aggression out there. It's, it's typical Sebring, you know, we have, what, 54 cars or whatever it is. So it's kind of to be expected. So, you know, the race will be won in the last two hours. Thank you. Shea Adam, I'll just uh, put this to you. Remind us of all the drive times, please. Yes. We've had a couple of people asking about that, including um, F and Racing. Very simple. If you're in the pro categories, GTD Pro or GTP, one hour. If you are in LMP2, LMP3 or GTD, three hours. For ev every driver, every single driver. Yeah, and there's, there is the four hours in any six rule as well isn't there, that we need to keep an eye on later in the race. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, question being asked about: Has John Potter done his drive time in the 44? I don't think so. Um, he would have had to have been in an awful lot during the early stages. Seven hours and three quarters still to go. A 33 car has been behind the wall and is now back. So that's the 023, the 23, and the 33. That's the Sean Creech Motorsport Leash yet. Car was a bit dinged up earlier on. We'll find out why that car had to go back behind the wall in just a moment or two's time. Uh, it, was the, it, was the, it was the electronics, wasn't it? Uh, the dashboard had gone off Joe Bradley, and uh, they thought a change of steering wheel might help that. It seems to have been a bit more complex. Further into the car, it was a, it was a short circuit from the main loom, which they've had to change. It's cost the car about an hour. Uh, you haven't really got a choice there. You can either retire the car or get to work. They chose to get to work. Car back out the Great stuff. Scott Dixon, a heck of a job you've done leading the race. Basically, everything they've asked you to do for Chip Ganassi Racing, you've done at Sebring. Has it felt as easy as it looked? Uh, it's never easy. You know, I think we uh, we had some some uh, complications out there for sure, and uh, some maybe different codes that I hadn't heard before, which you know means something I'll have to go and check on later. But um, yeah, you know, the pace has been really good. I actually had a big spin out there uh, when I got sandwiched between a P3 car on the wall into 17. He just turned right in on me. Uh, so I had to come in early on one of those stops and got another set of tyres. So I haven't really felt the, you know, uh, some of the deck that I think's come so far. But our car's been really kind on the tyres. I think everybody on the Cadillac side has done a tremendous job so far. So, you know, let's we'll keep our head down. I'll try and stay out of trouble next time I'm in the car. Now, when you say codes, do you mean codes from the pit box trying to tell you secret information or things that you see flashing up on the dash? Yeah, some of them are colored, and I didn't even know it's a, a dash switch that I had. So, you know, it's um, I'm learning every time in this car. They're very complicated, and uh, a lot of things are quite the opposite to maybe what we do on the on the IndyCar side of things. So, you know, uh, it's interesting. It's a lot of fun. And I will say the traffic out there is chaotic, and, and not a lot of drivers have been very kind to each other. So, you know, hopefully everybody makes it through this period of the day, and we can race tonight. Yeah, great job so far. Thank you. So honest, isn't he? I mean, that's fantastic. I've had stuff flashing up on my dashboard. I didn't even know he had the colours for. Into the pit lane for Elio Castro Neves. Uh, 
which is out of the lead. This car cycles to the front of the field, Jeremy, on the pit stop. Cycle, doesn't it, as we go through the routine. You can either say it's the first one to pit or the last one to pit, I suppose, depending on which way you look at it. That's the fourth pit stop for this particular Acura. Yeah, 30 laps that last stint. It was just short of an hour. It was um, 57 minutes for the number 60 car. And uh, as it was on the last sequence, it was the last car to come into pits this time around as well. So get a good uh, energy uh, consumption there in that number 60 car. And uh, good pace as well for Elia Castro Nevis. It'll be fresh air tyres for him. The number 25 car, I just noticed, has done its best lap of the race of 1 minute 50.1. Sheldon van der Linde finally got some fresh tyres on that number 25 BMW. But that car is, uh, it, it, it is still on the lead lap. Uh, but the number 24 car is not. That is one lap down. And Dane Cameron is uh, about a minute and 23 behind in a number six car, so running eight in GTP. You're listening to IMSA Radio live from Trackside. Sebring International Raceway, the 71st annual Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. Seven hours and 43 minutes still to go. So picking out some battles out on the circuit. Always go down into the GT categories for a bit of interest. Running at the sharp end of the field, Corey Lewis in the Total Quartz BMW. This is the Paul Miller Racing Red, White and Black machine. Out to the wall at turn 17. Comes across the line. Leading in GTD with just two, just one pro car ahead. And that is the Risi Competizione, it's number 62, Gabriel Casagrande. Two and a half seconds up the road. Um, we mentioned the Michelin Endurance Challenge and then uh, I forgot to ask you, Jeremy, to pay off the points there. Um, we do have them officially now from IMSA. What do you got? Yeah, so uh, we, we were right to it with, uh, with uh, GTP. Uh, it was first across the line at uh, four hour mark was number zero one car. Second was number 10 Acura. Third was the number seven Penske team. So the points now are 18 for number 10 car, 16 for number zero one car, and number 31 car is a little bit further back, has 14 points. In LMP2, it was the TDS racing car number 11 that was out front at the four hour mark. So that scores maximum points. And it's now super tight in LMP2. Uh, that car has 16 points. On 15 are the number 35 and the number 04 and number 52 that was uh, it was classified second at the four hour mark. Number 52 car was classified second, but tied those three cars on 15 points. Uh, so that is incredibly tight in LMP2. In LMP3, it was Andretti Autosport, car number 36 out front at the four hour mark. Uh, and that takes them to a tally of 16 points. Second position at four hours, number 30 for Junior 3 Racing. That car did not compete at Daytona. Third position was the number 13 AWA car. So the points table right now, Sean Creech Motorsports, which left Daytona with the lead, now has 20 points. That's car number 33 to the 17 of the car number 17 which is the second of the AWA entries, and then Andretti Autosport on 16 points. In GTD, yes, the GTDs. GTD Pro, out front was the Corvette. Uh, second position was WeatherTech Racing, the Mercedes car number 79, which uh, continues to lead in the uh, M Michelin Endurance Cup points tables and off-road there. That number zero one car, was that the race leader just ran off the road? It was. Yes, it was. That's a the tower turn. And that is a little slip there Renge by Renke van der Zander. Did wow. not get tyres, though, remember. So he's on a, his first stint is on a stint old set of tyres, um, which is an interesting call from the Chip Ganassi Cadillac racing team. And he's got 47 seconds on the field. He's just burned 
a few of those comes right over to the edge and just locks up the right wow. front and rally crosses his way back on. Um, no worries about grazing the inside shoulders coming back on over the kerb because he didn't get anywhere near the kerb coming back on. He's off before the start of the blue and white kerbs at the exit of 13. Slides very close to the concrete wall and then came back on much, much later. Ah, I don't think he that, would have lost that, much time there, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it cost him about four seconds. I well, where is and I think most of that yet? would have been after that, Jeremy, because yeah. his tyres were so wow. dirty. Because actually going through turn 12, he didn't lose anything at all. No. But his apex speed was about the same. He would have got his attention. He wasn't far from that tyre wall, was he? Well, and the tyre wall the ends right where he was. Yeah. So he's actually looking at unprotected concrete there. Cheapers. Shea Adam down in the pit lane. More strife for which car? Uh, the 21A, of course, Ferrari. The second of the red Ferrari 296s has just made the hard right-hand turn to go back behind the wall. And the 7 Porsche is in. This is much too soon for the 963. They just had a pit stop not very long ago, John. Uh, let me see what they jump over the wall to do. Now, remember, Remember, the six was the one that was having the dramas earlier on. They do have the fuel nozzle attached. They are looking at the right front tire, pulling on it very uh, intensely. And yes, now the car goes up on the air jacks, and they are going to pull that left front tire off. Look in the wheel well. I think something might be broken up there. Unfortunately, I can't get to them right now because there is a TDS racing pit stop that's about to take place between me and them. had a question on Adam's radio uh, that has come in about how much darkness we'll have tonight. Hello, Catherine Ed from Canada. Uh, the official sunset this evening is 35 minutes past seven. Uh, so 25 minutes before eight actually would have been the best way for me to, uh, to say that. That um, it was it was uh, twilight at eight o'clock last night, but that's the uh, the full or the official sunset, should I say? Just after eight o'clock, it'll be absolutely dark, and as far as the moon is concerned, there's not much of it tonight. It's a waning crescent tonight, so only twelve percent of the moon is lit, so we're not getting a lot of help from that. So thank you for that. At IMSA Radio, Renga van der Zand is still leading by 44 se seconds. Problems for the car that was leading LMP2 for TDS, Shea Adam. There we go, it finally refired. Uh-oh, now it turned back off. They were having trouble trying to get it to tick over. Porsche's back out, but the 12 Lexus, which is pit boxes right in front of that number seven Penske, having issues trying to get into their box. A terrible, terrible stop as a result of them not being able to get the air jack in, uh, doing service out of the box uh, by dint. They've now moved the car. It's halfway into the transition lane for the Lexus. I can't see this not being a penalty for Lexus for doing work out of their box just by the evasive manner that they had to take to get in. Now that car fires back into life and gets rolling once again. But the 11 TDS Orica LMP2, Stephen Thomas is the one who took it over from Mikkel Jensen. Now they're pulling the tail off. They're going to pull the engine cover off. Oh, this is terrible. Shit. I'll, I'll ask you a quick question, which it's a bit... It's a bit normal because I haven't prepared you for it. Okay. I mean, any changes to the... Uh, the minimum for, uh, full refueling time. No. It's 40 seconds for the GT cars. Uh, I believe it's 31 for the prototypes. Uh, I'm not sure what it is for LMP2, but no, there's been no change to it. Not as far as I'm aware. It, it uh, certainly wasn't a change in the BOP. Another uh, penalty, this time for Indy Donchi's Windward racing car. Failure to adhere to minimum full refueling time. That'll be a drive through. That's got that's got to be at least the sixth or seventh. And Indy has come straight into the pit lane. Meantime, Joe Bradley. Yeah, I'm at the front of the LMP2 class here with the 52 PR1 Matheson car in for a pit stop. Uh, Alex Quinn is the driver that's jumped out. Now remember, this is the car that was started by Ben Keating and Ben done an absolutely Ironman stint. Absolutely Ironman stint. However, 
Paul Lipschatan getting into the car. We're going to have to spread the energy across the rest of the eight hours that's remaining, or just under eight hours remaining for this 52 to actually not wear their drivers out. Younger drivers, Alex, let's grab a quick one. You've literally just took your helmet off, so I appreciate this quick chat. Everything great? So? Everything okay? Yeah, I mean, it's extremely hot out there, but um, we're not perfectly happy with the car but we're working really hard and uh, doing the best we can and it seems to be going okay I mean uh, I was quite happy that stim but just could have done a bit better managing traffic so got a bit to learn still new to this but I'm doing my best and it will only get better from here you've just mentioned how tough it is could you just quantify for us just what that absolute iron man stim was from Ben incredible yeah I mean compared to Daytona it's two three four times worse and it's uh, but you know that's part of it we're we work hard at home training for it, so yeah, hopefully it pays off at the end. What are you going to tell the engineer now? Tell me first. No, we'll just talk about the balance and uh, see what we can do about it. Yeah, mate. For the 11 TDS car, the drama came in the fact that any time they tried to knock it in gear, the car would stall and turn off. They did finally manage to get a hold of it, but the only way that they did that was with three mechanics pushing the car back into life, trying to bump it into gear. That's ultimately what worked. That car did get back out onto the racing surface. Further down the pit lane, we've got a pit stop for the number 63 Lamborghini. Jordan Pepper has gotten out. He's shaking his head, and he just almost laid down in grief on the pit wall. He's handed over to Frank Ferrara, who is taking over for, I think, his first stint of the race. But this is not a happy-looking Jordan Pepper. Um, let me wait until this pit stop is clear, camera over the wall, and find out why Jordan is so disconsolate. Just a moment or two ago. Thank you, Shay and Joe. Uh, we saw, I think it was Colin Brown being passed by the Porsche Penske Motorsport car. I think getting a lap back there, Jeremy, was that? Yeah, it wasn't full position. The, the number seven car is a lap down to the race leader. I th think the number six car was two laps down. I'm just trying to verify that. Where is number six car? There it goes. No, it isn't. It is, uh, it is just one lap down, the number six car. So there's tr the number 24 car, BMW, and the two Porsches, both one lap down to the race leader at the moment. So on the lead lap, which is lap 126, just been completed. Here's a VP racing fuel update. Cadillac Racing and Renga van der Zander, the yellow fronted 01 car, has a, about a minute's lead actually over Louis Delatraz, the Swiss driver in the number 10 Acura ARX, the black and blue car, very shiny. And in third position, Wheel and Engineering's Cadillac is in third position. Yes, having just taken that place from Colin Brown a couple of laps ago. Colin lapping in the 55s. Jack Aiken with a different tyre rotation, a 150 last time around. This is the big differences that we were told to expect from cars running on newer tyres. Fifth and still on the lead lap. Sheldon van der Linde for BMW Team RLL. That's the number 25 car. Here comes the 31 to complete another lap. And then it's Michael Christensen and Dan Cameron behind uh, Marco Vittman. So 24, 7 and 6 are 6, 7 and 8. In LMP2, Ed Jones leads for high class racing. And just a moment or two ago, the bumping and barging, they caught off the 32 car up the inside of the 93 Acura. And that was a nice move. There was a slight touch there. The Lexus right in behind them as well, the number 14 Lexus. And have an opportunity to get through and did get through. And as we were talking about that car, we happen to have a, a driver with us. And hello to Kenny Cook, who we haven't spoken to for a wee while. Are you all right, big fella? Yeah. 
Oh, there we go. Now I can talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's going all right so far. Um, you know, it, it's... I don't want to say it too soon, but it seems like every time we have a camera in a car, at least when I'm on board, we, we don't have the good luck. But hopefully, you know, that's uh, hopefully that, that the luck turns and we, we get some uh, good results here for uh, for the 12 hour. Now that first pit stop, Kenton. Yeah. Was that made? Uh, was it? Was that not an emergency stop? Did you not come in as the caution came out, or did you come in right before it? Uh, we we pitted and. Uh, that was before the caution came out. So we were in pit lane. It, moments before. it was perfect timing. Like I was rolling down pit lane after we launched out of the box and there you go. Uh, got the yellow lights on the on the dash there. So yeah. it just ended up being perfect. You were far enough behind everybody else yeah. to get that stop in. Okay, fine. But we got real lucky. We yeah. got real lucky. Got it. Oops. 20 car Number 33 car off the road again. Uh, and what was the what was the condition, the track condition out there early on, Ken? Uh, as far as the track conditions go, there's not too much marbles, not too much pickup um, either. It's, it just seems like a hot day at Sebring, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and for the most part now, everyone's kind of behaving. Um, for the most part. For the most part, as we, we see the 33. But um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty respectful. No one's really racing too hard just yet. Uh, at least everyone that I've been around, we've just been uh, kind of circulating, managing fuel, managing uh, you know our strategy, and we we pitted there to try to put ourselves in an optimal position for that four-hour mark, uh, so that we can lead during the four-hour mark for the endurance championship. Um, yeah. in, in terms we of time, get, we did, actually we didn't get to those points. Oh yeah, good. To GTD, I'll let you look them up. Yep. Um, as far as far as tire strategy is concerned, uh, um, reduced amount of tires again from IMSA this year. But you have to double stint. In in our case, I think we've saved enough uh, tires throughout the weekend that I don't think we're going to have to. Wow. Um, so we should be just putting new tires on for, uh, pretty much every time. Uh, we scuffed some tires in this morning's warm up. Uh, so for tonight, we should be looking pretty good. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, the GTP cars, everybody getting used to the GTP cars. They don't behave in the same way as the DPIs used to. They're a heavier car, they don't have the same handling or dynamic characteristics. Have you noticed that when they're coming by you, do you have to give them more room or they're passing you in different places? I mean, it, it, I think we actually may have touched on this point at Daytona, and, and the, it, it, does, it does feel very different, different from uh, where the DPIs were at. Uh, the DPIs just had, a, a, I think they were just a little bit lighter, a little bit smaller, um, and I think their tire, um, you know, was was also um, maybe just slightly better for the sake of, you know, there there wasn't that tire allotment that we had, uh, a tire allotment to, you know, issues that that they had last year. So better tire, lighter, more downforce, maybe similar amounts of downforce. I think it's just lighter. Um, they were able to just roll around the outside of you in, on like three and five at Daytona, but um, here it's. Yeah, the, the biggest surprise that I've seen is honestly between the LMP2s. Mm. Um, with, with this track, you can't really pass in a, in a lot of places, uh, like around the outside, you know, like out, outside of one, outside of 17. Um, you know, most most of the mechanical grip corners, you're not you're not getting driven around the outside, even with the DPI days. Uh, but uh, you know, in, in this case, uh, so uh, as far as the the difference between. The GTP cars and the DPIs here is is less of a difference. Um, they're they're pretty much passing you in all the same places. But the LMP2s, however, uh, they're a little bit slower, and you know they're they're just not coming up the straightaway as fast as they used to. Uh, don't go away, Ken Cook from the uh, court of AMG. We have just seen Mark Miller jump into the number 66 gradient NSX, which means Catherine Leg is out and can talk to Joe Bradley. Catherine, the 66 gradient Yakker, it took some damage earlier, and that repair looks like it's costing you performance. Yeah, quite a lot of performance, actually. We've lost a bunch of front right downforce, which is affecting, obviously, high speed mostly, but brake zone and, and a bunch of other stuff. So it's really tough. It's one of the hardest things you have to do is to really dig deep and fight for every tenth when you're, all, you're so far off the pace. And you don't want to get in people's way, but you don't want to give in to them either. It's just, it's like balancing on a tightrope. And uh, God, I wish we had the car that we, we could have had at the start, because then we could go fight these guys. 
Is there nothing you can do? Uh, you know, a long repair maybe even? I mean, I don't, you're out of contention now, so there's nothing to lose. We're out of contention now, but I believe we would be further out of contention if we had to stop and change the front end. It's too big of a change. We'd go down too many laps. Right now, we're just fighting for every point that we can get for the rest of the season. So it's good training for Indy now, then, eh? Absolutely. Spirit. Thanks, guys. The other NSX has just taken a wild ride coming out of turn number one. The number 93 car off the ground at one stage. Very lucky not to have a, a bigger incident for that bright red machine. Always looks like it has a little smile on its face though. That 93 <laughs> accurate sits in uh, ninth position uh, in its class. And it's uh, Danny Formel four mile behind the wheel of the Racers Edge Motorsport NSX GT3 uh, from uh, Gradient down to the Iron Dames and Rahel Fry out of the Lamborghini. It's Rahel's first experience of the 12 hours of Sebring and I just said to her it doesn't make it any easier having done the eight hour race yesterday. Porsche now to a Lamborghini. Have you found the transition between the two cars simple? Yes, this happened quite uh, naturally. That that's not our struggle, but she I get over um, I get uh, yeah surprised over again by the heat. Um, our our uh, air conditioning in the Lamborghini is just not as as efficient. Um, yeah, so we do not have to have any diet. This is very clear. Um, right now we just have to survive. We have to have a clean race, and uh, then hopefully we can attack a little more later on. Does it change your strategy? Do, maybe doing single stints for each of the drivers throughout the heat of the day because all of you are tired from yesterday. I'm tired from yesterday too. Yes, clearly we feel a little bit sore, but in the end that's uh, what we want. Uh, we are quite fit, but uh, nevertheless, you're right. It will uh, influence our strategy. Right now we definitely go only for single stints uh, simply due to the heat, and I think that's the way to go for us. This program is an endurance program only, so we're not going to see you again until Watkins Glen. But do you look at the rest of the IMSA calendar and pick out races and think, oh, it'd be a dream to race there? Oh, yes, absolutely. Already Daytona, then Sebring, we always have dreamed to come over to race in America. Finally, this year, the dream uh, comes true. We are super proud to be here with Tyron Dames. Our big project to uh, spread girl power, women power around, uh, around the racetracks. Um, not only as drivers, but in all aspects of our sport. And I think that's very important. So we keep pushing on that side. It's the most important part. Good luck the rest of the way, Rahel. Thank you very much, Ian. Always great to speak to Rahel Fry. Keeping an eye on the times at the front of the field where Renga van der Zander still has a one minute lead over Louis Delatraz, the number 10, chasing him down. Not a great lap last time around. The 31 Jack Aiken driven wheel and engineering Cadillac V Series are the uh, red and black car. A 51 1, Jeremy, last time around. A 51 also. 51 1 for Marco Whitman in the BMW. In fact, both BMWs in the 51s last time around. And Michael Christensen with a 50.8. There's pace out there if yeah. you can get a clear lap. Yeah, and if you've got fresh tyres. The, uh, the number 31 car is absolutely flying. I mean, the, the gap from uh, second to third, number 10 car is in second race. That's Louis Delatraz for Konica. Uh, accurate. Right, yeah, that's a big spin, is that? Yeah. Down at turn 17, and that's... <laughs> <laughs> enter, what was that? Enter with the, the crowd strike car, the 04 uh, machine. Right, ben Hanley. Ben Hanley behind the wheel, and he was all locked up even before that bump at turn 17. Ken Cook with us. And, and well, let me just go back to yeah, what I was saying there about the pace of Jack Aitken, because the, from, from Delatraz in second place to Jack Aitken in third, that gap was 24 seconds five laps ago. It's now oh, wow. nine seconds. Well, he's taken another four seconds out of him last time, last time uh, around. Exactly. He's doing that on a, three or four seconds a lap. The other guy who's really struggling is Colin Brown, who's uh, he, he was only overtaken uh, six laps ago, and he's now 20... One seconds behind Jack Aitken, so uh, massive speed differential there. Yeah, and this again is d very much dependent with these GTP cars, how far through your tyre life you are. I just want to talk about the turn 17, Kenny Cook with us from the Court of AMG team, the number 30 car. Um, I swear the bumps move uh, year on year when we come round here. I've never seen so many people have issues 
just after the initial turn in at turn 17. And so you turn in and, and gather the car and then turn in again almost. And in that second phase, there seems to be a really nasty bump that unsettles that unsettles the car. Yeah, there's there's a where there's a essentially there's an asphalt patch just at that first we call it the first apex in turn 17, yes. right? And and there's a, a the black that black patch and and the GT3s we're we're flat all the way down until we get to the, to that patch and that's where we're braking. Um, some cars, you know, like I've driven a, a P3 here in the past and you feel that bump, you know, in, in the prototypes and and at least in the Mercedes it's uh, it, you know it rides pretty good. It's a Mercedes. Uh, what do you expect? Yeah, <laughs> I would I would say it rides like a Cadillac, but it would, that would not be right. Um, but uh, it, it it definitely takes the bumps quite well when when it comes to that. So we've got that thing working pretty good. But you know we've seen we've seen other GT cars have issues with that. Um, you know, in qualifying, it seemed like maybe one of the Porsches had uh, quite a moment when the, when you get to that uh, at that uh, asphalt transition um, where you have the concrete runway uh, and then there's the a black asphalt patch right down uh, near the uh, the first apex, and that's where that transition occurs. There's just a different uh, differentiation. In. Also at Turn One, we've seen yeah. a number of issues at Turn One. It's always been a tricky corner. It yeah. Seems to me that for even for the GT cars, if you're half a car wide turning in you're in real trouble there yeah yeah and it, it's it's more or less like how far you are off that wall because when you when you turn in right at the end of the wall versus uh in, in the wall in, like on the that, right hand side yeah the wall the on the right wall. side yeah. yeah the pit wall we, we we turn in right at the end of that so there's not really a whole lot of bumps between uh, the, the end of that wall and the apex but you know right at the apex there's a lot of bumps just offline and if you're not getting your left sides just underneath that white line well it's black now but uh <laughs> that that line Line that uh, it shapes around the, the wall, you, you're right into the bumps. So like you, you feel good when you're like right up against the wall, and it's nice and smooth, nice and buttery. But man, if you if your if your left sides are just on that line or just outside of it, you're going for a ride, and then and, and then the bumps at the exit are worse when you're wider. So yeah. it's just it's a compounding effect uh, of of how uh, the, the bumps are here, and yeah, you definitely have to be online at the apex of one. In, in in on paper, this looks like a relatively easy track, but the nuances of the fact oh my goodness. that this, there are so many changes yeah. where you sometimes want to be a tiny little bit offline versus the, where you absolutely yeah. can't be. The curbs you can use, the yeah. curbs you can't use. Is this one of the most technical circuits we go to because of that? I absolutely love it for that. Absolutely love it. There's there is so many different asphalt changes, concrete asphalt, patches of asphalt, uh, places where they've ground down, and then not only that, um, there's there's just bumps everywhere. Oh, side by side, going into turn number ten for yeah. a battle for position. That was no the, contest. No contest at all. Jeremy Shaw pointed out how quick Jack Aitken was catching the. Accurate number 10 of Louis Delatraz and Aiken. I mean, that was like cars on two different in two different races. And in a point of fact, Ken, they are uh, at the moment. And that's a change of second position. How important is it for the team to be telling Louis Delatraz at the moment um, that right, th this is not your fight right now? We've got to get to, to nine o'clock tonight. Yeah, and I, and I think what's going on here is like, I mean, you can see just a massive pace differential uh, differential between the Cadillac and the Acker right now, and I think that's more or less due to the fact that there's uh, a different tire. So yeah, it looks like uh, potentially the, the the Acker may be on older tires from yeah. what it looks. Like. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, but uh, I, I was looking at that yellow Cadillac uh, of Ranger earlier, and it, it almost looked like he was having brake by wire issues. I don't know um, if uh, that's why he lost up and went off but um, you well, know expl th explain that Ken because this is this is something new for for IMSA top class prototypes yeah uh, with the hybrid it gives you the opportunity to use the electric motors to to slow the car down and put energy back into into the battery the power store 
Yeah, exactly. So, uh, from from what I understand, and, and people may say I'm incorrect, but from the way I understand it and the way people have explained it to me, is that you know there there are normal brakes on the rear of that uh, on the rear of that axle. Like there's there are brakes back there, but there's there's a, an immense amount of regeneration uh, from the the power unit uh, and the hybrid system to regen that uh, power into then you reusable electric uh, drive off the corner, um, and and you basically have to tune that to help change your brake bias. Um, and when you hit the brake pedal, the, the rear essentially has a, a lot of engine braking, but that's that regenerative uh, side of things um, that then pulls power back into uh, the, the battery, and then you use that on the exit. And because it's all of the electric power, the hybrid power, is only on the rear axle, not like the Toyotas right, or yeah. the Ferrari, where it's on the, the front axle in the WEC, you've still got to have friction brakes on yeah. the front at the balance of those two systems yeah. is the thing that people are still learning about actually yeah it seems really tricky to be honest because it almost seems like every time they hit the brake pedal they may have just a slightly different brake balance um, and if you if you send it into a corner and you just don't have that same amount of engine braking uh, regeneration in, in the rear you may lock a front and uh, not slow down as well uh, what's next uh, for you how long are you out of the car for now <coughs> Uh, so next up, uh, so Mike's in right now, Mick will get in, he'll do a double, and then I'll get in and do a double, uh, and we'll, we'll redo that, that whole uh, set again. Mike will get in and Mick will finish. Okay. Good luck out there. Drive well, drive safely. Ken Cook from the Court of uh, 32 AMG. Good to have your company, mate. Well driven. Yeah, thank you. On. Cheers, mate. Good Appreciate to see it. you. See you, Jeremy. Ken Cook. Uh, joining us here in the Global Broadcast Centre. We're coming up to the end of another clock hour. A couple of minutes uh, before three o'clock in the afternoon. We'll have seven hours to go in about 13 minutes' time. Thanks for joining us. It's IMSA Radio and IMSA TV live to the world from trackside here at Sebring International Raceway. Some good insight there, Jeremy, from uh, mm. from Kenton. Yeah. About what's going out there on the track. And this race is proving, as we sort of said it at the beginning, we weren't sure what we are going to get, what reliability issues, and there have been clearly a few problems out there. But reading this race, very difficult at the moment, which I love yeah. because it's adding a bit of drama, a bit of excitement, a bit of uncertainty all down to how people are looking after their tyres or not, certainly in the GTP category. Yeah, brilliant, isn't it? And you know, who's choosing to use their older tyres when? Yes. Uh, the, you know, with a with, uh, limited number of, of sets of tyres, uh, with a 12-hour a race, they're probably going to be making 13 or 14 pit stops. They've only got, only got 12 fresh sets to, to get them through from yesterday, and they used at least one set yesterday. Oops, there's a big crash. For, is that the oh. number... That's the 30, TDS car. Yeah, so one of the two TDS the, cars. That's number 35 car. It's the 35 car, car the red Ouch. watch. And that's, that's out of turn 16. This is going to be a safety car. And full course Ten yellow. Car ducks into the pits. Wow. That was a stroke of luck. So that was Delatraz diving into the pits before that came out. Uh, let's just keep an eye on what's happening down at turn 16. So the... Third place car, Louis Delatras, who was struggling for grip, pulls in, hits his marks, and Shea Adam is there. Louis Delatras not staying aboard for any longer during this period of the race, at least. It's Philippe Albuquerque's time to go and play. Ricky Taylor with a super impressive opening to the race, staying in the car for three hours. Now we've got Louis Delatras out of the car, and Philippe is going to have a go at this for a little while. They have four new Michelin tires to go on this Acura, already been replaced, and waiting on the last little bit of fuel stores. But yes, also into the pit lane, the sister car to TDS, so I can confirm it was the 35, because the 11 is, well, trying to refire yet again. The exact same issue that they had leaving the last time the car bumped into gear turns on that way won't do it the old-fashioned way that's a problem yeah it really is now after that big hit at 16 believe it or not despite the fact that there is debris all over the circuit and some tires that will have to be put back into position the 35 is driving back to the pit lane for TDS which I find absolutely extraordinary now the tower motorsport car was right there 
the question will be, was there just a little push? Right front suspension, right front bodywork, all damage right across the front of the car as it nosed into the damage. right hand side. And I cannot believe that car is actually driving. It's Francois Herrault behind the wheel of that car. Uh, and now, John did the, get a hit. The left rear of the car was actually off the ground. So he was in two wheel drive with the left front and the right rear because with the severe damage to the right front. And now the crew is saying, no, 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 no. We got to go back to the garage to try and fix this. That was extraordinary. I have no idea how we managed to find the horsepower to get the, the damage scraping across the bottom back to the pit lane even. Limited slip differential. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That's got him there. They, they're not going to be able to do any kind of uh, work, enough of the kind of work that they need to in the pit lane, but it will drive. So if he can fire it up again, he can drive it behind the wall. Joe Bradley. I just, I just followed up your comment about the uh, the two-wheel drive. Uh, the joys of his limited slip differential, eh? Yes, absolutely. One-wheel drive at the back. Now, this is going to take a bit of cleaning up, and I think we may, may need some heavy machinery. It's not all that long ago that those tyres were actually put on the exit there on driver's right. They aren't, they aren't uh, branded or anything other than just being black, and there's not a... A uh, rubber, big rubber band around them. I cannot even imagine what that would have been like if that had gone straight into concrete. I've said this before, it doesn't look particularly technical or flash, but tyre bundles fastened together dissipate energy. That would have been a huge incident, an even more huge incident without them there. So we'll get a pass around going now that is happening straight away Renga van der Zander leads from Jack Aiken three minutes past three in the afternoon under our is this fourth yes yeah, yes fourth, full course and it was uh, 2 hours and 25 minutes since we'd gone back to green and I didn't even see anything honestly it no. wasn't me this time uh, great comeback from Wheel and Engineering after their problems earlier on, good speed and good tactics by the 31 crew, yeah. particularly with Jack Aitken using the best of his tyres to the best effect. So they are back. They were nearly a lap down, let's not forget. Yeah. And had to repair the car with a couple of trips into the pit lane. Then they had a drive through for um, too much going on for emergency service. So yeah. this shows you that the uh, the yellow flag of redemption can bring you back from the very edge. So 0-1 Cadillac from 31 Wheel and Engineering Racing Cadillac from Sheldon van der Linde in third position for BMW. So Cadillac, Cadillac, BMW. Still on the lead lap, Colin Brown, even though his pace had been suffering with his tyre strategy. Philippe Albuquerque in the number 10 in fifth position. And then are both the Porsches off the lead lap now? Yes. Jeremy, so the, Porsche, the Porsches and the, the final BMW. Yeah, OK. Michael Christensen a lap off the lead in sixth position in the number seven Porsche. Then Marco Fittman in eighth for BMW and ninth Dave Cameron. So both the Porsches, the Porsche Penske Motorsport Machines and the BMW M Team RLL 24, one lap off the lead. Opportunity perhaps to get it back here as the leader is in the pits. We'll just finish off the rundown while he puddles down the pit lane to Shea. It's PR1 Matheson Motorsports number 52 in LMP2 from High Class Racing number 20 from Rick Ware Racing number 51. That's your top three in LMP2. In LMP3, Andretti Autosport number 36 from Junior 3 Racing. Two leagues years there from the JDC Miller Motorsports to Kane of uh, Simon van der Helm in the 85 bright yellow car. And in GTD, it's the pros that have cycled to the front. Corvette Racing from WeatherTech Racing, three from 79, the Corvette and the Mercedes AMG. Then the first of the Porsches is Patrick Pelier for Faf and Lexus. Sullivan, uh, Vassus Sullivan in the Lexus, excuse me, Ben Barnicott in fourth in the 14, fifth for Daniel Serra, and sixth for Frank Pereira, Risi, and 
Iron Lynx. And last but not least in our VP Racing Fuel in race update, Mike Skeen, Team Kortoff, teammate to Kenton Cook, who we've just been talking to in the 32 car from the one BMW of Paul Miller Racing. Brian Sellers back in that car from the 96 of Robbie Foley, Turner Motorsport, then the Aston Martin Hartner Racing, number 27, Indy Donchie for Winwood Racing's 57 AMG, and the Porsche of Wright Motorsports, that blue, number 16, makes up the top six. Shea Adams had the lead. Chip Ganassi Racing does like Ranger Van de Sanda. They have given him, finally, four new tires. So for the first time in this race, Ranger's going to find out what it's like to have some new Michelin rubber on the car. They also did new tires for the 31 Wayland Engineering Cadillac. It is still Jack Aitken behind the wheel of that one. New tires as well for the 25 BMW. But into the pit lane has come the 60 Meyer Shank Racing Acura. This car with the engine cover off. Work going on in the engine bay. And they are doing one new rear tire, two new rear tires only for this car as the engine cover goes back on and they're going to try and not lose a lap. We've got the 04 car, the CrowdStrike car in. I'm just going to monitor this to make sure everything goes well and just check what tires are going on the car. Looks like brand new, brand new set of Michelin tires going on this 04. The CrowdStrike racing car in contention and it's already off. It's already off the Jackson, off and out of the pit lane. Great, great stop. Should we have a look at the uh, the points from uh, from the Michelin Endurance Cup uh, after, after that four-hour mark? We didn't, didn't get around to the, to the GTD. There's been so much going on. Uh, at the GTD Pro, it was number three Corvette that was out in front. Uh, it took the lead right to, uh, right before the four-hour mark with that inc little incident with one of the prototype cars. So that scores maximum points. Second position was the WeatherTech Mercedes car number 79 that led the points coming into this round after Daytona. Third position in GTD Pro was FAF Motorsports car number 9. So the points now reads 22 points for number 79 Mercedes. Uh, 18 for the Corvette car number three, and now dropping down to third position with the Aston Martin car number 23 on 16 points. In GTD, uh, non-pro, it was the, the car that had been placed second after Daytona, the team caught off Motorsports number 32 car, we heard from Kent Kenton Cook a little while ago. Uh, that was out front at the four hour mark, so maximum points for them, great job for them. No, none of their closest contenders uh, scored any, re any more than two points. You get five for being out front, four for second place, three for third, and everybody else gets two. But they made up three, point de three points over everybody else around them. So they have 18 and they, points. And, and they had prioritised that, as we heard yeah, uh, indeed. Kenton say. So yeah. that's exactly what Perfect we were talking job. about in the uh, Michelin uh, countdown to green, our Porsche keys to the race. Perfect job. I mean, started right at the back of the pack, too. So uh, after that four-hour mark, uh, in total points for the season, the harder way to see kind of back out is Madison Snow in the Paul Miller Racing BMW. He has taken over from Brian Sellers. Then the 57 Windward Racing followed by the 32 Team Cawthorn and 27 Heart of Racing. Fuel and tires for them. We've got in GTD Pro Land the three Corvette Tommy Milner taking over for Jordan Taylor. So I'll wander down and see if we can have a chat to the native Central Floridian in terms of Turner Motorsports. We've got the 95 in. Bill Arbolin jumping back out and handing over to Chandler Hall once again. And the 79 Mercedes in for one more stop but I believe that was still Jules Guignon staying aboard, just getting four new Michelin tires. It's not given that we're going to see. It's not given that we're seeing drivers change. Uh, the 78 Lamborghini, uh, for instance, drivers stayed on board, new tires and a full set of, uh, well, a full tank of fuel. But uh, it's not everybody's strategy to change drivers, it seems, in GTD. Yeah. I love the fact that we've got split strategies going on here. Right across all the track, the classes coming down to seven hours to go in half a minute's time under our fourth safety car period with yellows out around the circuit Jeremy Shaw and John Hindorf in the booth that was a decent run of uh, over two hours of green flag racing 25 minutes yeah and what we what have we found out we found out that at the front of the field 
managing your Michelin tyres in the first stint of your run is absolutely crucial to being able to be consistent in probably the second half to maybe the final third of your uh, second run on, the, on them. And Scott Dixon probably doing the best job of anybody we've seen so far. His two stints were very consistent indeed, Jeremy. We've seen people drop off three, four and five seconds a lap um, who haven't been able to keep the tyres underneath them. And in fact, they've had to come in early, some of them. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Uh, and Rego van der Zander, that last stint, he was kind of struggling a little bit, but uh, he's now, I think, got a fresh set of tyres. But the big gainer from this full course caution is another 10 car that ducked into the pits just before the caution came out. They were really lucky to get that opportunity. The two cars behind him on the lead lap, the 25 and the number 25, which had just overtaken number six, the did not. So they had to wait, wait for everybody else to come onto the pit lane. It, it's so the number 10 car will cycle through to the, has cycled through into the lead now with the other the other lead cut lap contenders coming in during the caution period. Also because of that, the number seven, 24, and six. So the two Porsches and the second of the BMWs. They stayed out, now get their lap back, and we'll be able to make a pit stop before we go back to green flag racing. So we'll be back to eight cars on the lead lap in ah, GTP. Yeah, absolutely. It, if it's a couple of tenths of seconds a lap that you're losing, you'll, you'll stretch that for your fuel load. But when you're losing three, four, and five seconds a lap, you, you just can't afford to do another five or six laps and lose 20 odd seconds I, I i think you have to come in and bite the bullet on that uh, let's find out what life is like down in gtd the number one paul miller racing car changed drivers at its last stop madison snow has taken that car out brian sellers in the pit lane with your back brian paul miller racing certainly in contention but there's, there's something you're not happy about you're a typical racing driver really are you yeah I mean, I probably shouldn't say anything, but I'm going to because it doesn't really matter anyway. But uh, we, we start to struggle with brakes, to be honest with you. It's a problem that uh, we've we've had, um, I think, with the M4 since the beginning. And, um, you know, we have plenty of pad, but the pedal starts to get long and the stopping capabilities get, start to go away. You know, we've had it uh, pretty much every endurance race. So now you start to uh, weigh the options of what you're going to do. You know, what? Uh, what's the next course? Do you make change? Um, or do you keep running and hope for the best till the end? But, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I'm not sure. We, we, we got to assess it. it. It's not a great situation. Right, so it's not quite where the driver can adapt. It's becoming a little bit sort of dubious. Yeah, I mean, you, we can adapt for now. Now's not the problem, right? There's still another seven hours remaining. So already to be having the problem and to be thinking about it in the back of your mind you you kind of have to prepare for the end so even if that means we give up something now to get to the end and be in better position i think it's a smarter move so you know but the the, the reality is, is it's not something you're prepared for in a 12-hour race it's something you're prepared for in a 24-hour race so um you know the guys don't have everything re-equipped the, the air ratchets everything needed to do it quickly so you know now it's a russia uh, you know can we get it done so that's not just a caliper and, and, and rotor change, that's a master cylinder change, isn't it, if it's a long pedal? No, no, it is. It, 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 would, be, it would be a caliper and a rotor change, but they're, they're bolt-throughs, so in, yeah, so it, it's a full caliper change. So it, we can do it quick. I mean, it's, it, it's a fast change for us. I mean, we can do it in under, you know, under 50 seconds. So it's not the length of the change. It's, you know, it seems a little bit disheartening that you'd want to do it in a 12 hour, to be honest. So, but I mean, listen, we have a, we have a really good group of guys, a really good group of guys that have been together a long time. So, um, you know, they'll make the right call. Ordinarily, Brian, are the brakes good for 12 hours with ordinarily? Well, I mean, uh, should be, should be. I mean, um, especially with as many yellows as we've had so far, right? It shouldn't really be a concern. But again, you know, this is relatively um, un unproven car, you know, for us, right? We haven't, we, have, we don't have a lot of time on it and haven't done many 12 hour races, right? We've done six, a 10 and 124 where you have to change the brakes. So it's kind of uncharted territory, right? And I think, you know, right now you just don't know. It could go, it could not change again from where it is right now, um, or it could degrade even more towards the end. Um, 
we just have to make a decision, right? I think we, we, we're in contention, like you said. I mean, I think that um, one of the reasons we're in contention is I think we've seen mis some mistakes from some of the other cars, um, which is beneficial to us at the moment, but those guys aren't going to make mistakes all race. You know, you see a lot of pace from the Mercedes. Uh, the Porsches look like they're starting to get strong kind of uh, towards the middle of the day here as their heavy hitters come in. Um, so, we'll, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it unfolds for us. Yeah, that doesn't sound... It's not going to get better, is it, Jeremy? That That's unfortunate for Paul Miller Racing and that BMW. Just uh, keep an eye out there for the LMP2 leader. Thought he had a problem out on the circuit. This is number 52 car we're talking about. Paul Lupchatin for PR1 Matheson Motorsport, the wins livery car. I've, I've got a feeling that uh, he, slowed, he slowed right down, but uh, we thought he had a problem. Maybe went for a wave by that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, allowed for. We'll discuss that in a moment. Let's go down and pick up another interview. Shea Adam has Jordan Taylor. And Jordan, I feel like the gauntlet was thrown by the sister team yesterday, getting the W at Sebring International Raceway. You did it the last time we were here, though, for a 12 hour. You feel like this C8R is still competitive enough to get you guys to the top step? I think so. I mean, we seem to be more in the hunt than we were at this point of the race last year. Uh, last year, we looked at kind of the data of it, and we pretty much just stayed out of trouble and had a flawless race. We didn't have the fastest car, so we seem to be have a little bit more speed in the car this year, so it's the same name of the game, especially with how hot it is now. It's just staying out of trouble. You see everyone making mistakes, so we just have to limit that at this point. We got caught out by that yellow early, which kind of sent us to the back, so the guys did a great job in the stops to kind of jump us back ahead, and then... Yeah, we're not even halfway, but it feels like we've already done 24 hours. Yeah, but you guys are racing your way back to the front, too. That's the cool bit. It's really good competition with you and the Mercedes in particular. Were you enjoying those battles? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was kind of happy to let them go at one point. Uh, they seemed to, like they wanted to lead the race, and then we just kind of sat behind and saved a bit of fuel, and then we were close to the four-hour mark, which is points for the Endurance Championship, so the guy said, okay, try fighting him again, and thankfully he tried to hold off a prototype in one corner, and it pushed him wide and I was able to get a run. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of ebbs and flows always here at Seaver with the traffic. Seems like the GTPs struggle a lot on old tires. Like, so I even passed a BMW when he went by me, so I think it's going to be the same trend the whole race, just trying to stay out of trouble and kind of get to the nighttime when the track improves. I know that Joe's got something done at the other end, but I need to ask you first about this being preparation for what's coming next weekend for you. Got the call up by Hendrix Motorsport. That's a huge honor. What's it going to be like to racing at Circuit of the Americas and something completely different? Yeah, I mean, I've been saying all week, I wish I had more time to prepare for it. Obviously, this is my full-time job here. Uh, so yeah, I'll focus on Sebring, and then we stay in Sebring to test through Tuesday. So there's not a whole lot of time to spend with Hendrick, but I was up there on Tuesday last week, or this week, uh, doing a seat, and then I'll fly up Wednesday, do some more time, then fly to code on Thursday and, and drive the car for the first time. But yeah, it's a huge opportunity, unfortunate situation with Chase being injured, but uh, a huge honor to be asked to kind of fill his shoes. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to make the most of it and you know do as much preparation as I can. So when we do get to code, I can kind of hit the ground running and you know put on a good show for everybody. You're certainly doing that here today. Good job so far. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Well, you mentioned earlier, John, uh, well, a few moments ago, that the potential problem with the 52. I saw the team burst into life just before we went full course caution. And uh, the, the, uh, the full course caution kind of has delayed whatever it is, the issue that it has. The car's just arrived. The crew's been ready for it. Let's see what is actually going to go on. All I can see from where I am, which is right on the car, is fueling going in. We've had a drink, bottle changed. We've had the windscreen cleaned, but no addressing any kind of issue. This was the leader in class, remember, so he'll drop down the order, but he will leave the pit lane with a full tank of fuel. So, from what I can hear, and from what you can hear from my microphone, the car uh, doesn't have a problem, it's back out. They haven't run that out of fuel, have they? Dare you to ask, Joe. No, because... Because just before the, the full course caution, I, the, some of the winds livery overall the mechanics came running from kind of there's a smoking area outside the pit lane. They came running in and sort of, you know, high alert. And then, just then, we went to full course caution with that, that car into the tyres. Um, so whatever the issue was, I might get, try to uh, get someone to answer a question. 
Uh, stand by, I'll come back to you. Well, the car is has dropped down to third in class without losing a lap, though, Jeremy, on the class leader, which is now Rick Ware Racing and Devon, Devlin and De Francesco. Ben Hanley is in the crowd strike racing or four in second. So it's an odd one. We shall find yeah. out. And what's also odd is in GTD, all of a sudden, the GTD pro, pro cars are shown a lap ahead of the GTDs. I'm not quite sure whether that's a scoring glitch just for the moment. I think it might be, actually. Uh, well, I'm, yeah. I'm showing Alan Metney on the same uh, laps uh, as right. Tommy Milner. Exactly. And everybody else in GTD are lapped down, so that's not right. Uh, something something's funky is going on there, so we'll have to wait for that scoring to sort itself out. Before the pit stops, uh, we had uh, we had three GT, GTD Pro cars out front. It was number three, number 79, and then number nine. Then next up was number 32, re GTT regular car. Then the 14 Pro car, then number 62 Pro car, and then the number one, which was uh, Paul Miller Racing. Uh, and then on from there was 96, 27, 57, 16, and on down from there. But all of a sudden, there's something funky going on. I don't really understand what that might be because everybody, everybody came in together. So you got me on that one. Joe uh, has had the word from the team on the 52 wins car that they didn't think they had a problem. Um, so not sure. Well, it must have been just then that he, he, he was, he must have had that illegal wave around and he was just dropping back into line to make sure he didn't get penalised for yeah, it. Yeah, maybe they don't want to admit that. In fairness, that yeah. perhaps I, I could understand. Yeah, I think that. I think if you give it up and, and, and you know, don't, I think you'll, I think so you'll get you don't profit it. by it. Yeah, yeah, which you haven't done. Obviously. Um, what are the Aussies call it? Redress. Redress. Um, yeah, that's good. Good. good, good looking at the radar at uh, just after 20 minutes past three. Eastern daylight time. And Pretty Porsche's clear. coming in for a splash again. Presumably number six car. That was uh, in after getting its lap back just a couple of laps ago. So, so it's ninth stop, I think, in this race. Yikes. Some heavy rain up by St. Augustine and Gainesville, but nothing coming our way it's for the time day, being. It? Offshore at Miami, some showers as well. But the good news is that uh, everything is clear at the moment. It was uh, fairly awful weather forecast uh, when we got here last week. Pleased to say that that hasn't come to pass. So let's have a quick rundown on one of our VP Racing Fuel in-race updates. We'll start in GTD Pro, where Corvette Racing lead WeatherTech Racing and Iron Lynx in behind the safety car, so all together, 4-3 and 79, Corvette, Mercedes and Lamborghini. Fourth different manufacturing, fourth for Risi Competizione, the bright red number 62 Ferrari. Fifth different manufacturer in five is the Porsche 911 GT3R. This is the new 992 car, only its second outing in IMSA competition. It's the number nine of FAF Motorsport, the Plaid driveway car. In sixth position, another different manufacturer, RCF GT3 for Vasa Sullivan, the uh, black and yellow sort of bumblebee car. That's the 14. And the seventh different manufacturer in the top seven is the BMW M4 GT3 of Turner Motorsport, Chandler Hull. So seven cars in GTD Pro, all in the lead lap, seven different manufacturers. Yeah, no, that. that it's, but some, yeah, yes, but there's something messed up there because the number 91 car is shown a lap ahead of all the other GTD cars. I just don't think that can possibly be right. I think I think there's a whole bunch of non-pro cars have somehow got um, lost a lap somewhere. Yeah. Or did they not? Did some no, people I think, not? I think pit? they all came in pretty much, didn't they? I, I can't yeah, remember. No, I think they pretty much everybody came in. So I don't know. Something strange has happened. Uh, well, but I can, I'll, I'll right. give it what it is on the tr timing and scoring. Yes. And we'll wait to see if it resets. Uh, so Alan Metney is shown as the leader of GTD uh, on the same lap as all of the pros at the moment. Uh, that's Kelly Moss with Riley's number 91, the dark grey car. Then Paul Miller Racing BMW, the number one. Third for Mercedes. This is in GTD. That is at Winwood Racing. 
and the number 57, Acura NSX. Next up for Danny Formel and the Racers Edge Motorsport 93. Then another Mercedes, Mickey Grenier, the 32 caught off car, the dark grey machine. Then Heart of Racing, Aston Martin in sixth. Second Aston Martin, seventh is Andy Lally in the 44 Magnus car. As we're about to go back to green flag, the Triazi car, by the way, back into the pit after its problem with the alternator pulley earlier on. Let's go back to green flag racing. Side by side, going into turn one, the battle for the lead, Philippe Albuquerque and Renger van der Zander were side by side. Albuquerque comes out on the other side in the lead. The blue car ahead of the yellow car with the red car in third. Means it's accurate, Cadillac, Cadillac, then the BMW. Second of the Acuras is Colin Brown. Best of the Porsches in sixth is Michael Christensen ahead of Mark o. Whitman. They're all back on the lead lap, remember, these leading eight GTPs. Down towards the braking area at turn seven. Huge crowd on hand here if you are just joining us. Coming up to half seven in the UK, half eight in Europe. If you've been out all day, it's been an enthralling race so far. And it's all coming back together at the front of the field. With LMP2, the battle's continuing as well. That's led by Devlin Di Francesco in the number 51, Rick Ware Racing, Oregon. But the battle at the moment is over the far side of the circuit. So a little bit quiet here as we come off the safety car period. It'll get louder as they come back down the Ullman straight towards us. Still six and three quarter hours to go. BMW's weaving back and forth, trying to clean up or heat up the tyres. Sheldon van der Linde in the 25. So here we go. The, we've, Colin Brown has not had a good start. A good restart. Where's he gone in the number 60? He's dropped way to the back and drops down to fifth position. So it's Albuquerque, van der Zander, Aitken, Acura Cadillac, Cadillac, Sheldon van der Linde, then the Acura, then Michael Christensen for Porsche, Dean Cameron for Porsche, and Mark Whitman. So some changes there as they came through. through the serpentine run out of turn seven, the hairpin. It's the rest of the field sweeps through the right-hander at turn six. A few clouds just gathering in the distance, but I checked the radar a moment or two. Oh, more than emergency service in a closed pit. This is the, once again, the 35 and well, we've called that car's number an awful lot today and they're going to have to take another stop and hold and that's a 60 second penalty that's going to drop that car a very very long way they'll lose they might lose a lap there so that will have to be served in the next three laps One of the two TDS racing cars. Not the best positioned of the two, in fairness. It's had its problems earlier on. Its team car has not been running under the radar either as far as race control. They've had a couple of penalties as well, including one for leaving with the equipment attached. And they've managed to get themselves back up in his sixth position. And as Fjordback's just been through the pit lane as well, Oh, now somebody's getting a huge penalty here. Improper final wave by a stop plus four or four. And 
We haven't got a car number on that yet. So somebody... It's always punitive. Uh, so this is the 90... What, this is the 90... Two car, it says now. I, I was uh, no 91, 91 car. So they've taken an improper wave bike, and that's how they got the lap up on the rest of the field on the, the rest of the AM field. Sorry, Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, it still doesn't explain how the rest of the GTD field lost the lap to the pro cars. I, I don't understand that one at all. So he, because they were they were kind of intermingled. I mean, yes, there were mainly GCD pro cars at the front, but there were several other non-pro cars intermingled. I mean, number 32 car was fourth in that line behind the, the three GT pro cars. I have no idea. Going to need to hand Alan Metney uh, a light novella for him to read a couple of chapters while he's sitting there for four minutes and four seconds. That is always a multiple of lap time around here. So will, that will vary track to track, depending on what advantage you have gained from taking that wave by. At the front of the field, Albuquerque by three quarters of a second to Cadillac's Van der Zander. He has three quarters of a second, almost exactly the same gap to the 31 car. 10, 0, 1 and 31. That's your race order at the moment. So, sights and sounds of Sebring. The 0-1 tracking Philippe Albuquerque, the gold front end on that Cadillac. Hoving interview from the rear view mirror of Philippe Albuquerque for the Cunningham and Alda Acura ARX. This is Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti Autosport 2, the Giants in American automotive the auto racing jack aiken has done a cracking job and now that car does have both front head laps on the 31 it was one eyed right then one eyed left and now it's both eyes both eyes straight ahead of that yeah. car has been absolutely flying through this race so uh, he's going to be patient i'm sure right now is jack aiken but he he's uh, the two Cadillacs there are kind of stalking that Acura. It's out in front now as a result of the fact it made that pit stop, its latest pit stop, right before that caution period came out. So it had already made its stop when everybody else packed up behind the safety car. Then when they all came into the pits, it jumped all the way through to the front, and that's why that number 10 car leads right now. We have to see what sort of pace that car has. 1, 51, 1 minute 51.0 for the race leader last time around. Inception, McLaren, number 70. Tracking in behind uh, Lexus. Trying to find a way through. Down the Ullman Strait. Hello, McLaren fans, it says on the dashboard there. And that's Frederick Shandoff with Parker Thompson ahead of him. Parker Thompson, winner of the... Porsche Carrera Cup North America last year. Very nearly didn't have a drive at all. He was recategorized in the FIA rankings over the winter, which lost him his full season drive in this championship. He successfully appealed, but by then that drive had moved on to someone else. Was offered and accepted the long distance races for Lexus. Had to move away from staying with Porsche. Real drama in the off-season, just as much as there is on the track at race weekends, and certainly in Parker's case, what should have been a really good time for him. 
after he'd won the championship and thought he had his drive for this season tied up. And then to have to scramble to find a secondary drive after dealing with the appeals pe uh, process for his driver ranking. Worked out well, though. A great opportunity with this fastest son of Electus team. Oh, yes. Which is a, uh, a really good team, and he's got that car now into... He's running ninth right now, but with that major shuffling that went out uh, as a result of that full-course caution. So Alan Metney has now left the pits and falls to 16th in GTD, and I reckon he's actually dropped off the lead lap oh yeah of of gtd has yeah, he yeah i think he will have done johnny yeah he'll be a lap down now he was a lap ahead and i think he'll be now a lap down to everybody else lamborghini on lexus at turn 17 the 63 making up a position and that was uh, Frank Pereira, I think, just going through now, defending. Oh, the Lexus comes back up the inside. A lot of moving around in the braking zone by the Lamborghini driver. Not sure that is going to be received well. Now the Inception McLaren sitting behind that battle. Number 70. So down into the braking area. This time tracking to the right hand side. Two mid engine cars battling it out through to turn number 10. Under slightly more cloudy skies here. That was a lot of movement. Oh, that's not. That is right on, right on the edge of being... In fact, I, I, I think that's too many moves, and I think they were two bigger moves all the way to the left-hand side of the track to defend. Now, you've got to stay there at that point, and as the Lexus sweeps back, the Lamborghini goes right back in front of the Lexus, and still the Lexus slides down the inside. There's good driving from the the Lexus, but I think that's overly defensive yeah. driving from Frank Pereira. Yeah. Jack Hawks with finding his way through eventually, but Frank in the green, 63. Now three wide, two Lexus with the fat Porsche, the driveway machine right in the middle. Down into 17, here comes the Inception McLaren round the outside of Pereira as well. Great battling from these GTD cars. Yeah, and I, I can't quite understand how the number 63 car got itself up into contention there because it, it, uh, it hasn't been anywhere like that uh, all the way through this race. Something really weird happened during that full There must have course. been a wave by of the GTD Pro cars. Yeah. That's the only thing I it can is. think of. It is. And even then, I'm not quite sure. No. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Yeah, a good lap, uh, uh, well, two laps ago now by Philip Albuquerque. He set his car's fastest lap of the race, our race leader, car number 10, a 49.494. That's that car's best lap, as I say, in this race. We've got, um, we've got only, we've had only one car in the 48. So that's Renga van der Zander's car. Uh, it was Sebastian Bourdais that set lap, that lap back on lap 24. We now completed lap 151. You're just rejoining us, and I know many of you are. Um, tweet here from F Ampersand Racing. Stepped out for a second. What happened to the 52? It was crawling around under the safety car and dropped back and took an age to get back into the pit. Did its pit stop, went back out. Team says no problem, but clearly something went awry there to go from first to restarting, I think, fourth in class, third in class, maybe, and it's lost another position or two since then. Keeping an eye on the lap times 
of the number 52. It's Paul Loup Chatan at the wheel. Another big lock up from a Porsche at turn 10. This time it's the number seven GTP, Michael Christensen, with smoke pouring from underneath the tyres of his car. He's torturing the Michelins. And again, I wonder if that is a brake by wire issue. As a whole slew of GT D cars goes through. And Frank Pereira did overstep as we thought. It's going to be a drive through for Iron Links number 63, the green. Lamborghini, meantime, the number 91. Alan Metney served his four minutes stop and hold. He's come straight back in to the pits and changed to Kai Van Berlo, who had a big crash in that car. On the bumps at turn 17 earlier in the week. A bit of work for Kenny Moss and Riley to put that car, but it was done before midnight that same day. Nice move down at turn number seven. And that's the battle for the lead. Yeah. For a moment, it went to the gold front of the Cadillac, but Philippe Albuquerque fighting back through traffic now, coming up to the Risi Competizione Ferrari. He dives down the inside through turn 12 and now into 13. Tower wow. corner. This is fantastic. Yeah, it is really intense. I love that, uh, this, Jeremy, when yeah. you've got two really good drivers who are battling through traffic. Yeah, and uh, uh, Michael Christensen had a problem in number seven car on that last lap. Yeah, he ran were. straight on a turn 10, yeah, did fine. say that. And, yeah. and, lost, and, and as a result of that, he lost a couple of positions. But number 24 car, Marco Vittman, um, he seems to be up to speed now. I'm wondering though whether he maybe did change tyres at that last stop because he seems to be struggling, or had been struggling, he was slipping back. Down into turn 17, the Corvette has the two leaders coming down the inside. That's the leader in GTD Pro being passed by the two GTP first and second place machines. Now under the front straight, and there's a bit of breathing space for Philippe Albuquerque. No doubt in my mind, Jeremy, that the Acura in a straight line, any time when they are not braking, in fact, they are very, very fast. And to be able to drag past that car on the Ullman straight is, is asking rather a lot. But they are not as assured through the medium and quicker corners. Here comes an opportunity for Renga van der Zander as that Acura was held up, getting onto the throttle, coming down to turn number seven to the right-hand side for the golden grey. Zero one. And in behind them, Jack Aiken is right with them in the wheel and car now. Top three together, heading through Collinger, Collier and Cunningham. Oh, this is intense. Absolutely fantastic. This is what we were hoping for when we saw the new regulations, when we heard about convergence, yet to see any hypercars come to IMSA. But this is Acura versus Cadillac with BMW just 2.6 seconds away from this battle. Number 10, Conic Manolt with a blue and black car back onto the Ullman straight with a bit of breathing space and will stretch that gap this time. There's headlights flashing in the background as Jack Aiken had been held up and that's allowed Sheldon von der Linde in the BMW M Team RLL M Hybrid V8. That's the number 25 car. He's closed up a little bit. Then the Porsche diving through. Dan Cameron, the leader in GTD Pro, through turn 17, riding the brunt, the bumps. Right to the wall and driver's left. This is all good stuff at the front end of the field. Conrad Brown has just been overtaken by uh, number 66 car of Dane Cameron, so the Porsche are up one position at the expense of Colin Brown, who, again, like he was in the last stint, really struggling, it seems. Can't imagine he didn't change tyres at the last, during his last pit stop, because I'm presuming he didn't for the one before, that's why he was 
turning some very mediocre lapses, unless there's some sort of a problem with that number 60 car. Hope not. Rears only on the last stop for that car. For which car? The car you've just mentioned, the 6-0. Ah, right. ah, OK. Frank Pereira then continues to drop down. Patrick Peele has gone through his now. I, I don't think he's done his drive-through yet either. He'll have to come in this time around, I think. Got cycled through ahead of some cars they've not been battling with. And he's still not come in this time around. So yeah, if he... Meanwhile, so. in GTD, a lap down to the, to the pro cars, it is Indy Doncha who leads the way for Winwood Racing. Really good comeback for that team. Lead by just about a second or so over Michael Grenier in the other Mercedes, or the team caught off Mercedes, car number 32. Then to a pair of Aston Martins. Uh, Roman De Angelis is right behind Grenier in third position. That's car number 27. And Andy Lally in fourth for Magnus Racing. And turning some good laps as well. It, it is so dependent, Jeremy, on where people are on the tyres. Yeah. It's it's extraordinary. Now here comes Frank Pereira, finally for his drive through. Did not have the pace on the restart, so maybe he is pushing tyres as well, but decided to weave around rather too much in that 63 Iron Links green car. And has been pinged for it. It is just a drive through as the Urakan winks menacingly with its front lights left to right to left to right back out of the pit lane now back on the throttle and accelerating away through turn one a new best lap of the race for philip albuquerque again second time in the last five laps 149.174 now for the race leader Ten minutes before four o'clock in the afternoon. It is the 71st running of the Mobile 112 hours of Sebring. Alan Metney right in the mix there as he's a lap down in the number 91 car. Actually, he's changed drivers. It's Kai from Berlin now, isn't it? Who's in that car? The issue being that we've got GT fast GTD cars coming through the pro field, but of course they're all a lap down now. So it's making the timing and scoring look neat and tidy, but it's a bit more messy out on the track. <laughs> Albuquerque, a second to the good now, but only a second from Van der Zander, 10 from 01, from 31, one and a half seconds further back. Dane Cameron just setting the best lap time of the race thus far on lap 156 for car number six, running in the fifth position. He made that pass on, uh, on uh, Colin Brown a few laps ago, and then with the mistake also for his, his uh, Porsche teammate Michael Christensen, Cameron now up into fifth position. Yeah, still a second away, in fact, 1.2 seconds away from the best lap put in by the 01 Cadillac, Jeremy. 48.7 yeah. is the best GTP lap of the race. Yeah. Still just that one car into the 48 second yeah. bracket in this race. That is the uh, it was Sebastian Bourdais who set that time. Uh, the uh, lowest 49 is, is uh, Jack Aitken who turned a 49.077 in car number 33. And then a 49 won just a couple of laps ago for Philip Albuquerque, our race leader at the moment. tower prototype in amongst the battle battling BMWs and other GTD cars it's the number eight Scott McLaughlin 
behind the wheel of that car. He's got Paul Loup Chatan 2.4 seconds behind him in the recovering PR1 Matheson Motorsport. The team adamant there was nothing wrong, but that car crawled around for nearly a full lap and lost its position as the safety car had come out. It did fire up and run straight away. Meantime, the 0-1 leading car into the next uh, second place car rather staring at the back of the number 10 with clear track ahead through turn number 10 the right hander sweeps into the left left again keep your foot in keep your foot in through the little right kink at 12 at 12 into turn 13 tower turn a light overcast nothing too threatening it'll bring the track temperature down a wee bit, it's come down to 31 Celsius on track. That's 88 Fahrenheit. Air temperature staying around about the 30 Celsius, 86 Fahrenheit mark. That hasn't changed. Humidity is going up a little bit. No wind to talk about. Sunset at... At 7.35 tonight, it'll be dark by just after 8, really dark. Yeah, so the last really couple of hours of the race mm. in full dark. Another good lap there again from Philip Albuquerque, a 49.6 last time. And also Jack Aitken, 49.4 in that lap 31, Cadillac in third position and right on the tail of Ranga van der Zander. Colin Brown trying to bridge the gap. 3.6 seconds to Dean Cameron. GTPs all managed to get back on the lead lap at that last full course caution. The AO Rexy Porsche. Being put to the sword by Cameron. As he picks his way around quite easily. Down towards turn seven now. Over the bumps, turning in right-handed. Still some times coming in, Jeremy, even in the front of the field. If there's a bit of gap out there. If you can find some space, you'll find some pace. Yeah. Very true. And we've just got a new fastest lap in LMP2. Fastest race lap uh, by Ben Hanley. A 151.114 for the crowd straight by, by APR entry. And he's, he's got about 16 seconds out ahead of uh, Scotty McLaughlin, who is running in the second place and still under pressure from Paul Lou Chatin in the number 52 wins PR1 Matheson Motorsports car. Just had uh, a note, we were talking about no hypercars in IMSA yet. Hypercar is a category as well as a class. It's a partial regulation as well as a class. It's very confusing and I, it's one of the only things that I don't agree with with this convergence. The ACO call the whole of the top class hypercars and their version of that top class is hypercar H or just hypercar. Whereas the top class in IMSA is called GTP and the cars that run within that category is LMDH, are LMDH. And LMDH are also eligible for the hypercar category. Right? What? You got that? Yeah. So when I said there's no <laughs> hypercars in IMSA, it was shorthand for saying there's no ACO hypercars in IMSA. Which is why I, oh. I keep making the distinction between GTPs and a hypercars. I accept that GTP is a class and LMDH are the cars at the moment within that class that is movable between IMSA and WEC. At the moment, there are no hypercars in GTP. 
or the LMDH. Did that make any sense at all? Sorry. <laughs> Yesterday, in the WEC race, <laughs> we had three different categories of car running in the hypercar class. We had LMDH, what, we, what we're watching here at the front of the field. We had non-hybrid hypercars, i.e. just hypercar, being the Glickenhaus and the Bi Collis run prototype. And we had hypercar hybrids, which are all the manufacturing cars, Toyota, Ferrari, Peugeot. Now, if we can just stick that on a floor chart on a T-shirt and everybody wears them when you're at the track, everything will be fine. Just look at the, the back of the pack of cars in, in GTP. Marco Wittmann is uh, falling back from the number seven car of Michael Christensen as a rate of yeah, over a second a lap, one, one, between a second and a second and a half a lap. Uh, Michael Christensen, by the same token, is slipping back from Colin Brown by the better part of a second a lap as well. So they are now 28 seconds behind the race leader for Christensen, 39 seconds back from the leader. That's Marco Wittmann, and we've, we've got, what, 15 laps we've been going since the green flag. So we call that two seconds a lap for those two compared to the race leading Acura at the moment. Down to turn one, flex box, Aston Martin with the Corvette right behind it. The Corvette still the leading GTD car. And this is allowing the 79 Jules Gunon driven WeatherTech Racing Mercedes to close in. The Aston will try and stay on the lead lap, of course. Down towards turn seven. Very evenly matched. Meantime, the battle for second position, Ringer van der Zander with Jack Aitken all over his rear aerofoil coming out of four, five, and now into six. Yeah. Sweeping around a GTD battle that includes one of the Lexus. And there was a touch there a few moments ago before that battle really got underway with yeah. the GTD car. Yeah, number 92 car, I think that was, uh, it was uh, having to take evasive action there to avoid any contact, did a really good job to do so because the, the uh, Cadillac was all locked up, wasn't it? That was tight. Done away with it though. Question from Kevin Hamilton about restarts. After the safety car lights go out, are cars permitted to overtake to get back onto the tail of their class, insurers? Six Porsche passed a lot of people, cars coming down the back straight just prior to the restart as it pitted at the start of that lap. It would have now you, you've got you can pass as soon as the green flag comes out and you can reset if there is a class split which might have been going on, but that should have been finished by the time the safety car lights went out. The GT, that's a GTP car, which is exclusively 